everybody, this is Grimmy, and this is an audiobook of my ongoing series, My Father's Warmth, which is a My Hero Academia Todoroki AU. Don't expect any good voice acting from this, I'm not a voice actor, so when you're listening to this audiobook, think of more like your mum telling you a bedtime story. Um, yeah, I will not, I will not be attempting to replicate people's voices, don't expect that from me, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> so, but yeah, just... Bare minimum, b below, below, below average expectations from me, please. My Father's Warmth is a happy Todoroki AU uh, fan fiction where, it, where it's a retelling of the Todoroki family story if Enji Todoroki was never traumatized and got the guidance and support he needed growing up. Chapter 21, Flare Up. Natsu's growth was an exact copy of Enji's, according to Haro. He didn't speak much, and mainly made his wants and needs known by actions, such as pelting his grandfather with grapes. A familiar experience. By the time he was barely five months old, he could have passed for an almost one-year-old of how tall he was, although he hadn't learned how to walk yet. Which would have been a burden to raise back if it wasn't for Enji's training. Training with Ray took some trial and error, as the married couple had very different body types. While Ray is short and petite, struggling to pack on muscle, Enji was built for training, and after years of doing so, the only thing stopping Enji from reaching new milestones and records were the physical limitations of a human body. After a couple weeks of trying different workouts, from cardio to weights, they had concluded that targeting specific muscle groups and weight training was the best to help Rei get some strength in. And it had worked. Even as Natsu grew, Rei found herself able to pick him up with much more ease and without her body giving out instantly. Toy trained them too, but since he's only little, not anything too straining. Nothing to do with weights, not until he was older. Which annoyed Toya a little bit at first, but when Enji explained that they had plenty of other stuff they could do before getting to weights, Toya was just happy to have his training time with his father back. And it showed. Toya was much happier and smiley, never brought up his quirk training anymore, and was overall much livelier. His burns finally had time to fully heal, no longer littered in bandages. Even the unknown burns that he'd been able to hide from his family had slowly gone away, barely any marks left on his small body. The small body that had become stronger as well, which delighted Toya. Despite being short for his age, Enji concluded that he and Toya were of similar body types, which meant Toya could easily pack on muscle if he cared enough to train. Something Toya absolutely cared about. As did Rei, who had asked if Enji could teach her self-defense, something they had been training for the last few days and how Rei found herself pinned to the tatami floor, trying to break out of her husband's honestly loose hold. Basically, she was flailing. This is completely unfair, she wheezed as she finally gave up but didn't tap out. It's because you're trying to use your strength instead of your momentum, and she said matter of fact as if it was obvious. With the move I showed you, it's not about being stronger than someone, it's using their strength against them. You make it sound so simple, Rei replied with a huff before spying up at him. Ah, well, I don't mind this view anyway. She giggled as a small flame appeared and disappeared on her husband's cheekbones. Haven't seen that in a while. Ray, Angie sighed of embarrassed reproach, leaning back in an, into a kneeling position as he let go of the hold he had. His wife sat up, barely reaching his chest as she grinned up at him. He felt like she was making fun of him. I'm just teasing, she laughed lightly, using his shoulders to pull herself up and kiss him on the cheek. Angie huffed a little at that, but couldn't stop a smile from pulling at his lips. We've just started practicing. You'll get the hang of it, he said as he looked at Ray standing up fully. Mm-hmm, just like you said I get a hang of doing push-ups, Ray replied with an unconvinced look, arms crossed. While most other exercises she'd been able to get pretty good at, push-ups simply weren't clicking. She could manage two at best, and she'd be shaking and sweating the whole way. Angie rolled his eyes a little. Don't you roll your eyes at me. You can do one-handed push-ups. It's easy for you to say that I'll get a hang of it. Maybe just to be a bit of a jerk. And she started to go into the pose to do one-handed push-ups with one arm behind his back. Seeing her husband show off, Ray huffed in fake indignance before getting an idea. What, Ray? Angie exclaimed in surprise, having to bring his other hand back down to fix his balance as Ray sat on his back. No, go on, Mr. Show-Off. Do your impressive push-ups. Unless you can't, but I don't like the implications that I'm heavy, Ray teased, leaning her hands on his upper and lower back to get comfortable. Are you serious? Her husband asked incredulously, 
looking over his shoulder at his smug-looking wife. She absolutely was serious. Ray weighed nothing to NG, but the situation's lack of discipline and seriousness was getting to NG more than the extra weight ever could. Hearing the woman on his back, he started doing push-ups. Hurried footsteps could be heard as Harrow's, where home, was announced from the front door. He had taken the kids out of the park since the weather had gotten icier, what with being the beginning of December, and knew his three little cold-resistant grandchildren would enjoy it. Which they did. Although, since they're still babies, Harrow didn't want to leave them in the cold for too long. Are you training without me? Toya asked of all the indignancy a five-year-old could muster, not even having taken his coat off yet, as he slid the door open, looking offended at his parents' audacity. Firecracker, come sit on Dad! Ray called her eldest over with her hands, grinning maliciously as Engie glanced back at her with wide eyes. Hey, what? Toya's wide grin mirrored Ray's, looking exactly like her as he shed his coat and dropped it at the entrance of the training room and launched himself in into his mother's lap. Ray helped him up as she heard Engie make an oomph sound. For you, me! Toya yelled out as he giggled at seeing his father trying to shift the new weight of his son and wife on his hands. His little sister popped her head around the corner, eyebrows lifted before she broke into a fit of giggles at the sight before her. Come, come! Hold on! Angie tried to argue, but it was too late. Fumi was already being helped onto her mother's lap by her older brother, the two siblings sitting comfortably as they laughed at their father's struggle. You're overdoing it, he said to Ray over his shoulder. Don't tell me you're struggling, Endeavor, Ray teased with a challenging glint in her eyes. Angie's eyes narrowed at her, not one to back down from a challenge. His wife and two children were by no means heavy, but he was very aware that dropping them or being too brisk in his movements could hurt or scare them, or at least for Yumi, and that's not what he wanted. Haru joined in on the amusement as he appeared around the corner, carrying the chunky Natsuo who was busy suckling on an apple slice. He watched with a smile as Enji did push-ups while balancing his family on his back. Toya and Fuyumi counting each push-up he did with loud giggles, and Rei looking mightily proud of herself for challenging her husband. Nine! Ten! Uh, what's after ten? Toya asked, not being the best at numbers. Eleven! Fuyumi squealed as her father did yet another push-up. After getting to fifteen, Rei patted Enji's shoulder, showing him some mercy. Very good, Endeavor. You get to not drop your family for another day. She teased, Engie exhaling as he let himself lie on the floor, permitting his wife and kids to jump off of his back. He rolled onto his back, glaring at Ray with a grumpy face. She knew he wasn't really mad at her, could see the playfulness under the sharp edges of his expression. Understanding Engie wasn't easy by any means, but Ray had learned a long time ago that there was more to his stoic face than it let on. While some might find him scary, she knew that Engie was just a serious man who didn't know how to have fun which is why she liked teasing him so much. It made him have a little fun among his disciplined and scheduled life, which he would have been more annoyed at if it didn't make his wife and kids laugh like it did. No, I don't want to, Fumi whined, catching the adult's attention. Toy was showing her the weight he'd been able to shift an inch previously, wanting her to try as well. It looks heavy. It's fine, Toy argued, pouting at his sister's refusal to take part in something he enjoyed. Toya, don't force her if she doesn't want to. Angie said softly, pushing himself up into a sitting position and gaining a grumpy look from his eldest. Toya, he said again, more softly and with an exasperated smile. But why? he whined, much like his sister, stomping his foot on the ground. Training is fun! Training is gross! Fumi stuck her tongue out and shook her head. Smelly and hot and gross! Harris snorted as he left with Natsuo to get him another apple slice. No grapes, though. He didn't feel like getting the round fruits thrown at him today. It's safe to say, Fumi did not join in on her family's training sessions. Endeavor looked at the UA student in front of him, who was covered head to toe in denim. Apparently supposed to be his hero outfit. I'm Tsunagu Hakamada. Nice to meet you, Endeavor. The teenager introduced himself despite the number two hero knowing exactly who he was. After seeing his performance at the sports festival this year, he had invited him for an internship. Tall and slim, the blonde student was only a few inches short of an endeavour, but the man could tell the teenager would grow to almost be the same height as him. Do you have a hero name yet? He asked gruffly, getting to the point. They were in his office, a couple sidekicks who had brought Tsunaga in also present. Yes, I am Fiber Hero, best genist. The first year UA student replied, running two fingers through his styled hair. 
best genus it is then. Your quirk, Fiber Master, is intriguing, and your usage of it during the sports vessel is creative. Using both his own and others' clothes to restrain his opponent and set traps, it was impressive to watch. However, you're limiting yourself using only weak clothes threads as your weapon. Can you control other types of fibers, stronger than clothes? I haven't gotten that far into training yet, Best Genus admitted, sorting out the color of his hero suit as he spoke. I've mainly been concentrating on improving my control of my quirk. Currently, denim is what I can manipulate the best. Endeavor grunted as he stood, motioning to follow him. Show me what you've got. Despite his young age, Best Genus is very self-assured and knows what he's about. He cares about his appearance, believing it to be an essential part of being a hero to keep up a good appearance, be it fashion or socializing. Two things Endeavor could not care less about. Well, in most cases, and certainly not in the way the teenager cared. It was clear that he and Best Genus had a difference in opinion on what a hero should and should not be, but interestingly enough, they didn't clash. As Endeavor helped the teen get a start on his training at his agency, he saw the focus and hard-working nature shine through the flamboyancy of his getup. There was a determined drive in his demeanor that told the number two hero this young man would make for a fine pro hero once he graduated. He showed promise and dedication, the latter being something Endeavor held the high esteem. Your strength is definitely your technique, Endeavor commented after an hour of training the blonde, the tall teenager currently sitting as he panted from exerting himself. Pieces of cloth and thread littered their corner of the training room, where Best Genus had shown his ability to control the threads of his own clothes and what he could do to attack or restrain a villain. But your endurance and the power behind your attacks is lacking. If a villain is strong enough to snap the threads, then you'd be vulnerable. Training of different materials you'd find challenging and upping your spatial awareness would be a good way to snuff out those vulnerabilities. Tunago sighed as he dusted himself off and stood, eyeing up the tall redhead. He wasn't a fan of Endeavor, considering his appearance to be too brutish for his liking. But when he'd seen the invitation for an internship, he knew this was his opportunity to get to know the man better. If he wanted to be a hero, learning from the number two, whether he liked him or not, was his best course of action. And right now, he was learning that, despite his less than appealing, grumpy expression, Endeavor is deductively observant. I'll talk to my teacher about organizing that sort of training when I get back, he nodded swiping his fingers through his hair and recalling the strewn about threads back to his suit, fixing his appearance. Endeavor grunted in approval. Since you don't have your provisional license yet, I can't let you deal with villains, but you can still go on patrol with some of the psychics. Or with me, if you can keep up, he said as he left the training room, best genus following him. Glancing back, he saw a determined glint in the teenager's eyes. I'll do my best. And his best was impressive. Despite not being allowed to use his quirk to keep up with Endeavor blasting after villains, Best Genus was never far behind and helped with the aftermath, keeping an open, observant eye on everything happening around him. Something that, once again, Endeavor could approve of. You know, Endeavor, if you change your physical demeanor, you'd appeal to the larger population. That, however, was something he didn't approve of so much. I don't care much about approval, he grunted at the blonde's advice. If I cared about that, I'd smell like All Might, and I'm not All Might. Best Genus quirked an eyebrow. The only reason I'm number two in approval ratings is because I work with him often and I do my job well. Everything else is superficial and inconsequential. Hmm, I disagree, Best Genus said blatantly, not intimidated by the fiery man's famous scowl. Heroes should be presentable, like well-ironed jeans. Proper self-care and socializing is vital to keep up positivity, something people with influence should do. It may be superficial, but it's what makes a difference between somebody who is approachable and somebody who isn't. And as a hero, I wish to be approachable for anybody in need. He explained simply, once again running his fingers through his hair. It's why I like fashion. I can see that, Endeavor huffed out. He knew he wasn't approachable. Best genius words were nothing new to him. It was a common criticism the wider population had. Despite being relaxed at home, that was a side of him he refused to share with the world. Bringing Toya to the agency once a month is one thing. Being anything other than his intimidating self while working is another completely. All Might's various words from years ago echoed in his head. He sighed a little and relaxed his shoulders. If that's the sort of hero you want to be, then I support it. He got a surprised blink from the teen. You support it? He asked cautiously. 
I'm almost shocked he didn't get scorned for his vanity. Because Endeavor didn't consider him vain. You want to help people, and your care for appearances is part of that. Whether I or anyone else agrees with it or not, that doesn't matter. You stand your ground and prove what you believe through your actions. Endeavor said firmly, flames flickering around his eyes. Best genus said at him in wide-eyed surprise. Endeavor is rough, brutish, and honestly, terrifying at times. But here, the young-to-be hero saw the years of experience the man had shine through. As the older man spoke, there was a tenderness in his demeanour that told Best Genist he might have judged appearances too soon. Criticise my methods one more time though and I'm sending you back to UA early, Endeavour said flatly and sternly, the mood completely switching. Eh, there it was. Despite that, Best Genist had an educational and worthwhile time during his internship, returning to UA with much advice to work with from the number two. Endeavour had only good things to report back to his teacher. As December moved along, snow started fluttering down and laying the landscape in a thick layer of white, which delighted the cold-resistant Todoroki members. Angie was a walking furnace, so he didn't mind. But Haro, well, he didn't like to admit being in his mid-40s was starting to get to him, but his thick winter coat was an easy sign that icy weather wasn't to his liking. Unlike Toya, who on one Saturday morning, when he woke up to fresh snow in the garden, had face planted into it while still in his sleepwear, giggling maniacally at the cold. Fuyumi was quick to join him once she let Enji peel her off of him after having breakfast, and while he was still too little to fully play, Rei sat an atso down in the cold. His quirk hadn't manifested yet, but it was almost without a doubt that his would be an ice quirk, especially of how much he was enjoying the cold snow. Fuyumi and Toya played all morning, throwing snowballs at each other and building a snowman next to the frozen over koi pond, where Enji was busying himself making sure the fish was still well. He had installed the pond for Ray's birthday a year ago, and she was very fond of the fish, reminding her of their date at the aquarium. Papa, look! Toya yelled, making Enji perk his head up to see his eldest face plant again into a pile of snow, and laughing like it was the funniest thing in the world. Very, uh, cool, Toya, Enji replied, not too sure what his son expected him to say, but wanting to show he'd been watching. Fumi groaned somewhere in the snow, disapproving of her father's choice of words and unintentional pun. Are you not cold? Hara asked Toya, who was digging through the snow in t-shirt and shorts. Nope! Toya called back, before ambushing a screaming Fumi with a giant snowball. She retaliated by tackling her brother and squishing his face into the snow, the boy flailing as he complained. Oh, right. He's resistant to the cold, Hara said absently. That was a whole problem, wasn't it? It's easy to forget he also has that after these last few months, Ray said softly. Natsu in her arms as he played with a snowball his mother had made for him. She smiled. I'm glad he can at least have fun with it. Seeing her two eldest run around in the snow, around their working father while barefoot and squealing, made her heart happy. My parents never let me play in the snow like this. Haru looked at her, and seeing the occupied Natsu in her arms, making baby babbling noises and fascinated by the snow, Something pulled at his chest. He cleared his throat a little and blinked, not understanding why he was getting emotional. You can go play now if you want, he offered, opening his arms to take Natsu from Ray if she liked the idea. Ray looked at him with raised eyebrows, as if he was suggesting the ridiculous. Seriously, go play, he laughed, motioning his head to her two oldest children. Hesitantly, almost as if she'd be told off for it at any moment, Ray handed Natsu to his grandfather and carefully stepped into the garden, also barefoot. Enji raised his head from his work with the koi pond as she passed, but didn't question what she was doing. Toy and Fuyumi were struggling to make a second bigger snowman, not having the strength to drag the second snowball on top of the first one to give it some height. At their mother arriving, Fuyumi patted the thick snow and jumped up and down. Mama, help Mr. Snowman, she said excitedly motioning to her and her brother's hard labour. Ray smiled, kneeling in the snow besides her two little ones and heaving up the large snowball with the help of her children. Toya and Fuyumi both squealed in delight before searching the ground for stones to decorate him with. Ray joined too, picking out the nicest stones among the ones offered to her by the siblings, before helping them reach the parts of the snowman they couldn't. Once it was done, Fuyumi and Toya stood proudly at their second creation. I love snow, Fumi squealed happily, 
before dropping onto her back and spread her limbs wide, looking up at the grey sky. It had been her birthday a couple of days ago, so the newly five-year-old felt joyfully spoiled in the season she was named after. Yeah, Toyo agreed, face planting into the snow for the third time. Ray smiled and followed suit, laying in the snow with her two white and red-haired children. The cold felt nice against her body, feeling at home. Me too. She sighed out with a smile. Being freshly six years old, Toya had to start elementary school three months after his birthday. He really didn't like the idea of leaving home the whole day with random strangers, but the two positives is that he'd be going to the same school his father did and that Harrow taught at, so at least he'd have a reference point if he ever got worried. The instant he arrived on the school grounds, all the kids stared at him, especially the older ones who knew Harrow Todoroki to be Endeavor's father. Seeing how Toya had come to school accompanied by him, it clicked quickly for all the other children who Toya was. Not to mention, his face was relatively well known since he'd been seen with Endeavor almost monthly whenever Toya had his solo day with his father. You're going to be okay. Your teacher is very sweet. If you get too worried, just let her know and I'll come over, alright? Harrow said as he kneeled in front of his grandson, running a hand through the child's thick, mismatching hair. Angie and Ray had both been thoroughly worried about Toya starting school, for a multiple of reasons. Angie because he worried how him being in Deva would affect Toya socially. Ray because she had only ever been homeschooled and didn't know what to expect from all of this. And both because they worried about the hero and quirk talk that was so common among children. Hara had promised to keep a careful and caring eye over his grandson that he loved so dearly. Okay, Toya said, a little nervous but trying to be brave about it. Once he was left with his teacher and said goodbye to Haro, Toya was instantly surrounded by his new classmates. Is Endeavor your dad? A few asked in unison, all the kids looking at him with wide, curious eyes. Toya looked around at the different children, some with mutation-type quirks, others looking ordinary. He crossed his arms and puffed his chest out proudly. Yeah, Endeavor's my dad. I'm Toyota Doroki, he said with a small smirk, absolutely showing off. His classmates erupted into various gasps and murmurs of awe, starting to question the number two son about what Endeavor was like at home, if he's scary, if Toy had met other heroes, and so on and so forth. Children, children please, I'm starting class. You can all continue chatting during break time. The teacher clapped to get their attention, smiling sweetly. Hara had spoken to her beforehand about please keeping an eye on Toya and had been told about his quirk handicap. She understood the man's worry for his grandchild, so despite having several kids to look after, she would keep a special eye on the undersized boy. How was your first day at school? Ray asked when Harrow brought Toya home. The boy looked at her and thought for a moment, then shrugged. Boring. But all my classmates think it's cool endeavors my dad. He seemed very proud of that fact, and while she was pleased to see her son smile, it left Ray worried. Though she couldn't pinpoint what about exactly. She just had a feeling. Nothing went amiss for the first semester, and as summer rolled in, the family made a trip to Iwate for the first time since Toy was a baby. Now that Natsu was almost a year old, Enji and Ray decided to try again and visit her parents. This time Harrow was coming with them, set on keeping Ray's father at bay and keep his lectures to himself. They booked a hotel, one single bedroom for Harrow and two connecting bedrooms for the couple and the children. Ray had no desire to step foot in her former home, so the plan was to meet her parents at the beach, the same one her and Angie had gotten engaged at years ago. While Ray was on good terms with her mother now, calling her regularly and sending her photos via text, Dealing with her father directly was daunting. According to her mother, he hadn't changed much, which is what concerned Ray. Arriving at the beach, Toya and Fumi exclaimed loudly at the gorgeous view of the sparkling water and jagged rock formations that Ray loved so much. They had never been to the beach before, and the novelty excited them. Even big Natsuo seemed delighted and curious at the water, eyes wide and arms grabbing towards the blue waters. This was new to Haru as well, and he took a deep breath, enjoying the smell of the sea and warmth hitting his skin. 
As they made their way down to the beach, Fuyumi and Toya started hopping from foot to foot at the hot sand under their feet, having argued against wearing sandals. This led to Enji carrying the two on his shoulders, which was just fine by them. They liked being so high up and seeing the view. In the distance, Rei saw her mother wave at her from where she was covered under a parasol, her and her husband wearing light summer clothes and not exposing their skin to the sun. While they could all do with some light, the Ice Quirk users had to be careful to not expose themselves too much to the harsh rays. Unlike Haro or Enji, they were much likelier to burn. Mother? Father? Ray greeted awkwardly. Ray, it's lovely to see you, her mother greeted warmly, her face a little older than what Ray remembered. Her father had also gotten older. The man was eyeing Haro warily, who already had his arms crossed and frowned at the ready. Toya, you've grown so much, the grandmother cooed to the six-year-old, who didn't remember this woman. You were very little when we last saw each other. Were your grandparents, your mother's parents, she elaborated, getting along, oh, from the boy. And you must be for you, me. It's wonderful to finally meet you. Nice to meet you, grandma, the little girl smiled back politely, the more sociable of her siblings. Fondness clearly struck the older woman at being called grandma, and she smiled at the two Todoroki men. And, oh my, Natsuo, is he really just 12 months old? Her eyes widened at the behemoth of a baby that was the third Todoroki child, who couldn't stop staring at the waters. Haro smiled and laughed a little, being the one to hold the chunky child. He's sending one in a couple weeks, yes. He's about the same size Enji was at his age, he replied fondly, feeling like he was holding a mini Enji with a different colour palette. Besides him, Enji groaned at the comparison gaining giggles from his two eldest. Papa was a fat baby. Fuyumi giggled behind her hands. Okay, Enji sighed through gritted teeth. No respect in this family. Trying to apply sunscreen to Toya was like wrestling a raccoon. The oldest child apparently wanted to burn to a toasted bun in the blazing summer heat. Fuyumi was much more sensible, and Natsu didn't exactly have much to argue with, following his sister's sensible nature. Eventually, the parents managed to get the kids covered before letting their firecracker elders bolt for the water, Enji in close pursuit with Fuyumi in his arms. I think Natsu wants to dip in the ocean too. He's been staring at it longingly for a while now, Ray's mother commented with a laugh, gaining a smile from her daughter. I'll go and see what he thinks, and maybe help Enji. In the distance, Enji's voice telling Toya to not swim too far out could be heard. Toya's, I do what I want, echoed back twice as loudly. Ray's parents watched with lifted eyebrows as their daughter easily picked up the large toddler in her arms and she disappeared down the beach to the water's edge. Harrow laughed at their expressions. Ray has been training with Enji. Natsu is really clingy and likes to be carried by her. But since he weighs so much, she started struggling, Harrow explained. Yes, Ray told me about it on the phone, Ray's mother nodded. I was just surprised. Toya has been training with him too, correct? Shame he can't be a pro hero. At her husband's words, she and Harrow sent him harsh looks. It is, the man tried to defend himself. There's more to life than being a pro hero, Harrow argued. He's just started school. There are plenty of opportunities for him to discover and explore. Same goes for Fuyumi and Atsuo. I wasn't implying there wasn't. Ray's father argued, sending his own frown to the man. While he had mellowed out a little in the last few years, the notion of fame and glory still bounced around his mind, and the desire for his grandchildren to be as successful and well-off as his son-in-law was a pleasant thought. The humor of man is vain in many ways, but also he simply didn't wish for his grandchildren to suffer the same financial struggles and humiliation he had, even if he had a strange way of showing it. Harris sighed, looked back to the water, where Toya was currently attempting to tackle his father into the water, to no avail, Fuyumi and Rei teaching Natsu how to swim a little, keeping his head above water so he didn't get a face full of sea salt. In the water, Rei was wearing a lovely one-piece floral swimsuit that attached to the back of her neck. Her hair was up to avoid it getting too wet, and she had sunglasses on to protect her grey-brown eyes. The cold water felt refreshing in the boiling heat. Natsu, Fumi, and Toya seeming to be of the same opinion, all in their own age-appropriate colourful swimsuits. Enji was wearing red and orange swim shorts, his hair that usually stuck in its spiky shape now wet against his forehead as Toya mercilessly splashed him with water. 
As a wave started to come in, Enji motioned to Toya, teaching him to dive into the wave to avoid being wiped out and tumbling in the water. They weren't big waves by any means, but big enough for a six-year-old to need to know how to swim properly. By the time it became noon, the sun was getting much too warm for the little ones, and their parents brought them back under their parasols. A few more people littered the beach than before, some glancing in surprise at the Endeavour lookalike, but not approaching. The idea that Endeavour was up north in Iwate, playing in the sea with his children, didn't even cross their minds. Toyo whined as his father put more sunscreen on him, grumbling into his watermelon slice that he didn't need more stupid lotion. Yes, you do, Angie said firmly, not in the mood to argue with Toyo about this. He was the most sensitive here, and while they didn't know if the rays from the sun could, would have the same effect on his body as his quirk, Angie had no desire to risk it. Toyo just grumbled. Despite their best efforts, by the time they headed back to the hotel, Toya's skin had reddened in places, mainly his forearms, signs of light sunburns. It wasn't particularly painful, just frustrating to Enji that even with all his precautions and planning, Toya still got sunburns. Not Toya's fault, of course. They had plans to have dinner with their newly met grandparents later tonight at a restaurant, so the Todoroki adults got busy with washing the salt and sand off the children. They tended to Toya first, since he was a bit burnt, and Ray lathered on after sun lotion to help him heal. After that, they cleaned up Natsuo, who was babbling excitedly at being in water again. I'll go get ready too, Harris said as he finished dressing Natsuo and placing him on the floor besides Toya. Mum and Dad are busy with Fuyumi and also getting clean. Can you look after Natsuo? At his eldest grandson's smile and nod, Haro returned the smile and left the room. Toya looked at his big baby brother who had grown to half his size and weighed more than him. It admittedly annoyed him a little, realising he'd always be on the smaller side of things, but also found it funny with just how giant Natsuo was. As the almost one-year-old reached out to him with a little babble of To and Yaya, trying to say his big brother's name, Natsuo accidentally smacked Toya's sunburned forearms, making the older boy wince. This wasn't a feeling he had in a while. Toya realised, the pain of burnt skin and the lingering buzzing sensation it brought. Right, because he hadn't trained his quirk since... since he had started working out with his parents, months ago. His body had gotten stronger since. He was among the fastest kids in his class and was the king of dodgeball, always being picked first for any team activity. So, maybe... maybe... He summoned one of his small flames, just the size of a candle flame like his grandfather's, and let it linger in his palm. What little hope he had was quickly dashed away as a burning sensation bloomed and he snuffed out the flame, waving his hand in pain. Toya had hoped his body becoming physically stronger meant he maybe had more tolerance to fire, but no, that was not the case as he glared with tearful eyes at the small burn mark in the palm of his hand. It's so frustrating. Natsuo looked at his older brother's eyes welling up in tears, and he started sniffling. He saw him being in pain for a moment, and thought that maybe that's why he was crying, because it hurt. Being barely one year old, he didn't understand the depth and complicated nature of Toya's pain, nor did he know of his brother's unfortunate circumstance. All he understood is that his brother was hurt, and he didn't like that. With little chubby hands, Natsu reached out for Toya's too warm palm and held it with the grip only toddlers have. This brought Toya out of his wallowing misery and blinked tearfully at his baby brother. The child grinned up at him with his four-teethed smile, wanting to make his brother's sadness go away in the only way a toddler could. Toya sniffled a little before smiling back and wiping his tears with his t-shirt, comforted. Then he jolted, his hand suddenly getting cold as Natsu held it, small ice swells forming from the infant's fingertips. The overheating pain went away quickly, replacing it with a refreshing coldness that reminded Toya of the snow he liked so much. Papa! Mama! Natsuo's quirk showed! He exclaimed loudly, getting to his knees and bouncing giddily as Natsuo looked at his hands in surprise, but still smiling, just happy his brother wasn't sad anymore. Ray stumbled out of the bathroom, sleeves rolled up due to bathing for Yumi. Her eyes widened in delight at seeing Natsuo's ice quirk. He's got the same quirk as you and Fuyumi! Well done, Natsuo! 
Ray praised the clueless child who was looking between his beloved mother and brother. They were happy. That's all he understood. Angie, Angie, come look! Her husband eventually entered the bedroom too, carrying a dried and dressed for Yumi who was struggling to be put down and also join in fawning her brother. Angie smiled at the sight of his youngest, biggest baby being surrounded by his celebrating family. The news was met with much excitement by all three grandparents as well. Angie's health flame manifested around this age too, Harrow told Ray's parents with a laugh. The flame was so big it almost burnt the flat down. Once again, Angie groaned at the embarrassment of his father telling baby stories. Ray's frost manifested when she was born, like for Yumi, Ray's mother shared in turn, smiling as Natsu gobbled down his baby safe onigiri the restaurant offered. Toya, you said Natsu manifested his quirk with you? Can you explain what happened? She was eager to hear the story. Toya stopped slurping his hot soba noodles, a feeling of dread settling in his stomach as all adults turned to him. He absolutely could not tell them it was because he had tried to use his quirk again. He swallowed his mouthful slowly, trying to come up with a believable excuse. My sunburns hurt, he said, showing his bright red forearms. I think he wanted to cool them down for me. Murmurs of, that's so sweet, echoed through the table from all except Engie, who had a very stern look on his face as he stared at Toya, feeling like that wasn't the full truth. Toya acted like he didn't see his father's expression, occupying himself with slurping down the rest of his noodles. The start back to school was... rocky. Toya, you got sunburnt? One of his classmates asked, pointing to Toya's arms, which had started healing, but were still a little redder than the rest of his skin. Hmm? Oh, yeah, my family went to the beach in Iwate. The sun was hot, he explained with a shrug as he swapped out his outside shoes for his inside ones. But you're in Deva's son. How can you get burnt? That hit a nerve. What? I can't get sunburned? Toya asked, defensive and a little angry. That made his classmate step back, surprised. Well, yeah, another child said, sending the defensive Todoroki a confused and maybe even judging look. Unless you got your mum's quirk. I don't! I have my dad's quirk! Toya snapped before he had time to process what he said too proud of his similarities with his father to realise the hole he was digging himself in. A third student, known to be a bit of a troublemaker, joined the conversation, hands on hips and raised eyebrows. Oh yeah? Prove it. Toy could feel familiar frustration bubbling in his chest again, the desire to prove and justify himself being much stronger than his parents' worry for him. He summoned a large, powerful flame, the heat of it blasting the four children's hair out of their face, and catching some other's attention, but not his teacher, who was busy inside the classroom. Immediately, though, he had to kill the flames as he could feel his skin sizzle slightly and waved his hand to cool it. See, you did burn! The third child laughed, pointing at his hand that Toya had was cradling against his stomach. The first two looked at each other in confusion, then started laughing too. What sort of fire user gets burned by his own flames? One said. Before Toy could reply, the bell rung, and it was time for class to start. With a stinging hand, he powered through the school day, feeling upset and angry as he heard his three classmates whispering to the others about his flames hurting him. This went unnoticed by the teacher, as Toya had become quite good at hiding his burns from anyone he didn't want to see. During his break, he spent ten minutes running his hurt hand under cold water, hoping to make the redness go away before his grandfather would take him home. Harrow noticed that his mood was off that afternoon. Did something happen in class today? He tried to pry, but all he got was a shrug from the child, who had his hands in his pocket. Nah, just boring, Toya said flatly. Harrow hoped that's all it was. Angie was very much doubtful it was just that. The same worried feeling Ray had shared back when Toya first started school settling in his gut as well. He just wished Toy would open up to them about it. Chapter 22. Eruption. Harrow knocked on the classroom door. Oh, Mr. Todoroki, what can I do for you? Toy's teacher smiled to him as she sorted some books on her shelves. Harrow smiled back, the forming wrinkles around his eyes crinkling. Hello, miss. I just wanted to ask about Toya. Did anything happen last semester? 
It was now December, and school would be out for Christmas soon. In the last couple of months, Toya's attitude had shifted again. He wasn't angry like before, but quieter. He didn't speak of school or friends, nor if he liked any subjects in particular. Around his family, he was bubbly and smiley, enjoying whatever activities they did together, but if school was ever brought up, he shut down. No, I don't believe so. The teacher blinked at the older man, a slightly concerned look on her face. Toy gets along with the other kids, and he does well in class. He's more on the reserved side, but nothing out of the ordinary. Reserved simply wasn't a description that fit Toya. But she couldn't know that. He was Endeavor's son, after all. And it's not like the man did interviews often. Hara understood why she'd assumed that Toya is a reserved child. Uh... Well, if you do see something out of the ordinary, could you let me know? He's been... He's been acting a bit off recently, and we're worried, Hara asked somewhat meekly. Sorry to ask so much of you. Not at all. You'll be the first to know if I notice anything. Hara had been a teacher at this elementary school since he graduated from high school. For almost 30 years, he'd worked with children, and he knew how sneaky they could be. If they wanted to hide something, they would, in their little clumsy ways. It's where bullying was such a problem, especially with kids so young like Toya. Sometimes they didn't even know they were being bullies, not meaning to be malicious. Typical for children, they push any and all boundaries they can. The job of adults is to teach them to respect the reasonable boundaries set up for them while allowing them to question everything. With the popularity of heroes like All Might and Endeavor, Hara was sure that quirks and heroes were a common topic for the youngsters. It was unavoidable and normal, but he was sure it affected Toya in some way. But if it had, the boy was tight-lipped about it. It upset Ray and Engie greatly that Toya wouldn't tell them what's wrong. When asked, he'd deny it or change the subject. They couldn't understand why that was the case. Did he feel like he couldn't talk to them about it? If so, why? They didn't want to force him to talk about whatever was going on, so they continued with life, hoping eventually Toya would willingly bring it up. As Fuyumi turned six, she too prepared for school in the following March, after Toya would have turned seven. While Toya had been uninterested and maybe even wary at the concept of school, Fuyumi was beyond excited. The idea of being with children her age, every day, learning things, getting to try out new skills, it sounded like so much fun to the little girl. It's boring, Toya said flatly halfway through his last semester of being in his first year. You sit in class and follow instructions. He poked at his cereal with disinterest, not hungry and already tired of today. It was only morning. You find anything outside of home boring, Fumi shot back, not about to take a big brother's opinion when, in her eyes, he was always wrong about everything. Maybe you're boring, since you have no friends. She got a glare for the remark. I don't have any friends because I don't want any. Toya snapped back. Everything all right? Ray asked as she entered the kitchen, having been busy putting Toya's lunch in his bag. Toya said nothing. Toya has no friends because he's boring, Fuyumi replied, matter of fact, much like a father. Shut up, Toya grumbled as he forced a spoon of cereal into his mouth. Ray looked at him worriedly. Maybe school isn't the best for Toya, Ray said to Enji while on a call with him. He was having his lunch that Ray had made him in his office at the agency and had agreed to call her after she sent him a concerned text. Having left early in the morning, he hadn't been there for the conversation at breakfast. He doesn't seem to enjoy it. I think he enjoys learning, NG replied in between bites of his omelette. I think the other kids might be where he's struggling, something that hit a little close to home. NG wondered if his own inability to make friends had passed down to his children. Maybe not for Amy. The problem is we don't know for sure, so we can't solve it. And Toya won't speak to us, Ray sighed, saddened. Then she smiled a little. Honestly, I'm hoping Fuyumi will be a little spy for us. Maybe she'll see something from a child's perspective. Enji let out a small laugh. That would be helpful, he agreed. As Fuyumi was prepared for her first year of school, she was given her mini-mission to report back anything to her parents she found suspicious. It's like I'm a sidekick for Papa, she giggled into her hands when Enji asked her to do this for them. He smiled at his daughter's reaction. Whether she took it seriously or just as a game, it didn't matter. If Fuyumi felt like she could tell them anything she wanted, then maybe Toya would be encouraged to as well. 
having Fumi at school with him was honestly nice. Toy got to see her every break and at lunchtime, and having that time away from his classmates helped make his days a little brighter. Most of his classmates were fine, only a handful of the boys were nasty to him about his burning problem. It had become an open secret among the kids that Endeavor's son was intolerant to fire, but somehow it hadn't reached the adults yet. If anything, the only reason he didn't get more of a hard time for his quirk is because he obliterated his classmates in every single PE class. Thanks to working out with his parents, Toy was in tip-top shape for his age, faster and stronger than all the other seven-year-olds. While he was good in most of his classes, he dominated in anything sport-related. It probably helped that Haro was the teacher in these moments and knew how to keep an eye out for Toya. Haro made sure to never cuddle or give him special treatment, making sure that his grandson tried every position in team sports. While he'd inherited his father's lack of cooperativeness and wanting to do everything by himself, Toya was surprisingly good at refereeing, which made his grandfather swell in pride. With their eldest children at school all day, Ray was left alone with two-year-old Chunky Natsuo. Every day, he looked more and more like Enji, which Ray noticed made Haro very emotional. It probably reminded him of when Enji was this age. Haro's favourite pastime was warming Natsuo's fingers up with his gentle fire quirk, the chunky toddler bouncing with happy laughs as the ice melted from his fingertips, only for him to manifest more. Ever since Natsuo had manifested his quirk, he couldn't help but play with it, leaving little remnants of ice in his wake, gaining him the nickname Frostbite, with how his small fingers were always covered in a little bit of ice. Ray started making a habit of visiting Endeavor's agency a few times a week around lunchtime to see Enji, taking Natsuo with her. Being home alone with a toddler could get dull, after all. Initially, the number two hero was a little worried at the idea, thinking that maybe this wasn't the safest option for their toddler boy, but Ray waved it off. We're literally at our safest in the agency. Plus, your psychics love him, Ray argued. Just as with Toya, the psychics smothered Natsu of love and adoration. For Yumi, they didn't get to see much, as she wasn't all that interested in the hero world. Enji and Ray had their lunches together in Endeavor's office, with Natsu snuggled either in Ray's arms or propped on his father hero's thigh. On such a day like this, in April, Ray brought up the topic of a fourth child. Are you still okay with that? She asked her husband after a munch of her vegetable tempura. Enji hummed in thought, trying to encourage Natsu to try some of his mushy rice. The toddler pouted and turned his head away. We can't afford it. There's plenty of room at home. The only question is if you can handle it, he said after a moment, biting into his bread. Your last pregnancy was pretty rough. That's because I was carrying a mini you. I had no problems with Toy and Fuyumi, for the most part. Being pregnant with Fuyumi had been a dream, only at the very end did Toy give them a scare. Plus, this time around, I have some muscle on me. Not once have I struggled to pick up our chunky frostbite, have I? She cooed the last part at Natsuo, who grinned at his mother. All I say then is, maybe we pause at four, Enji replied, picking Natsuo up from his lap to set him on his desk, the toddler being very intrigued by the large windows that looked over the city. I'm always open to having more in the future, but what with Toya having difficulties, I think having any more would spread us thin. We still need to be able to give them all the attention they deserve. Ray nodded at that, agreeing with Enji. Looking at the clock, she realised it would soon be the end of Enji's self-appointed lunch break. Slowly packing things up in her bag, she stood to pick Natsuo up, but before she did, she leaned into her still-sitting hero husband's personal space, just above eye level with him. Mouth close to his ear, and frosted over fingers lingering against his collarbones that were only covered by his blue bodysuit, Ray could feel Enji's natural body heat radiating off of him. Hurry on home, she murmured, before pressing a kiss to his cheekbone. Without giving him any time to process, Ray had picked up their youngest son and left the office. Endeavor sidekicks found him leaning over his desk, head in hands as enough steam emitted off of him to turn his office into a sauna. Fumi was very popular in her class. Friendly, peppy, and enthusiastic, she was a joy to anybody who passed her. A good student and a helpful friend, people weren't nearly as interested in her being Endeavor's daughter like they were with Toya being Endeavor's son. While Fumi wasn't into heroes, Toya was, and very much made it his personality, whether he realised it or not. Talks of quirks and wanting to be heroes was common in his class, 
and try as he might to ignore it, he couldn't help but join in on the conversations, which often turned into petty squabbles, until someone got hurt. You can't be a hero if you get hurt every time you use your quirk, Toya, a girl said to Toya. It was genuine, not at all malicious, just an observation with the bluntness of a seven-year-old. But she got a punch for it from the red and white-haired boy, which triggered the other boys to punch back for attacking the girl. That's how, towards the end of the first semester of Toya's second year in elementary school, Harry was called into the headmaster's office. There, a patched-up toy was sitting on a chair in front of the desk, looking to the floor. Hara had feared this would happen. Toya, are you okay? He asked his grandson, but he got no answer. He's better off than the other kids, the headmaster sighed. Toya got into a fight after punching a girl in his class who said he couldn't be a hero. You punched a girl? Hara asked Toya incredulously, not thinking the child would do such a thing. He had never punched Fuyumi, nor even gotten into a serious fight with his oversized toddler brother. There had been no signs of aggression towards others, only himself when he'd pull at the white of his hair and use his quirk. I didn't mean to, Toya mumbled, full of guilt. He'd been so blinded with rage, it wasn't until he'd hit her that he realised what he had done. Hara sighed. Is the girl alright? he asked the headmaster. Her parents aren't most pleased, as you can guess. She'll have bruising on her jaw, and the other boys who fought back also have some minor scratches and injuries. We don't accept this sort of aggression in our school, it's completely inappropriate, the man said sternly, a deep frown settling on his face. He knew Harrow well, had been his colleague for a good number of years. Since the summer holidays are in a few days, we've come to the decision to suspend Toy for that time. Please discuss the behaviour during the summer break so that once he returns in the next semester, this doesn't happen again. While Toya had been more than happy to not deal with school, that was short-lived when he got home. Enji was furious. I'm sorry, Toya mumbled, tears in his eyes as he sat across his father at the kitchen table. Ray was also there, but preparing dinner. Fumi was doing homework with Haruo, Natsuo playing beside her. You need to say sorry to that girl, Enji's voice was stern. Toya had never seen him like this towards him before. His father hadn't shouted, hadn't overtly been angry at him, but from his scowl alone, Toya just felt worse. Enji sighed, rubbing the bridge of his nose, guilt in his chest as he saw those big fat tears in his eldest's eyes. Toya, you can't punch people just because they say something you don't like. You punch people all the time, his son mumbled back. I punch villains when I have to, and for the sake of training, Enji corrected. Not because someone said something dumb which loads of people do all the time. If I punched a reporter each time they said something I didn't like about Endeavour, there wouldn't be any reporters left in the country. He tried a weak attempt at making this more light-hearted. It worked, a little, Toya scoffing at a laugh as he wiped his tears with the sleeve of his jumper. Toya, because you work out with Mum and I, you're a lot stronger than the other kids. You could really hurt them if you're not careful. Toya lifted his eyes to look at his father. There was still anger simmering in the blue eyes he had inherited, but more than that, there was genuine concern. Enji didn't want people to think his son that he loved so much was aggressive, and didn't want someone to get hurt because of the boy's outburst. I was just so angry, Toya admitted. I understand. It's okay to be upset, Enji agreed, reaching across the table to place a large, warm hand on top of his son's messy, mismatching hair but that doesn't justify hurting others. Imagine if you had hurt Fuyumi instead. Toya hated the thought of that. He'd never want to hurt Fuyumi, not his little sister. Not Natsuo either. Rei placed a platter of meat dumplings on the table, sitting beside her son and kissed his cheek. I don't want to hurt Fuyumi, he mumbled as his father retrieved his hand from his head. To get their minds off of it all, they decided to have a family trip to Tokyo, where they'd spend a few days in the capital to celebrate Enji's birthday of Toshinori. I really wanted to introduce you to Sir Night Eye, but he picked up work hours so I could take a break while you visited, Toshinori explained with a warm smile to his red-headed friend. But I did manage to convince my old mentor to come have dinner with us later tonight, if you and Haro are up for it. Your old mentor? Enji asked, curious. He'd only ever vaguely heard of this eluded mentor, and was a little surprised Toshinori even suggested meeting him. 
Gran Torino, he... Toshinori hesitated, then visibly shuddered from head to toe, before continuing on meekly. He trained me all throughout UA. Must have been some ruthless training if it was enough to make the symbol of peace shudder. Go, go, have a boys' night out, Ray said eagerly when told the idea, all too pleased that unsociable Engie had a chance to go out and do normal man things. I can entertain the kids for tonight, they're pretty tired from the train journey. With that, Harrow and Engie left Ray to look after the three kids in their luxurious hotel room. Being the number two hero had its financial benefits. Toshinori, since he didn't have to worry about getting crowded by fans, reserved a table at a local restaurant he enjoyed going to. Enji equally could relax a little, since most didn't recognise him without his flame mask, something he was silently thankful for. Arriving at the unexpectedly fancy restaurant that was designed in a western style, they were brought to Toshinori's table. He waved at them with an uncharacteristic shakiness. Glad you could make it, he said with a worn out smile, like he had just been severely berated. Enji raised a confused eyebrow before his eyes settled on an older man sitting beside Toshinori. He was middle-aged, squarely built with short grey hair and the start of a scruffy beard. In his younger years, he looked like he could have been taller, but time hadn't been kind to him, with wrinkles already sitting around his eyes and mouth in a grumpy demeanour. Enji, Haro, this is my old mentor, Surahiko Torino. Gran Torino, these are my friends, Haro and Enji Todoroki. So you're in Deva, huh? The older man said with a stern side eye. Seeing how you and Toshino have been friends for some time, I've been keeping an eye on you. Enji was not an easily intimidated man. But this guy, it was making sweat prick at the back of his neck. Definitely a terrifying tutor, no wonder Toshino had been so shaken. Tell me, who trained you? I did, Torino, sir. Harrow spoke up warmly, even though he also felt a little intimidated. Well, I helped with the foundations before he joined UA. After that, my son mostly trained himself. Torino looked up at the older Todoroki, as if doubtful. I'm a PE coach at an elementary school, Haro said a little sheepishly. You did a good job then. Something in Torino's expression softened, despite the sternness still existing. You've raised a formidable hero. The praise was not at all what they expected, having taken him for being a much more ruthless older man of few words. Uh, thank you, um, I mean, so have you. Harrow smiled bashfully, a bit embarrassed. Forever incapable of taking compliments, no wonder Enji was like that, Toshinori observed in amusement. Yes, well, if only he'd visit me more. Toshinori immediately stiffened and started sweating bullets when his mentor's judging side-eye concentrated solely on him. The Todoroki men looked at each other and let out small exhaled laughs at the sight. As the four men had dinner together... Torino visibly warmed up to Toshinori's friends, him and Haro getting on just like how the number one hero had hoped they would. A fondness shone in his old mentor's eyes as he listened to Haro speak enthusiastically about his young students and work. I was Toshinori's homeroom teacher at UA, Torino said after they got their food. This made Enji raise his eyebrows. You taught at UA? he asked, surprised he'd never heard of Gran Torino before. I would have been retired by the time you entered both from teaching and hero work, the older man explained. These days, I mostly helped Toshinori with some behind-the-scenes things. Torino knew that Toshinori hadn't told them about his past and the truth of his quirk. He knew that he worried about putting a target on his friends' backs. In their letters over the years, Torino had strongly suggested Toshinori did tell them, yet his pupils staunchly refused. The only person in recent years who had been told was his new sidekick, Sir Nighteye, who Gran Torino had met when they told the man of, of the truth behind All Might. I must thank you for getting Toshinori to get a sidekick. It's done him a world of good not doing everything by himself. That, again, sent a shudder down the tall blonde spine. He often got an earful from the older man for pushing everyone away. You have a number of sidekicks, don't you? Almost twenty or so, Enji nodded. The rest of the evening carried on nicely, as they all spoke of various topics, from hero works to the reality of being teachers, Toshinori got another earful from Torino, to explaining how they all met and became close friends to begin with. You're an unusual type of hero, Todoroki, Torino said as they finished their desserts, though I doubt that's the first time you've been told that. Unusual is one of the tamer descriptions I've gotten, Enji nodded. News articles, magazines, online forums, while they sung his high praises, he also had a lot of criticism thrown his way. 
A lot of people argued that the only reason he was second in approval ratings is solely because of his friendship with All Might. Otherwise, he'd be a lot lower on the list. Despite what you'd think, Engie agreed with them. Fan service isn't my thing, and I'm not going to force it just because some rankings tell me I should. Fair enough. With so many heroes chasing the glitz and glamour that comes with the title these days, I'm sure those who notice and appreciate your efforts are very loyal, Torino said with a nod. Toshinori smiled. I'm glad you got along with them, Gran Torino, Toshinori said happily, still with a slight shake. They'd just said their goodbyes and were now heading back to the All Might Agency, where a room was for Gran Torino to spend the night before travelling home tomorrow. They're good men. Awkward, but hard-working, the former teacher nodded, before he fell silent. The way Harrow was, all warmth and smiles, how he spoke so lovingly about his students and grandchildren. It fondly reminded him of Nana, before she had to give up her son to protect him. I see why you don't want to tell them, but I still think you should. He looked up at Toshinori. Toshinori wouldn't. He wanted to protect the people that brought him a sense of home and belonging like Nana Shimura had. Tokyo was loud, but very fun, and Toya, Fuyumi, and Natsu had a great time looking at all the sights with wide-eyed wonder and fascination. For Angie's 30th birthday, they decided to spend it silently at the on-site hotel restaurant in a private room. It was just the Todoroki family and Toshinori. Because Angie didn't like to be made a big fuss of with parties and gifts, it was mostly done for the children's fun, with a cake and plenty of treats so they could have a special fun moment. Though Ray did have a little gift for her husband, in the form of an envelope that she gave him as they settled into bed. Opening it, Angie found photos of ultrasounds of a baby boy. Ray was four months pregnant and glowing, delighted to be able to announce it to her husband, who responded with a warm hug and kiss to her cheek. Thankfully, this fourth baby wasn't Angie sized and after what she had gone through last time, it was a piece of cake. Only now a bump had started to form, which is why she'd been able to keep it a surprise since getting the ultrasound. Despite it being August and summer, the couple snuggled together comfortably, Ray sighing happily into her husband's chest as Angie nuzzled her hair, holding her close. When Toy returned to school in the following semester, he apologised to the classmate he had punched. Initially, she had been a little scared by him approaching her, hiding behind her parents, but since Toy was with Haro, she felt like she was safe and could listen to what he had to say. Her parents were disgruntled at their daughter being punched, but having Endeavor's father personally apologise to them with a letter from Toya's parents also apologising, they felt they could let it go. Despite his apology to the girl, which she accepted, the other classmates he had gotten into a fight with didn't seem impressed. What do you want? Toya grumbled as they approached him during their break. You hit a girl, that's not okay one of the boys said, arms crossed. I know, and I said I'm sorry, Toya shrugged, turning away from them. Clearly, they didn't like him shrugging them off, and grabbed at his arm to stop him from walking away. Hey, you're not getting it. You don't get to hit people just because you're quirkless. Bat stabbed something in his chest. I'm not quirkless, Toya argued, ripping his arm out of the boy's hold, glaring at them. Yeah, you are. You can't use your quirk. You might as well be quirkless. Another said as the others laughed. Toy could feel anger bubbling in him again, wanting to do nothing more than show them just how quirkless he really was. The boys were glaring at him, daring him. But no. Like his dad had said, he could really hurt them if he wanted to. And while right now he wanted to burn them up into cinders, he knew he'd feel awful later. Toy became quite alone after that only spending his free time with Fuyumi and her friends. But they were scared of Toya. Fuyu, we don't want to play with you if your brother is there, one girl said with a wary glance at the blue-eyed boy. What? Why? Fuyumi asked, genuinely upset by this. Because he punched a girl, another argued. He said sorry, he won't do it again, Fuyumi argued, defending her brother. She had been upset too when learning of what Toya had done, but knew he felt guilty about it. Even now, she could see the ashamed look in his face as he kicked at the dirt in the schoolyard. Whether he said sorry or not didn't mean anything to the girls in Fuyumi's class, and soon she too spent her free time with just Toya. I'm sorry, Fuyumi. It's my fault your friends don't want to play with you, Toya said sadly as he and his sister ate lunch together. 
If they don't like you, I don't want to play with them. Fiumi huffed before taking a sip from her juice box. She had apple, while Toya had orange. I see them in class. It's an F. She grinned, not affected by this nearly as much as her brother was. Still, this left Toya in a terrible mood for the rest of the day. Then for the rest of the week, then for the rest of the month. He had shut himself off of his family again, worse than before. This is starting to feel far too familiar to you in your first year of UA. Harrow lamented to NG one late evening after the kids had been put to bed. Toshina had come for dinner too, and was with them as the two Toruki men explained Toya's attitude. He is NG's son, the blonde laughed lightly, but his expression fell. Kids can be cruel. If they see Toya as aggressive, they may think they're allowed to bully him. We don't even know if he's being bullied though, Hara sighed. I mean, it's obvious something's going on, but none of the teachers I talked to see anything. Fumi hasn't heard anything being said, so it must be very concentrated only a handful of kids. It must be those boys he got into a fight with, definitely, Angie grunted. But... But if Toya won't say anything, then we can't do anything about it. And I guess asking isn't helping either, Toshinori continued, fiddling with his hair a little. He just shrugs and ignores the question. If we try to push it, he gets annoyed and leaves. His red-headed friend replied, Which is a lot like what I would do. Especially when I was younger, but Toy is more reactive than I am, and doesn't seem to listen to reason that he doesn't agree with. It's difficult to work with. Fuyumi could see something was wrong too, and she'd been very vocal about her and Toya spend their free time together because nobody else wanted to. Ray was deeply upset by this, but even when Fuyumi said these things, Toy had no interest in explaining or adding to the conversation. Instead, he played with Natsu a lot, and distracted his mother by talking about the new baby. When's he gonna be born? Toya asked as Natsu made repeated attempts to stand up steadily, Toya having his hands out to catch his brother in case he toppled over. Ray sent him a sheepish look. January. Close to your birthday, most likely she admitted. Toya glanced at her, but kept his attention on his brother. Ray worried that Toya thought they were replacing him, or had forgot when his birthday was. Your father and I forgot that you were born earlier than expected. We, we thought he'd be born in a different month to you, she explained. Why was I born too early? Toya asked after a moment of silence. We're not sure. Premature births just happen sometimes, Ray replied honestly as she folded baby clothes besides her two sons. Fumi was having her daddy-daughter day out with Enji. There was a fair in town that she wanted to go to. There can be some actual reasons, but I was healthy and taking care of myself when I was pregnant with you, so none of those applied. There was one theory that Ray had. Namely, it was due to her family history. Because of the Himura family line inbreeding after the appearance of Quirks, Ray believed that her genetics could have caused some medical issues in the later generations. She'd always been pretty healthy, but there was no doubt that a couple centuries of cousins marrying each other had some repercussions. But since she had no proof of that, she didn't say it. She also didn't say that she felt immense guilt for Toya's birth complications, and that his quirk hurt him like it did. Ever since those doctor's visits, little seeds of sadness had bloomed into flowers of self-blame, even though Ray knew it wasn't her fault and that she couldn't do anything about it. It was something she wanted to talk to someone about, but she didn't know how to bring it up. It felt embarrassing to say anything about it, like admitting to a great shame about her family's history, even though everybody knew about it. Ignoring it and moving on was just more comfortable. Things got more difficult in school as the weeks passed. The occasional snide remarks became frequent. A few a day, then every hour, until it was every single time the boys were even in his vicinity. Whispers and mutters of him being quirkless, how it's dumb for Endeavour to have a quirkless son, that the only reason he was physically stronger than everyone is because he has to make up for his lack of quirk. It was endless. And yet, Toy never argued, never shouted, never fought back, just ignored it, or pretended to at least. In reality, the words were eating him up, pulling and snapping at all his insecurities that he could do nothing about. And every day, it got worse. The boys getting more and more confident, hiding their nastiness less and less until finally, Fuyumi overheard them. 
And Eva's gotta be disappointed though, a quirkless son like you. Fayumi isn't an angry person. She's patient, gentle, and loving. But the sheer nastiness of those words, and how untrue they were, left her shocked and livid. That's not true! She turned the corner, swinging her arms and stumping towards the boys bullying her brother, scowling deeply. Dad's super proud of Toya. He does better than all of you put together. For you, stop it. They're just being mean. Toya hushed her, but couldn't help but feel relieved that she was defending him, even though he felt like she shouldn't have to. Come on, Grandpa is waiting for us. He pushed by the boys to join his sister, but at her glaring daggers at her brother's classmates as the siblings held hands and started to walk away. Wow, running away? Guess that's all quirkless people can do, since they can't fight. Toya heard the sound of ice crackling and a sharp thwap before he realised Fumi had let go of his hand. Enji froze once he got home, a very red-faced Fuyumi sitting at the entrance next to the shoes being the sight that welcomed him. Next to her was an exasperated Ray, both waiting for Enji. Fuyumi punched the boy, she sighed out with no context. Enji blinked, blue eyes going from his pregnant wife to his daughter and back. I punched him with my ice, Fuyumi corrected, wanting to make very sure that the facts were right. You punched a boy with your ice. And she echoed back as he finally made a move to take his shoes off. At these words, Fumi showed him her little fist and formed ice around her knuckles. Where did you learn that? I saw it on one of Uncle Toshi's old movies, she explained. Right, Toshinori likes his American action films. It's probably where Fumi got the idea of knuckle dusters from. Why did you punch someone? And she asked in turn. Toy having outbursts was one thing, but Fuyumi, completely unheard of. She wasn't at all violent and would cry the concept of hurting a fruit fly. They were bullying Toya, she exclaimed indignantly. They were calling him quirkless, saying Papa isn't proud of him and that he's useless. And I told them that wasn't true because you are proud of Toya. And then Toya said to just ignore them and go meet Grandpa, but then the boy said he was running away since he can't fight, and so I punched him. Enji crouched in front of his small, angry daughter her cheeks red with fury at the injustices done to her older brother. He stared at her for a moment, then looked to Ray. I can't tell her off for that, he admitted flatly. Ray sighed exasperatedly, her cheeks resting in her hands. No, neither can I, she whined. Their little vigilante daughter was far too cute and genuine in her feelings to be scorned for her brave actions. You shouldn't punch people though, especially not with your quirk, Ice Cube. Enji did say gently, scooping up his little tomato of a child and giving Ray a helping hand at standing too. Despite saying that, he couldn't help but be proud that she'd stand up for her brother like that. Is your hand hurt? Nah, -uh, Fumi said, showing her his fist. She had her thumb tucked under her fingers. Enji showed her his own fist that he used to take down villains with. When you throw a punch, your thumb goes over your fingers. You could hurt your hand otherwise with the impact. Enji! Ray scorned her husband. It's true, Enji replied. If his daughter was going to throw a punch, it better hurt who she was punching, not herself. Of course, this meant having to have yet another meeting with the headmaster. Harrow offered to go alone again to deal with it, since he was a teacher and a grandparent, but Enji decided he wanted to attend too. Ray would go have a day out with Natsuo while Enji, Haro, Fuyumi, and Toya had a meeting at the school instead of the two children attending class in the morning. Mr. Todoroki, sir, this is the second time this school year I've had one of your children in my office for punching another child. The headmaster, who knew Enji already from the time he came to the school to give a talk as Endeavor, said reproachfully to the father, A third time and this will become a pattern. Toya apologised for punching the girl. Enji reminded, not wanting his son to be accused of something he already owned up to and was trying to grow from. And Fuyumi only punched that boy because he and his friends were bullying her brother. Toy looked to Fuyumi, the little girl puffing her chest out in justified rebellion against the headmaster. He had to stifle a laugh, lowering his head as to not get the stink eye from the headmaster. He'd never seen Fuyumi act like this before, and honestly, having her back in his corner like this was the highlight of this whole semester. Yes, and those boys are being reprimanded for bullying. That sort of behaviour isn't accepted at our school, and we deal with it when we can catch it, the headmaster nodded. However, this sort of reaction, inflicting violence onto others, that's a taught behaviour learned at home. 
Hira felt every hair on his body stand on end at the implications of that sentence. Angie scowled deeply, just as affected. Are you suggesting there is violence in our home? He asked sternly, voice telling the man across from him that such accusations would not be tolerated. Not in that sense, no. However, seeing their father, Endeavor, fighting villains every day could be giving your children a false sense of entitlement to do the same against those they deem wrong. Angie couldn't believe what was being said. Neither could Toya. Fuyumi and Hara both had the identical open mouth, shocked expression at the audacity of the headmaster. Both Toya and Fuyumi have troubles with their behaviour and quirks. Toya's hurts him, and Fuyumi is using hers to beat up students. I strongly suggest getting them some extra quirk counselling classes. Hara instantly felt nauseous. He despised quirk counselling classes. In all his years as both a student and teacher, never once had he seen any students with problem quirks actually benefit from them. If anything, it always left them defeated and tired, whatever problems they had never actually being addressed and touched upon. If your quirk isn't seen as useful to society, or even worse, if it has some truly negative side effects, it could make you feel abnormal, like a freak. It's why there was still so much discrimination against mutant-type quirks. Absolutely not, Hara exclaimed before catching himself and bringing a hand to his mouth. I mean, they have quirk counselling classes anyway. Toyin knows he can't use his quirk and Fumi has never used it before this incident. Hara, as a member of the faculty, I would hope the headmaster started to reproach, but Enji stood up abruptly, chair screeching against the floor as he towered over the man using his full height. From there, his eyes were slightly shadowed, fiery blue glaring down at the headmaster. I will not reprimand my daughter for defending her brother. Toya tolerated insults and mockery this entire semester without any teacher even noticing. If this is what it takes for you to do your jobs, then so be it. Enji bent down and picked up his two children, both of them looking incredibly smug. If you're so set on labelling my children as the problem, maybe you should make sure to tell the other students to not use quirkless as an insult and targeting my child for something he cannot control. The headmaster visibly shrank in front of Enji, who was using the calmest yet angriest voice that could ever be uttered. As the man all but turned into a puddle in his seat, Enji exhaled sharply through his nose, emitting steam like an offended bull, and turned heel, taking his delighted children with him. Harrow, having but crumbs of patience more than Enji, stood, bowed in a polite goodbye with a see you tomorrow, and left. During all this, Ray had decided to take Natsuo to the aquarium the same one she and Enji had their first kiss at. It was a fun location for her, and Nato seemed to be absolutely fascinated as well, motioning and pointing at all the sea creatures and fish living their lives in the vividly coloured blue waters. Now almost seven months along in her pregnancy, her pregnant belly was much more prominent, which meant she was starting to feel the familiar lower back pains again that she'd experienced thrice before. Toya and Fumi had been fine really, just a slight ache, but Natsu had completely incapacitated her. Compared to that, this fourth pregnancy was like ice skating to Ray. So despite feeling a slight burn in her lower back, she ignored it for the sake of her now three-year-old's enjoyment, Natsu being completely entranced by an octopus in its tank. Some clamouring could be heard in another room, which caught both the mother and son's attentions. Deciding to investigate, Ray saw a group of several crying children as they were hushed and reassured by their teachers. In the middle of all of this was a very flustered, heavily apologising young pro hero with a mutant type quirk that gave him the appearance of a killer whale. Natsu's eyes landed on the hero and instantly widened in awe. Mama, mama! he exclaimed as he bounced in his mother's arms, reaching out to the curious looking man. Clearly, Natsu wanted to investigate, and who was ready to deny him this? She approached a group of crying school children as their teachers ushered them to a corner to calm them down. Is everything alright? She asked kindly to the pro hero, who looked quite distressed himself over having made the children cry. Despite this, he replied in a calm and focused voice. Yes, my apologies for the disturbance. I was asked to come to the aquarium to give some lectures about being a pro hero, but it seems it can be quite frightening to the little ones. The young man bowed in apology to the white-haired woman. Ray smiled. Not this one. Not so, say hello. She held her chunky three-year-old up to the pro-hero, who towered over Ray, and Natsu gurgled in delight. Hi, 
he said enthusiastically, reaching out to the killer whale-looking man as if offering a clumsy, frost-covered handshake. The man let out a small sigh of relief, and while Ray couldn't exactly tell, it seemed he was smiling. Hello, little man, I'm Gangorka, he said politely and professionally, shaking the small, icy hand with his own large, clawed ones. Oh, Gangorka, Ray said in recognition, finally having a face of a name. She had heard the name bouncing around the Endeavor Agency, among others, from the psychics. You only graduated recently. Congratulations, she said sweetly, bringing a slightly fussing Natsuo back against her chest. He wanted to inspect Gang Orca's cool face. Thank you kindly, the young hero replied. I'm Rita Doroki, Endeavor's wife, she introduced herself with a polite bow, Natsuo giggling as she leant down with him. At this, the young man's eyes widened. I'm so sorry, I had no idea. My name is Kugo Sakamata, honoured to make your acquaintance, Mrs. Todoroki, he said, becoming a little flustered again until he saw Natsuo reaching out for him with rigorous insistence, Ray visibly struggling to keep the big toddler from slipping out of her arms. I could hold him, if you wish. Please, the mother smiled, handing Natsuo to Gangoka. Instantly, the three-year-old settled and stared up in wonder at the pro hero. This is his first time at an aquarium. He's been fascinated by all the sea creatures. His mother explained fondly, glad to nurture an interest in the boy. Is that so? Do you like the sea, little one? Gang Orca asked Natsuo, who only blinked at him and grinned. His quirk. Is it ice-related? He asked, still feeling the sensations of the child's icy fingers and seeing some remnants still in the child's hands. Ah, yes, frost, the same as mine. He can generate his own ice. Ray explained with a nod. He's having some trouble controlling it, or rather, I think he likes a cold sensation, so he doesn't care to control it. I'm trying to teach him, but I don't have the same quirk knowledge as my husband. And since Endeavor's quirk is Hellflame, I assume that it works differently to Frost, and therefore isn't easy to teach this one to stop manifesting ice. Exactly, Ray replied. That, and NG seemed reluctant to do any form of quirk training again, what with Toya's whole situation. Now that she had her hands free without Natsu blocking the view, Gang Orca could see her pregnant belly. Congratulations, best wishes for your new child, Mrs. Todoroki, he said, forever still with the calm professionalism. As he said this, Natsu reached out and touched his face, giggling at the unusual texture of his skin. Gang Orca didn't mind. Oh, Natsu, gentle, gentle. Ray said softly, before laughing a little. Thank you, it's our fourth. We're expecting a third boy. Three boys and one girl. I'm sure your daughter will be able to stand her ground with ferocity. Gang Orca joked lightly. Ray laughed, knowing the reason as to why Engie had to be at the school today. You have no idea. As she said this, her phone buzzed. Excuse me. Looking at her phone, she saw a text from Harrow saying that they were with the kids at the mochi shop they all like to go to, and to join them if she wants. And she scorned the headmaster, apparently. I'm afraid we have to go. It was lovely meeting you, Gangorka. Please, pass by the Endeavor Agency if you ever have the chance. I'm sure my husband and his psychics would like to meet you, she said, reaching up for her son, who was given back gently by the giant pro hero. Say bye-bye, Natsuo. Bye-bye, the child said, waving happily. Have a lovely rest of your day, Mrs. Todoroki, little one. Late that night, Fumi sneaked into her brother's bedroom. Toya? She asked meekly, looming over the boy's futon. Blue eyes met her equally blue ones, and after a moment of staring, they both broke out into fits of hushed giggles. Papa was so mad, she laughed, flopping down next to her brother. Did you see how scared the headmaster was? Toya cackled wrapping his arms around his sister as he gave her a hug. And the face when you punched that guy? You're amazing for you. He breathed out a laugh before his face became serious. I'm sorry I said mean things to you before. Referring to when his quirk training had stopped and he shouted at her. Fumi blinked at his apology, then grinned, cheeks blushing happily. It's okay, she chirped back, hugging her big brother. You were sad, I understand. And I'll punch any mean boys who say mean things to you. The brother and sister duo fell asleep as they giggled endlessly at their father, scaring the living daylights out of their herdmaster. Weeks later, when the winter holidays were in the horizon, Endeavor was in another town after a frantic call from the local police to help with the villain. He did a quick job of taking down and capturing the Christmas tree-themed villain. Everybody has a gimmick these days, handing them over to the police. 
After his confrontation with the headmaster, he was in a bit of a rough mood. The man's words weren't going to stop Endeavor from being Endeavor and doing his job, but they still stung. Was it really his actions as a pro hero that was encouraging a violent streak in his children? No, that made no sense. Fuyumi had no interest in heroes. Toya made more sense, but even then he'd never been violent to anyone. Well, he had emotional outbursts, but the violence was always towards himself. Maybe this was just the growing pains of dealing with other people. Not that Enji would know, he always just did his own thing and minded his business. He had never gotten into fights. He'd been too busy caring after his overworked and exhausted father. Endeavor was dragged out of his thoughts when he heard the excited whispers of a small group of girls. For a moment, he fretted over it being a situation like those high school girls from all those years ago, but looking towards the source of the sound, he saw three preteen girls in elementary school uniforms. They looked to be around 10 or 11. Two of the girls were ushering their friend forward, encouraging her to speak to Endeavor. This girl had flaming green hair and a very red blush on her face. Finally, with enough force, her two friends managed to push her forward and she stumbled a little, looking up at the number two with reddish-orange eyes. E Endeavor! I'm Okamiji! I want to be a psychic when I grow up! She proclaimed with so much power and gusto, Endeavor thought he could hear her voice echo through the surrounding street. He stared at her for a while, the girl staring back while practically shaking of unbridled energy. That was fondly familiar. That so? he asked gruffly before crouching down to be at her level, one knee on the ground. What's your quirk? At the question, the fiery girl beamed a bright toothy smile at him. He noticed that her canines were more fang-like than normal. Blazing hair, she replies enthusiastically, grabbing a chunk of her green fire hair and holding it up to the flame hero. With a focused scowl and small grunt of effort, the green fire in her hands shifted and molded into a spear-like shape. I can do lots of different things with it. As she said that, she released the fire from her palm, which dissipated into the air. Seeing the girl's energetic enthusiasm, an uncharacteristic, soft smile appeared on Endeavor's face as he snuffed out the flames, showing his entire face and getting rid of some of the intimidation factor of his hero get-up. Moe looked at him in awe at the control he had over his fire. Work hard, Moe Kamiji, and when you become a hero, come visit the Endeavor Agency, he said simply. Moe stared for a moment, before a determined scowl and grin combo appeared on her face. Yes, sir! She exclaimed loudly, giving the number two a salute at the order he'd just given her. She ran back to her friends who squealed in excitement at her success. Endeavor rose back to his feet and summoned the flames around his eyes again. Maybe he was capable of positive interactions. Enji jolted from his sleep as he was shaken awake. Blinking the sleep away, he saw Rei kneeling over him. In a hushed, whispery voice, she said, I want cold sober noodles. And she stared. Rei had said those words with all the seriousness and solemnity he'd expect from a monk telling him a prophecy. What? He yawned out. I want cold sober noodles. Rei repeated firmly, as if she'd die if she didn't have them immediately. Blinking the sleep away, he glanced at his phone. Ray, it's 2.30 in the morning. Not a satisfactory answer. At the dead-eye stare he got from his very pregnant wife, Enji got the hint. I'm going, I'm going, he yawned, stumbling to get up as he ran his fingers through his scalp. He heard a whispered, elated, yes, behind him as Ray got up as well and followed him to the kitchen. With her arms around his hips, she pressed her face into his side, watching him make her dish just the way she liked it. Chapter 23. Inflammation. What do you want to do for your birthday? Enji asked in early January as he made breakfast to a sleepy-eyed Toya. The child blinked, then yawned, rubbing his eyes. I don't know. I thought you'd be too busy with the baby, Toya admitted as he sat at the kitchen table, watching his father make an American-style breakfast. Is Uncle Toshi visiting? Mm, Enji grunted in reply, balancing a barely conscious Fuyumi in one arm while he worked the bacon and eggs in the frying pan with the other. He had some early work this morning, so I told him to come have breakfast with us. For your birthday, it'll be a week after the baby is born. No reason why we can't organise something for you. You sure? Mum looked pretty tired after Natsu was born. The almost eight-year-old asked with raised eyebrows. Enji turned to look at him with a sheepish smile. 
The memory of Ray cursing the Todoroki bloodline for their oversized men as she went into labor was something that kept him up at night sometimes. That's because Natsu was... well, he was a lot bigger than you and Ice Cube here. He shrugged his shoulders slightly, making his little daughter snort awake before she snoozed back to her light sleep. Toya snorted out a laugh. This new baby is much smaller in comparison. Plus, your mum will have grandpa and I to help, like always. Toya hummed thoughtfully, not really knowing what he wanted to do for his eighth birthday. It's not like he had any friends to invite. After the scandal with Fuyumi and the news of Endeavor having almost reduced the headmaster to a sweating puddle of crushed authority, all the kids kept well out of their way. The teachers were polite, but it was clear they wanted to deal with the Todoroki kids as little as possible, only Haro treating them the same as he did all the other students. Toya had noticed that his grandfather's colleagues had even started treating Haro differently, though the students still liked him. A knock at the front door was heard, soon followed by Haro's yawn-filled voice saying he got it as he passed the kitchen. Excited murmurs of greetings were heard before the eldest Todoroki family member entered the kitchen with an always grinning Toshinori. Good morning, the blonde man chimed. Morning, Enji grunted back, Toya waving at his uncle a little. Wait, are you making bacon and eggs because of me? The taller man asked with a hint of amusement. An embarrassed scowl formed on Enji's face. I'll burn them, he threatened through a pout, gaining a laugh from his longtime friend. Nah, don't be like that, I'm flattered. The blonde came to stand by him, Fumi blarily blinking up at the man. Morning, Fumi. Hello, Uncle Toshi. The little girl yawned, stretching her arms over her father's shoulder, before tapping her dad's shoulder to make it known she wanted to be transferred from the redhead to the blonde. More than happy to hold his unofficial niece, Toshinori accepted Fuyumi into his arms as Enji focused on not actually burning the food he was unfamiliar with frying. He didn't like oily, fatty foods, usually. Uncle Toshi, why do you always look so tired? Toya asked as Hara placed two coffee mugs on the kitchen table for him and Toshinori. The latter sat across the eldest Todoroki child, looking a little taken back at the question. I work a lot. Since I work for All Might's agency, I'm always busy, he replied brightly. That's the story they told the kids. Uncle Toshi works for All Might, and that's how he and Enji met. It's going to be a birthday soon. Any plans? He swerved the conversation away from him as Fuyumi started fiddling with his long hair strands around his face. She'd never quite gotten out of the habit. No... I guess go to the agency. I want to see the sidekicks train, Toya said thoughtfully, reaching out for the cup of orange juice his grandfather poured for him. It's cool seeing what their quirks can do. There was a tinge of bitterness in his tone despite being genuinely interested. Oh, no birthday party then? Toshinori asked, a little cautiously, not wanting to bring up any difficulties from school. He gained an eye roll and huff from Toya, Hara whispering out a, that's rude, don't do that, to the child. Why? All the kids at school are stupid, Toya said harshly, a familiar anger in his blue eyes. Toya, Harris said firmly, not willing to tolerate the child's bad mood. The kids in Toya's class are mean, Fumi agreed, more awake as she rubbed her eyes. They don't play with him and call him quirkless. That stabbed something old and sore in Toshinori's heart. The slight wince was caught by Enji's observant eyes. More questions to Toshinori's past that the man only ever vaguely referenced. Even though I have a quirk, I just can't use it, Toya grumbled, expression darkening. Toshinori looked to Haro, at a loss at what to say. Haro sent him an exasperated expression back, also not knowing how to break the tension. I tried, Enji sighed heavily, placing a large platter of bacon and eggs at the centre of the table, followed by some toast and a bowl of sliced apples to share. Pardon me if it isn't your Americanized standards. His tone was harsh, but Toshinori was used to it and grinned at Enji's banter. Toshi! A small child's voice exclaimed excitedly. All turned to look at scruffy-haired Ray, holding hands of toddler Natsuo, who was just about walking steadily. The child waved at his uncle, happy to see him. Hey there, Natsuo! Toshinori grinned, before looking to a barely put-together Ray. I'm going to hold off on the good morning. You better, Ray yawned out, but smiled. My iceberg of a child decided to make it known he was awake by tackling my face, so that was an abrupt awakening. Is that true, Frostbite? Are you being a menace to your mum? Harrow asked jokingly as Natsuo looked at his family with bright eyes but understanding nothing. I made a different type of breakfast, Enji told his wife, greeting her with a kiss to the forehead and smoothing out her hair a little. If it makes you feel sick, it can make you something different. 
Bray smiled up to her husband. Thank you. I've been wanting to eat it since I smelled the bacon from our room, so I think I'll be all right. Ray laughed lightly, letting go of Natsu's hand as he pulled at his father's pajama pants, bouncing a little on his feet. Haru looked on as Enji picked up his lookalike son, Ray giving a big kiss to the toddler's chubby cheeks, which made Natsu giggle and grin widely. Natsu's smile was different to Toy and Fuyumi's. While they looked more like their mother, Natsu looked identical to how Enji did. Except he smiled a lot more and enjoyed blotting himself against his mother's face. A heavy weight pressed in Haru's stomach, and he took another sip of his coffee. Enji had never really smiled throughout his childhood, nor laughed. Not that Haru noticed since he'd been so busy of trying to keep a roof over their heads in his son's formative years. Now that he saw Natsuo, he looked like Enji of white hair, he wondered if it was because of him that Enji hardly ever smiled. Or if he denied him a happy childhood because his mother left. Maybe if he'd done more, his wife would have stayed, and Enji could have had a mum like Natsuo did. Grandpa? Fuyumi's little questioning voice asked through the fog in his mind. Hara's blue eyes met Fuyumi's, filled with concern. Are you okay? Being seated in Toshinori's arms, Hara could see the blonde's equally worried expression. Hara smiled. I'm okay, he tried to reassure. Mom, do you think the baby will have white hair or red hair? Toya asked Stray as she sat beside him. Or mostly white hair with red, like Fumi and Atsuo? Ray made a humming sound as she thought through the question, hand running through her eldest thick hair. It was almost completely white now. Only flecks of red scattered throughout it like Fuyumi's left a hint that he was a full redhead before. Red hair with white flecks would be cute, don't you think? Like Fuyumi, but in reverse. Ray said with a smile, but got a pat from Toy in reply. And that would mean a fire quirk. All the adults in the room and Fuyumi winced at the sentence. With the children's track record, everybody was silently hoping for another frost child. 11th January, Shota Todoroki was born at home with loud proclamations of his existence. He sure has a strong set of lungs, doesn't he? Haro laughed with the newborn's protests of being born. He was in the garden of Toyo, Fumi and Natsu as they heard their newborn brother's cries coming from the other side of the Todoroki abode. It was only later that day when the midwife had left and Ray had freshened up but the three children and their grandfather were allowed to see their new brother. Being her fourth child and a much smaller baby than Atsuo, Rei recovered quickly and was all smiles as she held her third son in her arms. Enji was smiling too, but there was a glint of worry in his expression that Hara felt nervous about. Fumi gasped in delight and ran over to her mum. Hi Shoto, she said in a hushed voice, grinning at the still noisy baby. Despite making small cries, he'd calmed down a lot throughout the day. If Toya had been the smallest baby, Fumi the sleepiest and Natsuo the biggest, then Shoto was definitely the loudest. Holding Natsuo's hand, Toya also walked to his mother's side and froze. Red and white hair split right down the middle. The blue eyes stared at the small baby in the striped onesie as Natsuo was shown the new family member by his mother. Something dark and angry settled in Toya's chest, but he couldn't pinpoint why. Natsuo laughing broke him out of his momentary trance, the large toddler having Shoto's small tight fist around his finger. Shoto went quiet as he listened to the laughter, as if recognising the sound. Fumi looked at Toya with a bright expression, blue eyes sparkling in joy at how cute her littlest brother was. A warm hand settled in his hair, and looking up, Toya saw Enji, a serious expression on his father's face despite the smile on his lips. But Toya swallowed and forced a smile back. He has heterochromia too, Toshinori grinned down at the one-day-old newborn in his muscular arms that was staring at him with wide, mismatching eyes. Solid, speckled, striped, and two-tone. If you ever have a fifth child, I'm going to be expecting check at her. The blonde teased his two friends as Ray laughed from where she was still resting in bed. Do you know his quirk yet? With red and white being so even, I'd assume... Not yet, Angie said as he and his wife looked at each other. It'll probably manifest within the year. Fumi's manifested at birth while Natsu's when he was one, so it could be any time between now and then. Uh, now, Toshinori said suddenly. Huh? The fourth-time parents looked back to their blonde friend. Shoto had followed in his siblings' footsteps and had taken an immediate tight hold of Toshinori's two long hair bangs as soon as they were within reach of him. The one in his right hand was freezing up, while the one in his left hand was being set on fire. 
All Might would have a hard time explaining why he decided to have a haircut in the following week. Toya seemed fine, Ray said softly that night as Engie prepared for bed. She watched a little frosted snot bubble form as Shota slept in a separate futon beside theirs. Mmm, Engie grunted, hands halting as he pulled on the hem of his t-shirt. I think it's best we keep an eye on him. I don't want him to spiral again when he's been doing better recently. Despite the bullying, the knowledge that he had his entire family backing him up seemed to encourage the eldest son. Angie went to kneel by his new, two-tone-haired son, stroking the little one's cheek with his thumb. Right side, ice. Left side, fire. He had both his and her race quirk. It was a combination Ray had been worried about when she had been pregnant with Fiumi. The same thoughts from that time dared to rear their ugly heads in Angie's mind, once again pointing out how having both quirks cancelled out any frostbite or overheating issues too much uses of their individual quirks could cause. If trained properly, Shota could become incredibly powerful and enough. He's barely been born. Enji scorned himself, squashing those old thoughts to the back of his mind where he hoped they'd die and stay buried. Why did they keep coming back? Are we going to have to train Shota to control his quirk? Ray asked, not having noticed her husband's eternal battle since he had his back to her. It depends. If he's like Natsu and Toya, yes. If he's like Fuyumi, no. Though, with what happened with Toshinori today, it's safe to assume that yes. Enji sighed, turning to look at his wife. But not until he's older, like we did with Toya. Ray nodded in agreement. Unbeknownst to them, a small child who should have been asleep was eavesdropping. Tears pricked at Toya's eyes. It wasn't fair. Why did Shoto get to have everything he wanted? Toya relapsed. Hard. After his eighth birthday and his third semester of second year in elementary school started, he found every breathing, unsupervised moment to crawl up to Sakoto Peak and train, like he had before. It hurt, just like it always did. But he was angry and upset and frustrated and jealous and, and, and he didn't know. He just, he just, he just needed an outlet. All the hurt in his chest he couldn't do anything with. He couldn't take it. At least he could see and touch the burns that formed once again along the muscles of his stomach and arms. At least he could actually soothe his suffering with secret cold showers and oversized clothes. At least it felt like he was doing something, competing with his newborn baby brother who was already better than him by just existing. At least he didn't feel like he'd explode for a little while. But the feeling always returned, building and building, like an addiction, an obsession. Despite his obnoxious arrival, Shoto was a quiet baby, who stared, wide-eyed, at everybody. He didn't move much, or react to anything really, nor express much of anything, usually keeping a neutral, mildly perplexed expression. His favourite spot was in his mother's arms, like Natsuo's, and it took a while for the larger toddler to accept that he now had to share his mother like his eldest siblings had to share their father. Shoto accepted being held by his grandfather, but seemed disinterested in being held by his father. The only time Shoto made any sound other than one of hunger was when Toshinori visited. Then he'd stretch his grabby little hands at him and intend to both set the mine ablaze and flash freeze him. After the first incident, Toshinori made sure to tie his hair back, so Shoto didn't force him to fix his hair again. Sir Naitai had been less than delighted at All Might's image being freezer burned by a newborn. Gran Torino had found it hilarious when he heard the news. Little Shoto manifesting his quirk while in his arms, something Toshino had never got to see or experience before, it healed something in him. He hadn't been quirkless for years now, but the old wounds still remained. Toshino wasn't one to play favourites, but it'd be a lie to say he didn't have a very special place in his heart for the white and red-haired child. Having Shota be more eager to be held by Toshinori rather than him left a Shota-sized bruise in Enji's pride, feeling the same sad mood Rei had when Toya and Fumi would choose Enji over her. His wife tried to reassure him that Shota would warm up to him, like Natsuo had. Enji explained that the problem wasn't that Shota didn't want to be held by him, but that he was actively choosing Toshinori over him when he wasn't even six months old. Toshinori sheepishly laughed at that, not knowing how to help when Shoto clung onto him like a magnet. 
Fuyumi and Natsu spent as much time as they could with their baby brother. The novelty of Shoto making them laugh and giggle at the unresponsive silliness of the youngest child. Haru was always on the verge of laughter whenever he looked at Shoto, his fourth grandkid having the natural air of cluelessness that rivaled even Natsuo's. Toya stayed away at arm's length. Even when Shoto seemed to want to reach out to him, Toya made a point to ignore the newborn. He'd even spare a glare to Shoto. The adults noticed and tried to create situations for Toya to bond with Shoto, but he always had an excuse. He was tired, he had homework, he wanted to play with Fuyumi or Natsuo, he was hungry. His grandfather and parents worried that this was a deeper issue of jealousy Toya seemed to be prone to, but when asked, Toya didn't respond in the same way he had when Natsuo was born. No, he said simply with a shrug. And nothing more. No anger, no dark looks, just a blank, neutral expression. Much like baby Shoto's. Like if our NG hoped that Shoto would eventually want to bond with him, the adults hoped Toya would warm up to Shoto, the latter of whom clearly wanted his eldest brother's attention. He got plenty of attention from Fumi and Natsuo, so he certainly wasn't lacking on overall sibling affection. In May of that same year, Ray finally made plans with the Ida family. They had gotten a new family member in the form of a baby boy last August, and the two mums wanted to finally meet up after so long. We should organise playdates between Tenya and Shoto. Since I'm busy with Tenya, I've taken leave from heroics for the foreseeable future. The Ida woman rattled on excitedly. You'll finally be able to meet Tensei too. Ray adored the idea of meeting up with a fellow mum. They never got the chance to see each other, only ever able to have phone calls. They made plans to meet in late November, and maybe even spend Christmas together at the Endeavour Agency, if Endeavour would permit it. Seeing how excited Ray was at the notion, Enji was more than happy to oblige. Endeavour and the Engine Hero family would be collaborating this winter, and the Eaters Agency would be celebrating Christmas with Endeavour psychics. Planning all this in May seemed a bit like overkill to Haro, but Enji and his excessive planning reassured him that this was absolutely necessary for things to run smoothly. During a weekend in June, Enji was setting up the home gym. He, Ray, and Toya continued their training sessions, but between his hero work, Ray needing to look after Shoto, and Toya having school, it wasn't as frequently as it had been the year before. But now that Shoto was six months old, Ray felt like she could leave him with Haro to train with her husband and eldest son. Fumi still had no interest in joining in, preferring to draw with Natsuo and read while sitting on her grandfather's lap. As Enji set up the bench press setup for Ray to try out, Toya excitedly hopped into the room, dressed in his child-sized slacks and a long sleeve t-shirt. He was confident he had hidden the burns along his forearms well enough. But he'd missed one peeking from under the collar. Angie's turquoise eyes narrowed in immediately on the discoloured skin. The smile that had been there before dropped and his eyes widened in horror. A cold shiver ran down Toya's spine. You... Angie started, but Toya was quick to run away. Toya! Enji yelled and grabbed his son firmly by the arm before the eight-year-old could get away. His son visibly winced in pain. Enji's hold faltered for a second before he crouched in front of him and started gently but frantically pushing back Toya's sleeves. His arms were littered with burns. Why? Enji's voice was shaking, heart beating fast as his mind narrowed down on the injuries marring his child's skin. Why are you burnt again? He wasn't yelling like before but his voice was raised, laced with frustration. He held Toya's shoulders firmly as to not let the child run away. A strange, detached smile spread on the boy's face, his eyes meeting his father's, but without truly seeing him, like he was lost in a different world. NG, what's wrong? Ray's concerned voice was heard as well as her footsteps. Appearing in the entryway of the tatami-floored room, she blocked Toya's sole escape. Seeing Enji's barely kept in distress, her eyes fell to Toya and his burned covered arms. Toya, she sounded like she was going to cry. It's because of Shota's quirk, isn't it? Enji pressed. Toya said nothing, just stared with a disturbing, dead-eyed smile. Toya, look at me! He placed a hand on his son's cheek, trying to get him to snap out of whatever days the child was in. Look at me. Toya echoed out his father's words weakly. That's what he'd always wanted, right? His dad's approval, for his dad to be proud of him. 
Endeavor's gotta be disappointed with a quirkless son like you. The words from his bullies rang around his head, jostling what little reason he had as an eight-year-old into nothing but frantic static. He just wanted his dad to be proud of him. He wanted to prove he was powerful like Endeavor too. He'd been told he could. He'd promised himself he'd prove it to them. And he would. He would. He would. Even if it killed him. Toya! His father's voice forced him to focus back on the blue eyes he had inherited. Seeing nothing but genuine concern and worry. Whatever the reason, just tell us. He couldn't take Toya not telling them what was going on anymore. They shouldn't have to depend on Fuyumi for them to know what to help Toya with. He'd beg Toy if he had to, he just needed to know. Everyone at school always talks about becoming heroes, Toy murmured, tears threatening to spill from his wide, unseeing eyes. His voice was trembling, but there was a gravelly stubbornness to it that sounded too much like his own to Engie's ears. And then they look at me, who can't even use his quirk. There's more to the world than heroes. It's just one of the millions of things you can do. Engie pressed, trying to get Toya to understand. Your quirk doesn't define you, with or without it. I- You can't understand! Toya raised his voice, his own frustration tainting the trembling tone. Because I'm your son, it's different. You told me I could be stronger. It won't go away. I can't get it out of my head. With every word, his tone became more frantic, more maniacal, his eyes losing focus again. It was as if he was looking for a cause, for something to blame, for something to put all his emotions onto. Anything that wasn't in on himself. He couldn't take it. His body was too small for all this fire. A fire it wasn't built to tolerate. A body built to destroy itself. And then there was Shoto. who had everything he wanted. It's not fair! Toya screamed, fire bursting around his hair with enough heat that Dre had to take a step backwards. His body shook of unbridled rage, unable to target it anywhere. Why was he so angry? Was it sadness? Jealousy? What was the cause? Who was the cause? Hate. Hate, 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 hate! He hated Shoto. Everything he represented. Everything he was. He wanted to hurt him. He was going to hurt him. Large, muscular arms wrapped around his tiny form before he managed to turn and slip away to go find Shoto, to hurt him. Toya screamed out in frustration as he was stopped by his father, more flames purposefully bursting out to try and make his father let go of him. Blinded by his own fury, he couldn't see Ray pressed against the corridor wall as she watched her eldest son's brittle skin burn as he fought against his hero father's hold with tears in her eyes. Enji refused to let go. The fire was scorching, more than his own average flames, but he tolerated it. Even when the fire ate into his chest and face, he just squeezed his eyes shut and gritted his teeth, pulling his son tighter against him without trying to hurt him, to let him tire himself out. With one final scream of anger, Toya went limp in his father's arms and started openly sobbing. Large tears dripped down his chin as his body shook of emotion. And still, Enju refused to let go. Slowly, he picked up Toya, holding the back of his head to press him against his shoulder. Either purposefully or instinctively to seek comfort, Toya wrapped his arms around his father's neck and let out large, shuddering sobs. The physical pain was settling in now too. Everything hurt. In the living room, Haru held Fuyumi, Natsuo and Shoto close to him, trying to keep his own tears from spilling. The TV was on as loud as he could put it, a children's show he knew they liked. But even with that, he saw Fuyumi mirroring his expression, eyes tear-filled as she held Natsuo close to her. Her arms encompassed his head as if trying to block the feral screams of their older brother, blotting himself against her grandfather's side as he gently cradled her head. Shoto stared wide-eyed and unaware up at his grandfather, just like Natsuo, who was looking at his sister with unblinking grey-brown eyes. Only when the door to the living room opened to reveal a tearful ray did Harrow let out a shaky sigh, not realising he had held his breath. Let's go out for dinner, she said simply in a quiet voice. Ray and Harrow, armed with Fumi, Natsuo and Shoto, left soon after to go have dinner at a restaurant. Kuramada was called to drive them anywhere they wanted. Angie stayed at home with Toya, helping him clean and dress his burns. All the while, Toya sniffled and cried no longer sobbing, but unable to restrain the tears. 
Once he was clean, patched up, and dressed into his pajamas, Angie cradled him in his arms as he went about making dinner just for the two of them. The sniffling and tears never stopped. I want glazed pork and rice, Toya mumbled into his father's shoulder when they entered the kitchen. Angie made him a sticky glazed pork rice bowl. At the restaurant, they had let Fiumi choose. Ray explained what happened to Fiumi and Haro as they ate their own meals. Haro helped Natsu with his food, the toddler too young to comprehend the situation. Shoto was fast asleep in his mother's arms, unaware of his eldest brother's hatred towards him. Does Toya hate Shoto? Fumi asked sadly. Why would someone she loves want to hurt somebody else she loves? Ray placed a soothing, cold hand on her cheek. She didn't know how to answer that. By the time they returned home, the house was dark. Glancing into Toya's room, the small child was fast asleep, curled under the covers of his futon. Beside him on the floor, Enji asleep on his side, hand protectively laid over Toya, as if he'd disappear like the flick of a flame. Fiumi, Shoto, and Natsu slept in the same room as Ray that night. The hero world is all I can show him, Angie said in a quiet voice the following early morning. Toya was still asleep. Haro and Ray sat across from him at the kitchen table. Fiumi and Natsu were still asleep. Shoto was in Ray's arms, sleeping too. I don't know anything else. He dedicated the last almost 20 years of being a hero. Only in his 20s did he make his first friend and got into his first and only relationship. All he knew is his family. And heroes. Would it just enable Toya's spiralling mindset to keep on taking him to the agency? Or could it show him other options to life he had? Could he in any way help his eight-year-old son who was losing himself to an obsession Angie had unintentionally triggered? Don't you dare stop taking him to the agency, Ray whispered out roughly. Her eyes were red, showing she'd been crying. Harrow looked tired. If you deny him that, I don't want to think what he'll do. Who else would he try to hurt? First himself, then his classmate, and after yesterday, it was clear he had wanted to hurt Shoto. If he was willing to go that far, who next? If they denied him the little things that brought him joy. Toya was happy when with Endeavor and his psychics. He was pampered, the centre of attention, and got to see the behind the scenes of the man he adored so much. It would be cruel to stop the visits. School is the problem, Harrow said softly, knowing how things were going on at the moment. How Toy and Fumi were treated like a threat to the other students, especially by their fellow classmates. The kids are too hero-focused. There's not enough exposure to other paths. Everybody's too set on putting everyone into boxes. Toy and Fumi have been labelled as problem children, whether we like it or not. Is homeschooling our only option? Angie asked, looking to Ray. She had the knowledge of what it could be like. Ray sighed, pushing Shota's lengthening hair out of his face. Homeschooling had been lonely for her. She had no siblings, her parents had been strangers, and she'd never known any other option was available. But the Todoroki had given the normal way a go, and it had hurt their two eldest. Homeschooling hadn't been a good experience for Ray, but her and Angie were different. Ray looked at her husband, a gentle but determined focus in her grey-brown eyes. Much to Toya's confusion, he wasn't taken to school when the weekday started again. Instead, he was prepped for a day at Endeavour's agency. Something he'd never complained about, but he didn't understand why. After his outburst, he was being treated to what he loved the most. He didn't complain. Well, he did complain about having to clean and redress his burns that morning. You did that to yourself, Fumi said flatly as she crossed her arms in a very Engie-like fashion. Natsu looked at his sister, then older brother, before clumsily copying Fumi's movements and crossing his arms. Toya very quickly stopped complaining. I called in a young pro here and his friend. I'd like you to meet them, Engie explained as Kurumada drove them to the agency. Endeavour, sir, you better not let the young mister have burns again, Kuramada explained from the driver's seat as if Angie was miles away instead of right beside him. 
Having seen how distraught his boss's wife, father, and the three youngest children had been the other night, he had no desire to recreate the scene again today. Toya sunk into his seat, embarrassed. As they arrived at the agency, it was with great clamours of excitement from the psychics that Toya was welcomed. Some concerns about his injuries were voiced, but Toya forced on a brave face and claimed it didn't hurt. Endeavour, a familiar voice broke through the crowd, and Best Genist, now a full-fledged hero at the age of 20, towered above the psychics. Best Genist, thank you for coming on such short notice, Endeavour replied. He had made some calls that evening before. He didn't have any of his flames on currently, since he was going to have toy on his shoulders most of the time. He noticed a much shorter man beside him. Is this the pro hero you mentioned bringing along? Yes, this is Shinya Kamihara. He was my underclassman in UA and has been a pro for a year now, the tall blonde introduced. The young man was dressed in what Endeavour could only describe as a ninja costume. It covered the lower half of his face, and his hair was shaped in a rigid, sharp shape that covered his left eye. The rest held up in an equally sharp yet neat ponytail. An honour, Endeavour, sir. I go by Edshot, the man said with a slight bow. Likewise, Edshot. Best Genus spoke of you highly when I called his agency yesterday, Endeavour replied. After Best Genus' sixth turnship, the whole fiasco of Toy and Fumi's school lives had gone down, plus Ray's pregnancy of Shoto, so Endeavour hadn't been in the right mindset to offer any more internships with UA. Otherwise, he would have brought Best Genus back for more work experience and Edshot too if Best Genus could vouch for him. Toya, come over. This is my eldest son, Toya, Endeavour introduced the curious but stern looking eight year old. Endeavour introduced the curious but stern looking eight year old. Toya looked up at the two young pro heroes. In his eyes, they weren't anywhere close to impressive like Endeavour. Hi, he said firmly, maybe even grumpy. Hello, I'm Best Genist, the blonde said, crouching to Toya's level and offering his hand as a greeting. The now completely white-haired child glared at the offered hand, but a warm, large hand on his head encouraged him to accept the handshake. This is my friend, Edshot. Seems Best Genist was pretty good with children. At the very least, he wasn't awkward around a grumpy Toya. Edshot seemed a little more put off by Toya's attitude. But Enji couldn't blame him. It was difficult even for him as the father. Best genus, Edshot, can you come with me for a moment? He asked, leading them away as the flaming sidekicks returned to fawning over Toya in the usual ways he was used to. Toya's mood considerably lightened when the two new heroes left, talking animatedly with the sidekicks he'd known all his life. Endeavour, those injuries, Edshot started, looking concerned. Endeavour sighed. Toya's quirk is hell flame, like mine. However, he inherited his mother's tolerance to extreme cold instead of my fire resistance. He's had a hard time coming around the fact that he can't use his quirk, and thus can't become a hero in the way he wants, he explained, crossing his arms. This is why I called yesterday. I know this is a strange and personal ask, but could you look after Toya for the day? He's too used to me and the psychics. I think being around younger pros like you could do him some good. Tsunagu and Kamihara looked at each other, a little surprised by the ask. They felt bad for Toya. Having a father like Endeavour and not even having the option to follow in his footsteps, that was a heartbreak they could sympathise with, but never understand. For such a young child as well. Of course, Endeavour. May I ask permission to need to up your son's hair? Best Genus asked whipping out a comb from some hidden pocket. Endeavour blinked flatly and looked at Toya. His hair was admittedly a scruffy mess. It was a fight between brushing his hair and cleaning the wounds this morning, so Engie had picked his battles. Permission granted, Endeavour nodded. Toya, you'll be with Best Genus and Edshot today. Listen to them, alright? Wait, what? But I want to be with you, Toya whined, crossing his arms and pouting. I know, but I have some serious villain calls to respond to today, and I don't want you in harm's way. You heard Kuramada. No more injuries. Enji could see that his son was most displeased at this. You can come on patrol with us this afternoon before we head home, alright? That seemed to brighten Toya's mood a little. With that, Endeavour left of some sidekicks to go meet up with the police, led by a rather young detective named Naomasa Tsukauchi that all might seem to have grown fond of. Edshot and Best Genus decided to train with the other sidekicks. 
Even if it was an endeavor, the man had partially trained all of his psychics when they joined his agency, so they could give their young pros some tips. We already knew how best Gina's quirk worked, but hadn't seen Ed Shots fold the body yet. Wow, freaky! Toy exclaimed as Ed Shots showed how his quirk worked. For a moment, Ed Shots' pride took a jab, but like, freaky cool! Looking at the child, the young hero saw intrigue and excitement in the boy's eyes. That means you can fight into tight spaces and stuff, right? Right, Ed Shot nodded. Despite the lower part of his face being covered, his eyes were smiling. I can flatten like paper or thin myself out into a string. I can also do this easily. He showed his arm flattening and twisting into a drill-like shape before launching it at a mannequin, piercing its chest. Like a whip, he recalled his hand and it returned to its normal shape. Toy was all sparkles and excitement, which made the heroes around him laugh fondly. Toy quickly grew to like Edshot, not only because he found his quirk freaky cool, but also because of his ninja motif. Best genus, well, his quirk was also super cool, but he quickly got on Toy's nerves. Stop! The child whined as he kicked his legs, sitting or fidgeting as Best Genus tried to comb through the, his hair and neaten it a little. Your father gave me permission. You're a mess, like a pair of badly taken care of frayed jeans, Best Genus argued, continuing to smoothen out the boy's thick white hair. There were no remnants of the red that once covered his whole head. You're weird, Tor replied to the jeans allegory. At a particularly big knot that Best Genus accidentally pulled, he let out a high-pitched whine. Ow! Watch it, Jettleneck! Edshot completely lost his composure and had to hold back snorts of laughter as his friend just stood there in disbelief. Children can be so cruel. Best genus came out on top at the end, however, and Toya grumbled as he drank from his juice box, now of a neatened hairstyle. Which was the same as his hair always was, just brushed and on his eyes constantly, all nicely tucked beneath the hair bangs framing his face. The three of them were having a break as they watched the sidekicks train. It must be nice to have a quirk that works. The bitter grumble caught the men's attention. They looked to each other, then back to Toya. I can't use mine. He flexed his hand to show the bandages. You're resistant to extreme colds, that's something. Ed shot offered. Clearly not helpfully, as he got an eye roll from the child. If you want to be a hero, wouldn't being any sort of useful hero be enough? Edshot, like Best Genist, like all heroes worth their role, wanted to help their country become a safe place where people didn't have to worry about walking the streets. Thanks to the likes of All Might and Endeavor, who had been in the business longer than the teens had been alive, the crime rate had more than halved over the last couple of decades. I want to be a hero like my dad! I have the same quirk and everything! Toy complained with the stubbornness only a boy his age could muster. What's the point if I can't do that? He had all the parts laid out for him, like a perfect puzzle, except one big puzzle piece was missing. Fire resistance. Helping people, filling in a need. You'd be surprised at how many mountaineering accidents happen every year. You look strong for a kid your age, and with your cold resistance and stubbornness, you could be a real help up in the north. Ed Shot tried again, showing his abilities to think up suitable strategies. If Toya wanted to be a pro hero, then there were ways he could, it just wouldn't be the same as his dad. Which is the problem. That's lame, Toya spat, brows furrowing. He had fire, he wanted to use fire, not some subpar second nature of his quirk that was dreadfully boring. Not to mention his weakness. A hero isn't about being cool or lame, this genus corrected, running fingers through his hair. Toya gave him the most unconvinced look to ever be witnessed by mankind. Yes, appearances are important, of course, but that's not what I'm referring to. What I mean is that if a duty is useful and brings reassurance to others, then there's nothing lame about that. St. Bernard dogs sniff out people buried in the snow, and we love them for it. Toya's scowl smoothened a little, taken aback. Children his age always looked at pro heroes with starstruck gazes at the grandeur of it all. Yet, here, these two brand new heroes were telling him something completely different. Then, why... why everything? Toy moved his hands around, a little of his juice spilling from the straw. Why the popularity polls? Why the merch? The adverts? The sensualization of it all? Why? Why have all these things if that's not what being a hero is about? 
Why have all these things that make kids go crazy over All Might? Money makes the world go round, unfortunately, Edshot said with a shrug and smile. He'd pushed the face mask aspect of his costume below his chin to drink water. That, and also public perception. It makes heroes more accessible and approachable if they feel like they have a relationship with them. Though, not all heroes are like that. Some just stick their heads down and work. Like your dad. I don't think I've ever seen an interview of him from the last 10 years. Part of our education in UA is to decide what type of hero we want to be. Best Genus nodded in agreement with his friend. Toya stared, then said nothing, returning to his juice box. A deep scowl in his eyebrows. What type of hero he wanted to be. He wanted to be a hero just like Endeavor. Thank you for looking after Toya, despite it being a work day for you both, the number two said when he returned from his business with the police, accompanied by Detective Tsukauchi. The two young heroes were standing in front of the agency as Toya ran to his father. We took the liberty of letting your social media team take photos of us training over psychics, Ed shot teased slightly. Even if they weren't side by side with the number two hero, being seen with his psychics alone would do marvels for their reputation among other heroes and civilians. Endeavor scoffed at the audacity, but there was a ghost of a smile on his face. Looks like Best Genus managed to fix your hair, he commented to his son. He's weird, Toya said flatly about the blonde hero, said weird man sighing exasperatedly. Edshot tried to keep his mysterious composure and not laugh at his friend. Toya looked at Tsukauchi. Hello, you must be Toya. I'm Detective Tsukauchi. I'll be collaborating with your father from here on out. The young, black-haired man smiled. He'd gotten friendly with All Might in the last couple of years of working with the police, and since the nation knew that Endeavor and All Might were tight allies, it made sense for him to be on good terms with Endeavor too. Toya scowled. Why do pro heroes need help from the police? He asked. Why was there so many layers to being a pro? He thought it was just punching people and having ultimate moves. His father picked him up into his arms. The police is who deals with the villains after we catch them. They also give us a lot of information about criminals, who to look for, and they deal with the legal side of things. They do a lot of the heavy lifting that makes us pros, able to do our jobs legally and efficiently, the red-headed hero explained. Tsukauchi would have taken this as flattery from any other hero, but he knew Endeavor wasn't one for meaningless compliments like that. Having his line of work being recognized and credited like this, it put him on the spot a little, and he rubbed the back of his neck sheepishly. Like doctors and engineers? Toya asked, remembering the first time he'd visited the agency and saw just how much work really went on. And now these new heroes and the police, it was so much bigger than what he'd expected. Endeavor grunted in confirmation. You say that, but if it weren't for pro heroes, we wouldn't have the purpose or drive to do any of it. Tsukauchi added on, smiling to the two younger heroes and back to Endeavor. Heroes like your dad being able to stand up to villains much stronger than us is why we can keep our home safe. It's a lot of working together, Edshot agreed. The four adults could see the cogs turning in the child's head, until he clearly gave up and hid his face in his father's chest, overwhelmed. A lot of information. Too much for the little Anne. Ray was practically bouncing as she got to hold the infant Tenya Ida, the boy looking up at her with a severity no baby should be able to muster. He was barely a year old. Across from her, 15-year-old Tensei laughed at Shota's wide-eyed, unblinking expression as he held him. He's gorgeous, Ray chimed happily as the red-eyed baby yawned. You're Shoto too. His eyes are beautiful, for Ida's mother complimented as she leaned to look at the ten-month-old child that her eldest son was holding. Tensei, you've started hero school this year, correct? Ray asked the teen, who smiled up at her warmly. Sure have. It's a lot of work, but since I've been training with my parents for a couple years, I'm ahead of my classmates, Tetsu replied, handing back Shota to his mother in return for his baby brother, who he was clearly very fond of. You're going to have a cool, older hero brother tenure. At least, I hope he thinks I'm cool. He ended his sentence with a laugh. Ray joined in. I'm sure he'll think you're the coolest, she nodded. Shota certainly thinks his eldest brother is the coolest. No, Poya isn't interested in interacting with him. Her voice trailed off a little, remembering the many times Shota tried to reach out to Toya, or the amount of times Toya had been offered to hold his baby brother. Rejection. Each time. How is Toya? 
You told me about his meltdown a few months ago, the Ida mother said worriedly, having been kept up to date by her friend. As fellow mothers, she wanted to help in whatever little way she could. Since we started homeschooling him at Fiumi, he's been doing a lot better. We can keep an eye on him and his moods. We don't have to worry about bullies or stigmas. We've set a part of the house to look and feel like a classroom because Fiumi missed the environment. It's wonderful that Engie's father is a teacher. He's been really helping us with the process. That and my mother has helped me with some advice and connections, Ray explained. The transition between school and homeschooling had been relatively smooth. When Engie and Ray had broken the news to Toya that they had decided to homeschool him, Toya was over the moon at not having to go back. Fumi had been happy with being at homeschool too, but she was a little sad at not being in a school environment anymore. But seeing how she'd been ostracized by her former friend group after defending her brother, she knew this was best for her. Ray and Fumi had come to an agreement, mother and daughter, that anything Fumi needed aesthetic-wise, Ray would make it happen. Ray homeschooling might have been lonely and bleak, but she refused to do the same with her daughter. She was going to make it fun and lively. Unfortunately, he hasn't warmed up to Shoto yet, which is disheartening. Ray sighed, Shoto copying her sigh and forming little ice flecks in the air. Step by step, Ray. I'm sure he will in time. Toy has gone through a lot emotionally, and it's natural for siblings to compare each other. Yes, dear, it might even happen with you and Tenya. The heron said at Tensei's mock horror expression as he cuddled his baby brother, the latter gurgling in laughter. Relationships between siblings grow and evolve as they age. It's natural. Just keep an eye on them all. Speaking of, Natsu really does look like his father, doesn't he? The woman said with a laugh as she looked at Ray's phone again, where a photo of Natsu in his father's arms could be seen. According to Harrow, identical. Two peas in a pod. Apparently, Enji also hated grapes at Natsu's age. Ray went on to tell the Ida mother and son duo about various stories of her children, as mothers tend to love doing. Christmas was soon in the horizon, and that meant the winter team-up between the Endeavor Agency and Ida family. How that worked is that the Ida and their psychics stayed in the rooms at the Endeavor Agency, and all the heroes worked together to keep the busy Christmas time silent and holy. Villains did not have a good time that month, between the speedsters and flame hero, who worked well together thanks to their efficiency mindset. I must thank you for your advice before my first was born. It's helped create a balance in the home, Engie said to the Eda father, the bespeckled man smiling up at the fellow hero. Of course, we must do what we can for the future of not only our country but our children too, the man replied, hands in a chopping motion as he talked. This also meant preparing for a Christmas celebration at, at the end of the agency. This was completely out of Endeavor's comfort zone, since he had no prior experience of all of this. But thankfully, his staff knew what to do for him. He just helped out with the final decisions. The day before the celebration itself, All Might made it known, on short notice as per usual, that he'd stopped by for a quick visit. And he was bringing Sir Nighteye to finally meet Endeavor. And that's how Endeavor found himself face to face with the green-haired man. Honestly, if you told him Mirai Sasaki was just a regular salary man, Enji wouldn't even have questioned it. Taller than him by an inch, lean with sharp features and a serious face, nothing about him screamed a dedicated All Might fan. Enji hadn't formed an opinion of the man in his mind, but whatever image he might have had, it wasn't this. He sent a look to All Might, who just grinned brightly at him, at full All Might power and height. That wasn't helpful at all. Despite All Might's bravado, he was sweating bullets. He couldn't let Enji see that. His friend needed to face Sir Naitai on his own two fiery feet. Sir Naitai, good to finally make your acquaintance, Endeavor said in his usual demeanor, arms crossed and flames around his shoulder. Not his eyes, though. Sir Naitai stared directly at him without blinking, golden eyes piercing for Endeavor like a dart. A weaker man might have been intimidated, but Endeavor was just mildly lost at what to do next. Night Eye inhaled sharply before speaking. The pleasure is all mine, Endeavor, he said, pushing back his yellow rimmed glasses that match his eyebrows and the three stripes in his green hair. Enji wondered if those were natural or if he had dyed them. They stared at each other. All Might stood there like a lemon on steroids. This was painfully awkward. Sir Nighteye sighed a little before his stoic look turned into a straight-up glare. I'll be honest, Endeavor. I'm not a particular fan of yours. 
Ah, that didn't last long. Mirai all might stuttered a little meekly, but Endeavor shook his head at him, uncrossing his arms. If you're as much of a diehard All Might fan as I've been told, I'm not surprised, he said simply, completely unbothered by this fact. He wasn't in the business to be liked, he was here to do a job and do it well. Say what you want to say. I'm someone who greatly values humour, and in all your years as a pro hero working alongside All Might, not once have you made me laugh. Nothing about you is funny or energetic. The blondness of it all was honestly refreshing to Endeavour, even if he found the reasoning ridiculous. He could understand where this emphasis on humour came from, saw it in All Might and his charisma constantly of how it charmed the civilians. I didn't become a hero to be a show pony. You have All Might for that, Endeavour said just as bluntly, throwing an unnecessary jab at his all-time friend. This visibly irked said friend psychic. Not intentional on Endeavour's part to offend the serious fan, he just had never been the type to mince his words. There is worth to your values, but I don't align myself to them. I don't need your acknowledgement to do my job. Ah, boy. All Might sighed dejectedly. He had a feeling these two would clash. Despite their external demeanours of stoic and serious being similar, everything else about them was as different as could be. Sir Nighteye had made it no secret he didn't approve of Endeavour's general existence, but All Might had tried to convince him that Engie is a good guy and an efficient hero. He simply didn't have a single funny bone in his body and had no interest in developing a sense of humour. The psychic and number two heroes stared at each other for an extensive amount of time, Endeavour neutral with his on-brand scowl, and Nighteye looking like he was trying to dissect Endeavour with his eyes to find even a glimmer of humour. I have preparations to get back to. All my Sir Naitai, you're welcome to linger, Endeavour said as he passed by them to go speak to his and the Eda psychic. And linger Sir Naitai did. He couldn't understand why someone as grand as All Might would willingly befriend someone as unfunny and uncharismatic as Endeavour. Sure, the young man could admit that there was plenty heroic about Endeavour, with all his solved cases, hard work and efficiency, but that was like describing the head of a police force, not a pro-hero who are meant to be approachable and spike joy in the civilians' hearts. Endeavour does not spike joy. Mild stress and anxiety at best. Sir Naitai was aware that Endeavour's hardcore fans, his mortal enemies and polar opposites, appreciated the number two's no-nonsense attitude, but it was simply not something Naitai could come to terms with. It didn't fit in his ideal for what a hero should be. Mirai, relax! All Might patted the skinny man firmly on the back. He was helping with putting up decorations and was covered in head-to-toe in tinsel as he bounded around the room to set it up. It's hard to relax when in the same room as Endeavour, the skinny man argued. His idol looked around the room with his bombastic grin. I am pretty relaxed. And his sidekicks too. Even the Eda family are relaxed. All Might proclaimed loudly, getting a stink eye from Endeavour across the room. Please, give him a chance, he said in a hushed tone and much softer smile. Mirai sent him a most unconvinced side-eye, but his shoulders lowered a little in defeat. He couldn't say no to All Might. Despite that, the rest of the day was much of the same. Naitai being generally unimpressed by Endeavour's... well, just Endeavour. The man never smiled, nor laughed, not even chuckled. Mirai didn't pick up on a single friendly banter or inside joke. Even if the man had a funny bone, it was as dry as a fossil and probably covered in dust. As psychics started to trickle out and head home for the night, it left mainly Endeavour, All Might and Sir Naitai lingering around and doing final touches before the big event tomorrow. Sir Naitai was just about ready to throw in the towel and tell All Might that he was out of giving chances to the number two, when he caught the sound of a phone buzzing. But most importantly, the silent exhale of a laugh. Looking up, he saw Endeavour looking at something on his phone. He was smiling. A hardness in the man's face had smoothened out. Sharp turquoise eyes softened as an endeared smile appeared on his face. What could be so funny that it would make Endeavour laugh? As minute of a reaction as it was. Endeavour must have felt the man's intense stare, because he turned to look at the sidekick with a questioning expression. The two men stared again, until Endeavour lifted his phone. My wife sent a photo of our children, he explained plainly offering Sir Naitai to come look at the photo. Having heard All Might speak of the four Todoroki children before, Naitai couldn't deny that he was a little curious. 
Daring to near the number two hero, his yellow eyes narrowed onto the phone screen. It showed a living room, warmly lit, with four children and a man sitting around the low coffee table. The younger, Shoto, was being held in his grandfather's arms, blissed out of a frozen snot bubble. Natsu was smiling widely at the camera, showing off a gingerbread man he was eager to munch on. Meanwhile, Toy was caught mid-act drowning his gingerbread man upside down in a glass of milk, while his sister looked at him in a mixture of unimpressed horror. Harris sat among the chaos of emotions, smiling tiredly at the camera. Nothing ha-ha funny, but endearing. Night Eye would give him that. At the interaction between the two elder siblings, and especially at Fuyumi's face, the glassed man couldn't help but let out an excel of a laugh before he caught himself. He made eye contact with Endeavor. He had a raised eyebrow. Technically, Fuyumi is the one who made you laugh, so that doesn't count. The blondness of the words made Night Eye scoff out a laugh. That one counts. And now Night Eye was rubbing a hand over his face, shoulders shaking as he laughed silently at the genuineness in the man's words. There truly was nothing funny about Endeavor, but his unfiltered responses made for unintentional comedy. He sighed, exasperated as he gave the other man a smile. You are a very strange man, Endeavor, he commented, much to the cluelessness of the older hero. In the distance, All Might breathed a sigh of relief. While the hero psychic duo wouldn't make it for the celebrations the next day, that was probably for the best. Endeavor and All Might had a silent understanding that Endeavor fan Toya and All Might fan Night Eye should not be in proximity of each other without careful supervision. The Christmas celebration was a lot of fun. The Eden and Todoroki especially celebrating their sons. Tensei got to meet Toya, Fumi, and Natsuo, all of whom took an instant liking to the cool Tubi hero. There was food, lights, music, and presents for the kids. And while Endeavor mostly stuck to being a host and organizing things behind the scenes, Ray decided to be cheesy and pull him under the mistletoe the psychics had jokingly put up. Enji hadn't been able to hold back his laughter at Ray's evil cackling as her plan unfolded to have at least one saccharine sweet moment this holiday season. Shoto easily fell asleep once it got late, as if the happy sounds of laughter and music was the calmest lulling lullaby an infant could wish for. Chapter 24. Calefaction. Hara watches Natsuo helped Ray plant some seeds. The toddler grinned as he patted the earth enthusiastically, and laughed as his mother sprayed the dirt off of his hands, watering the flower seed that would be blooming in the next few weeks. The same weight caught in his throat. His eyes stung. Natsuo looked so much like Enji at that age. It was unreal. Every time he saw Natsuo and Ray together, a bitter sweetness ate at his heart. He rubbed his eyes, trying to hold back the start of a sob from his throat as he breathed deeply through his nose. Dad, we're ready to... Dad? Enji stopped as he saw his father's shoulders shake slightly. He was wearing his brown leather jacket, ready to go to the store with Toya, Fumi, and Shoto, the latter currently being looked after by his sister after much insistence from the girl to be left in charge. Harrow jumped and hurriedly wiped his eyes best he could, smiling at his grown son. Great, I'm ready to go too, he said, walking towards his son to go to the front door. Enji is emotionally dense. But that didn't mean he couldn't hear the thick emotion in his father's voice. He raised an arm and blocked his father's path, making the older man stop. Hara wasn't looking at him. What's wrong? Enji asked. Hara inhaled. Nothing. Really, it's nothing, he dismissed, shaking his head as he tried to power through the feelings. It was Saturday, a day off for Enji, and he didn't want to ruin his son's day out with the children because he was feeling nostalgic. Don't go all toy on me, Enji said in a low voice, stepping in front of his father properly and looking at him. Tell me. Or if you don't want to tell me, I can call Toshinori, just... Just don't do what we Todoroki do, went unsaid. Haro sighed and relented, knowing where the tendency to not deal with emotions came from in this family. Him. Look, he said, lifting his head to the window he'd been looking out of. Enji saw Rei and Natsuo guarding together. When Rei mentioned she wanted to plant some new flowers, Natsuo had demanded in helping her. He looks just like you. People kept saying that, but Enji didn't see it. Natsuo's features are softer than his. Maybe just because he's little, but Enji saw a lot more of Rei and Natsuo than himself. 
especially around the eyes. When I see him laughing or happy with Ray, it reminds me of how little you ever even smiled as a child, and I can't help but feel it's my fault. But I didn't do enough to help your mother, and because of that, she left. That's hardly your fault. She left because she wanted to, Engie argued, a soft scowl on his face. Why was the man he thought the highest of always had such a low opinion of himself? But don't you think you could have been happy with your mother? Hara said, a little desperate, his blue eyes shimmering with tears. Maybe a little too desperate to be told he was a bad father, to confirm that all of his family's flaws and insecurities were his fault. Maybe then we'd be able to say when things are going bad, instead of just running away from it all the time. The only person who ran away is her, Angie said firmly, making Hara falter a little. His son's expression softened. You never ran away. Not when times were tough, not after the accident, not when I was being difficult in UA, or when I became number two, or when I was having worries about Ray. You've been here the whole time. I don't miss a person I've never met, but I'd always miss you if you weren't here. Harrow stared and lowered his gaze, rubbing the back of his neck, embarrassed. And this is why Todoroki don't share feelings often, especially Harrow and Enji. They quickly get embarrassed. But it's a good embarrassment. Mm, Harrow grunted with a small nod. Enji huffed out a laugh. That was a familiar reaction. Let's go, the kids are waiting. Despite his bombastic arrival and his hazardous quirk manifestation, Shoto turned out to be a rather shy baby who never used his quirk, unlike Natsuo, they were still working on that. Not quite easily frightened, but he was the type to hide his face in Ray's skirts whenever he was met with something new and unpredictable. He clung onto Fuyumi and Natsuo too like his life depended on it, and he'd cling onto Toya if the eldest let him, which he did not for the first year and a bit of Shoto's life. Due to the eldest two being homeschooled, Shoto got to see them a lot, and even if he never understood what was being taught, his favourite spot was being besides his mother as she taught Toya and Fuyumi the class of the day. Not so too, but he was far more interested in playing outside of Harrow whenever his mother was busy teaching. Fumi loved sharing all she was learning, reading to Natsuo every chance she got, and showing Choto how to write out his name. Toya didn't care. He did his work, got a good grade, and went on doing what he actually wanted to do, which was spend time with his dad. Whether at the agency or doing something together at home, that's when Toya was the happiest, on Enji's shoulders or being paid attention to by Enji. Shoto clearly desired his eldest brother's attention, but simply wasn't getting it. Until one fateful day, he cracked the code. Shoto had started teething at 12 months old, and it hurt. A lot. Having three kids before him, his parents knew how to handle this, but even with all their learned tips and tricks, Shoto seemed to have a particular bad case, as he often whined and complained about it in his little infant ways. This meant, more often than not, Shoto was attempting to soothe the aches. The event happened one morning, when Rei had left Toy and Fuyumi to do some writing exercises to make lunch for them all. Natsu and Shoto were in the room as well, since Haro was out teaching and Enji was endeavouring. Curious, Natsu waddled over to her sister and looked at what she was doing. Look, Natsu, I'm writing a letter, Fuyumi said proudly, showing off her clean handwriting and legible sentences. Natsu grinned at his sister's achievement, even if he didn't completely get it yet. Seeing the nice interaction, infant Shoto decided to try too and crawl to his eldest brother. Toya didn't even acknowledge his existence, just turned his back to Shoto and, did, and hid his work from him. Shoto, not wanting to back down, crawled around his brother. Again, as the infant came into view, Toya turned his back to him, grumbling under his breath. The smallest of frowns settled on Shoto's face, and with a determined pout, crawled back to his original spot. Third time's a charm. Go away, Shoto, Toya snapped, glaring at the small child. Shoto stared at him in surprise. Shoto recognised his own name. His other family members said it often, but Toya never did. With newly found vigour, Shoto struggled to his knees using the table to prop himself up, trying to look at Toya's work. This meant he had to push further into Toya's personal space, something the blue-eyed boy did not appreciate. I said go away, he snapped louder, as he pushed Shoto's face away from his work with his hand like he was a demanding dog. That's when it happened. 
A shrill cry made Ray drop everything in the kitchen as she ran back to her children's workroom. What's happened? She exclaimed. Shoto's buying Toya! Fumi explained frantically, trying to pry her youngest brother off of Toya. The latter screaming bloody murder as his hand was trapped between Shoto's three teeth. Natsu just sat there, laughing as he watched the scene. Get him off! Toya screeched. It took five whole minutes to get Shoto to unhinge his surprisingly powerful jaw, and another five minutes to console a fuming Toya. He did it on purpose! Toya accused, pointing his uninjured finger to the one-year-old who had his usual blank and neutral expression on. Fumi is holding him like one might hold back a chihuahua from running off. He's only a baby, Fumi argued, holding her baby brother close. A demon baby! Shoto is teething. It probably just hurt and he was trying to soothe the aches. Ray tried to reason as she disinfected Toya's bite mark on his hand and bandaged it. At least it wasn't a burn mark for once. Not that Toya got those anymore. He hadn't used his fire ever since his last outburst with Enji. When Enji got home that night, it was to incoherent yells of protest and an exhausted looking Ray waiting for him. Harry was busy dealing with whatever was happening. Show to a bit, Toya, she sighed. Three for four. Enji sighed in return as he undid his shoes. Unless you count Natsu pelting grapes at us as an act of violence, then that's the full menagerie. Ray was not amused. Keep him away from me! Toya screamed as he literally climbed his father's leg to escape the threatening force that was Shoto. Demon child! This is why four is an unlucky number! That's just a superstition, Enji reassured, peeling his eldest son from his leg to properly hold him. Looking down, he saw a determined Shoto attempting to follow his brother pulling at his father's trousers to try and stand. Calling your brother a demon isn't nice, Toya. Biting me isn't nice, Dad! His white-haired son snarked back, clinging onto his neck like it was a lifeline. Fair, Enji sighed, before crouching down to pick up Shoto too. He didn't get to hold his youngest much, since he was so clingy of his mother, but in this moment, Shoto was so set on terrorizing Toya that he didn't care who was holding him. Toya let out a scream and tried to scramble up his father's shoulder. Toya, calm down. I'm not letting him get to you. Haro was sitting on the floor, looking like he'd just been dragged through a bush. Fumi looked unimpressed on his lap, while Natsuo was giggling up a storm. The living room was chaos from Toya's rampage to get away from his baby brother, the youngest unafraid to follow the eldest as long as it meant he was getting a reaction. Shota made a small huff through his nose, his mismatching eyes staring right at Toya. Shoto? Enji's voice came out stern, catching the infant's attention. He looked up at him with wide eyes. Don't bite Toya. Shoto stared. Enji stared back. Shoto opened his mouth and bit Enji's hand. Instantly, he recoiled and made a noise of complaint. Toya was easy to bite. His hand was squishy, but his father was all muscle. It hurt a bit. That won't work on me. Enji snorted at his youngest reaction, putting Toya down on the ground. The eldest escaped his grandfather, scrambling behind him and using Natsu as a meat shield. Shota started complaining, wanting to be placed down as well, but Enji didn't budge. No, ten minutes. Then you can play again. Thus, air jail was invented. Shota often found himself in air jail, usually for terrorizing Toya. He'd wanted his brother's attention, and the best way to gain it, the small infant had learned, was to be a pest. Natsu found it funny. But Todoroki saw the Ida much more often too. Tensei not so much because he had hero school, but little Tanya was a common sight for Shoto. He clearly got excited whenever the red-eyed child was in his vicinity, waving excitedly with intense silence at him. Tanya seemed to share the sentiment, waving with matched intense silence. Yet when they were put next to each other by their mothers, the two babies would just stare at each other. They enjoyed each other's company, even if not much was said. Or could be said since they're babies. Shota had no need to bite for his attention. As Shota learned to walk and speak, Mama, Shota's attachment to his mother became much more evident. While his older siblings enjoyed having days out with just their father once a month, Toya always went to the agency, Fuyumi always wanted to try out something new, and Natsu was always adamant about going to the aquarium, Shota had no interest in being alone with his father. He'd only go out with him if Haro or Rei went too, and his siblings which absolutely destroyed Enji, but he didn't force it. 
Of course, whenever Toshinori was around and Shota was desperate to be held by him, Enji spiralled into a state of what Rei could only describe as depression. How was the aquarium, Frostbite? Hara asked his third grandchild as he returned home from his day out of Enji. The almost six-year-old grinned brightly at his grandfather, so differently to his siblings. Fun! No Gangorka. His face dropped for a moment, but then excitedly rummaged in his little rucksack to show off what his father got him. It was a killer well stuffed toy. Just the right size to hug. Look! Oh wow, very nice! Hara laughed, looking up to his son who smiled at him. Natsu really likes killer whales. He shrugged with a laugh. The first time he went to the aquarium, he and Ray met Gangorka. It's probably why he wants to go back each time. You'd have to contact Gangorka if he wants to team up, give Natsu a chance to meet him again. As the two men spoke, Natsu ran down the corridor to the living room, looking for his mother and siblings. Shoto! Look what Papa got me! Natsu exclaimed happily as he found toddler Shoto sitting beside his mother on the couch, Ray folding laundry. Fumi and Toya were playing outside together, looking at the koi fish. It's an orca! Ray smiled at her child's excitement, and looked at Shoto, who just blinked and nodded. Don't you want to have a day out with just you and dad too, Shoto? Ray said sweetly, brushing her youngest hair out of his face lightly. Shoto gave her a pout and shook his head. Natsu tilted his head in confusion, hugging his orca plush close to his chest. Why not? Papa days are fun. That's what Natsu called them. Papa days. No. Shoto crossed his arms and shook his head again. Ray sighed. Hopefully when he learnt more words, Shoto would be able to express why he did want to have a day out with his father like the others. At this moment, Enji entered the living room, Haro off to check on Toy and Fuyumi. Upon seeing his father, Shoto immediately threw himself onto his mother, hiding his face in her stomach. Rei laid a hand on his two-tone hair and smiled at her husband, who had the same expression as a dog who'd just been kicked. The TV was on, and it showed all might. Enji picked up the remote and turned up the volume a little to hear what the news was saying. All Might has saved seven towns from villain attacks just today, as well as a family of three when their car went out of control. Ray looked at her husband's expression, expecting to find maybe frustration how easy it was for All Might to do all these things. But instead, she found a neutral glare at the screen, a slight frown of concern. He is working more than usual, he said absentmindedly. Looking back to Ray, he noticed that Shota had peeled his face away from his mother to watch the TV with wide-eyed admiration. Enji blinked, looking to her son, then to All Might on the screen, then back again. Shoto, do you like All Might? The child warily looked at his father, before looking away, a little embarrassed as he nodded. I like Gangorka! Natsu exclaimed brightly, holding his killer whale plush victoriously. It wasn't Gangorka, but close enough. Are we talking about our favourite heroes? Toya's voice rang out before fast approaching footsteps could be heard, Toya sliding into view and almost toppling over in the process. Mine's Endeavour! Only because it's Dad. Fumi laughed as she walked calmly alongside her grandfather, the family joining together in the living room. And for you? Natsu asked. Fumi thought about it and shrugged. Don't have one. Heroes didn't interest Fumi. Shoto seems to like All Might, Ray said. This made Toya roll his eyes with a groan. Everybody likes All Might, he said with an unimpressed expression, glaring at Shoto. The younger brother smiled. In the months after the biting accident, and all the ones that followed, Shoto had gotten plenty of Toya's attention. Even if it was just glares of annoyance and yelling. Shoto didn't care. It was better than nothing. Enji, Ray, you never had a favourite hero either, did you? Hera asked, looking to the parents. Ray shook her head. Heroes had never interested her either, until she met Enji. I respect a lot of them, but I didn't and don't have a favourite, Enji replied to his father, turning down the volume on the TV. I'll have to contact Sir Naitai later and ask him what was happening of All Might. He had a feeling the man was overworking himself, which was a little hypocritical coming from him, but Enji wasn't the one bouncing around Japan like a ping pong ball. Shoto, do you not like Dad? Fumi asked as she sat beside the koi pond, looking at the fish. It was mid-autumn now, and their dad would have to start preparing the pond so it survived winter. Almost two-year-old Shoto looked at his sister at the question, then back to the fish. No, Shoto said, which made Fumi look up with a sad face, before she realised Shoto was touching his own face. Both of his hands were against his cheeks, and he was tapping them. No. 
You think his face is scary? Fumi asked with raised eyebrows. Shota smiled. Yes! He was relieved she understood what he was trying to say. Using his index fingers, he made pretend angry eyebrows and pouted, replicating his father's scowl. Bad. But Papa smiles all the time, Fumi replied, confused, then had a moment of realisation. Oh, you don't spend a lot of time with him. Shoto lowered his hands and looked at her, confused. When Papa and I go out, he's always happy. He smiles just like Natsuo, she tried to explain to her toddler brother. Shota tilted his head. He liked Natsuo's face, and the way he smiled. In his mind, Natsuo looked nothing like his scowling father. Shota liked his mother's softness, which both Yumi and Toya had inherited. Even through the annoyance and angry pouts, Shota could see his mother in Toya. His eyes may be like his father's, but they weren't sharp like the man's. It's why he liked All Might. He smiled all the time. Hmm... Shoto hummed, before looking back at the koi. He saw a white one with red flecks and pointed at it. Fuyumi. I'm not a fish! If Enji showed more emotion, he'd be crying right now. Shoto was standing in front of him, hands behind his back, looking to the ground. He was turning two today. Enji crouched down in front of his son. Say that again? He wanted to be sure he had heard Shoto correctly. Shota puffed his cheeks a bit, shy. Go shop with you, Shota said meekly, eyes not meeting his father's. Ray was standing a little off from them, watching her husband trying to restrain overreacting to his youngest request. This was the first time Shota had asked to do anything with just his dad, and Enji was not about to miss the chance. Where do you want to go? Enji asked with restrained excitement. Ray placed a hand over her mouth, trying to not start giggling at her husband. Shota looked up at his father, patting a little and shrugged in reply. He hadn't thought that far. What about where Fuyumi likes to go? Shota's eyes sparkled at that. Fuyumi liked spending time with their father. Maybe if he did the same things she did, Shota would see a side of his father he hadn't yet. He nodded at that, hopping a little on his heels. That's how, on Shoto's second birthday, he found himself on his father's shoulders as the man walked down a main street, with rows and rows of shops that sold everything he could desire. Shoto didn't leave the house much if it wasn't to go to the park or where his family did the grocery shopping, so this was all new to him. And being so high up, there was plenty to see. For a while, he didn't say much, just looked at his surroundings, and every once in a while glancing to his father, who had the same harsh expression he knew. He didn't like it, but he tried to remember what Fuyumi said. Shoto didn't spend much time with his father, mostly with his mother. A brightly coloured building caught his eye and he let out a small gasp at the enormous toy shop. It was a pro-hero themed shop that sold official licensed toys. Without needing prompting, Enji was already walking inside, lifting Shoto off of his shoulders. The little child looked at him meekly as his father crouched beside him. Go choose something. There was a tenderness there that Shota hadn't heard before, and blinking, he looked at the huge shop, wall to wall with all the figurines, posters, t-shirts, stuffed toys and collector's items of every pro hero imaginable. Go on. He gently encouraged his son forward with a little push to the back. For a moment, Shota was dazzled as he walked forwards, not sure where to go from here. Then a very familiar blue, red and white with blonde hair grabbed his attention and Shota made a direct beeline for the All Might section, which was by far the largest corner of the shop. Enji knew that Shota would go for that, it's why he brought him here. Momentarily, he glanced at the Endeavor section, the only section that rivaled All Might's. He saw Toya's plush design on discount, since it was based on Endeavor's old suit, and everybody wanted the version of his current suit, with the design around his chest. That one was at full price. Enji didn't care about merchandise, but it, it's what came with being number two on the popularity polls. Can... Shota's little voice brought Enji's attention back, walking to where his son was standing. The child pointed to an All Might plush. It was the same size as Toya's Endeavor plush and was designed after All Might's current look, the one Shota saw the most on TV. Can I have this? Despite Enji having told him he could have whatever one he wanted, the child still felt compelled to ask. Of course. Anything else? Enji asked, lifting the toy from the shelf and giving it to Shoto. 
the little one couldn't quite reach it. A happy blush appeared on his son's cheeks, and he shook his head, delighted at the all might toy that was almost his size. Let's go pay. Since it was in the middle of a school week, there weren't many people around. Only the cashier, who made a small gasp of surprise at seeing Endeavour, before her eyes settled on the red and white-haired child in his arms that was holding an all-might toy. How much for this? Angie asked fatly, digging through his pockets for his card. The cashier flustered as she told him the price and fussed with getting him a receipt. Sheepishly, she fiddled with her fingers. Um, she started shyly, looking up at the man towering above her. Angie's sharp eyes met hers. Is, is that your son? She asked, intimidating but smiling. Angie grunted at her question, looking away again to put his wallet back in his pocket. The cashier knew Endeavour to be like this, so that didn't bother her. Instead, she looked to Shoto. Do you like All Might? She asked the toddler, who looked at her with big, sparkling eyes. Mm-hmm, he responded with an enthusiastic nod. A lot! Must be funny having an All Might fan for a son. The cashier smiled at the little boy as she addressed Engie, who blinked at her comment, not understanding what was funny about that. Uh, I mean, since he's your son, I thought, you know, that you'd be his favourite. The cashier flustered at the man's hard stare. Endeavour is my eldest favourite, Engie replied, Shota nodding at his father's words. Toy was the biggest Endeavour fan to be. He has an Endeavour version of this one. He poked at the All Might toy and Shota smiled a little, squishing it tightly against his chest. They left after that, leaving a very embarrassed cashier behind. She was going to be staying up at three in the morning cringing over that memory for years to come. Angie took Shota to a restaurant by the park for lunch, and Shota tried cold soba noodles for the first time. He absolutely adored them, as Angie thought he might. Your mum likes cold soba noodles too. He commented softly as he ate his own meal, some spicy noodle dish. Shota looked up to him as he slurped on his noodles, the softness in his voice having taken him by surprise. Toshinori was going to join the family for dinner to celebrate Shota's birthday, so they didn't stay out too late. On the way back to the car where Kuramada was waiting for them, Enji and Shoto noticed a trio of students that were laughing loudly. Well, two of them were laughing loudly, one was looking like he was about to drop dead any second. Engie recognised their uniforms. New A students, he muttered, then felt Shota leaning forward to look at him, curious as to what that meant. It's the hero school I went to. All Might too. Shota's eyes widened and he looked forward to the three students again. Do you want to go speak to them? Shota nodded eagerly. While Shota might be shy talking to new people, Engie was not, especially not with UA students. He was an alumni after all even if he did hate that stupid motto. You three, you A students, he said, the gruffness of his voice catching the three's attention. Whoa, Endeavour! A light blue-haired one exclaimed loudly, grinning widely in awe at the towering hero. What year are you in? Engie asked, lowering Shota from his shoulders as he placed a toddler in front of the three students. Engie was holding his All Might plush, so Shota didn't accidentally drop it. First year's Endeavour, sir, yeah! The loud student wore tinted glasses, and he was pointing at Enji with both hands in a dramatic pose. Their black-haired friend sighed at the two's obnoxious reactions, running a hand over his face. We're in our third semester! And who are you? The first student chirped brightly to Shoto, crouching in front of the toddler with a wide grin. Shoto was a little taken aback, but he liked the teen's smile. It reminded him of All Might. Shoto, I'm two, he replied with a little polite bow like his mum had taught him. I'm Oboroshi Rukumo. I'm 16, Oboro smiled, bowing his head back in politeness. Then my hero name is Loud Cloud. I'm Hizashi Yamada, and this is Shota Izawa. Your name sounds similar, the loud blonde said enthusiastically as he made fast jabbing motions at his dark-haired friend who he was dragging into the conversation. You're loud, Aizawa grumbled, before looking at Enji through the mess of his black hair. These two are obnoxious, excuse the disturbance he said for his friends, knowing what they could be like. You're so mean, Shota, he's actually whined, never once dropping his smile. It's all right, Enji raised a hand, before looking down to Shoto. My son was curious since you're UA students. He's a fan of All Might. Who isn't? He's actually laughed loudly, a bit unnaturally so. Enji deduced his quirk must be connected to his voice. 
from the name Loud Cloud, he also assumed Oberus Quirk had something cloud related. But Aizawa's. he couldn't guess. You want to be a hero, Shoto? Like your dad? Oberu asked with a grin. Shoto blinked at the question, then looked up to his father. Angie already knew the answer. No. Shoto didn't know if he wanted to be a hero yet, but certainly not one like Endeavor. His face was scary, and he never smiled. All Might. Knowing that Shoto admired All Might above Endeavor didn't bother Enji. All he wanted was for Shoto to be willing to spend time with him as father and son. If he had that, he was happy. All Might's impressive, right? The blue-haired teen didn't even flinch at Shoto's blunt dismissing of his father and made a punching motion in the air. Having strength like that must be amazing. We're not nearly as strong. But I like my quirk. Wanna see? Uburo, you can't use your quirk in public. You don't have a license yet. Aizawa scolded his friend who was about to break the law in front of the number two hero. Shirokumo grinned at him sheepishly, realizing the position he put himself in. I'd like to see it, Enji said, crossing his arms. If you're going to be future heroes, pros like me need to know what you're capable of. A silent promise that if the three got into trouble for this, Endeavor would take the blame. At this, Oboro grinned and jumped up. As he did, Shoto's footing wobbled, and he made a small yelp before he landed on something firm and soft. He rose up, blinking confusedly as he suddenly felt taller. Looking down, he realized he was being lifted by a cloud. He let out a little happy gasp and patted the cloud curiously. Enji smiled at his son's muted excitement. My quirk's cloud! I can do lots of it! Fly around, blind enemies! Obro showed off, making Shoto circle him as the toddler let out little giggles. Practical, Enji nodded, before looking at Hisashi and Aizawa. What about you two? Mine's voice! Best I don't show it, I can burst eardrums! Hisashi replied as if voicing a PSA, hands on hips and shaking his head. Just from his demeanor alone, Enji had been able to guess that. And Aizawa's is erasure! He wrapped an arm around his friend's shoulder as he did, pointing at him with the other one. That's too much, Aizawa grumbled, but didn't try to escape his friend's hold. Erasure? Enji asked, curious. Aizawa eyed him carefully before nodding, narrowing his eyes to the ground. What can you do? Can you summon a flame, Endeavor? The black-haired teen asked, straightening a little as Yamada backed off. As soon as that was said, Enji already got an idea for what it could be, and did as he was asked, summoning a flame in his palm. And then it disappeared. And he couldn't summon another. Enji could feel his fire simmering in his body, but he simply couldn't manifest it. Looking from his palm to Aizawa, he saw the boy's eyes were glowing an odd red, his hair fully out of his face as it floated around him. Then he blinked and rubbed his eyes painfully, and Enji's flame returned. I can erase quirks, but if I blink or break eye contact, it stops working. Nice quirk, he praised. When you graduate, why don't you join my psychics? No thanks. Aizawa didn't even hesitate, much to the dismay of his two loud friends, who exclaimed loudly at the man rejecting the number two's job offer. Being your psychic will put me in the spotlight. I'm not into that. A small smile tugged at Enji's lips. He liked this kid. His phone buzzed, and looking at it, he saw a notification from Haro asking where he was. We better head home, Enji said to Shoto, the latter looking disappointed at having to be let down from the cloud. Obero caught the child in his arms with a laugh before handing him back to his father, grinning at Choto. Work hard in your studies. Yes, sir! Hisashi and Obero practically saluted of loud excitement, Aizawa giving only a small nod to the number two in response. He knew Obero and Hisashi's grades were god-awful. That evening, Shoto excitedly retold the events of the day to his family as he sat on Toshinori's thigh, hugging his new All Might toy tightly. Ray and Haro holding in laughter, wondering how Shoto would react to knowing his beloved Uncle Toshi was in fact All Might. Toshinori seemed to be having a grand time with Shoto talking animatedly in broken sentences about the UA students and the one of the cool cloud quirk and nice smile. Natsu loved his family. His mum, his dad, his grandfather, his uncle, Shoto and Fiumi. He especially loved Toya having a great attachment to his older brother, just like Shoto did. Even when the older boy kept him up in the middle of the night, since they liked to share a room. Natsu didn't hear half the things Toya told him, 
incoherent rabblings about bullies at his old school, something he saw on the internet criticizing Endeavor of the Hiruma family, something about Edshot telling him to be a mountain rescue hero and how that was stupid because what was the point of becoming a hero if he couldn't be exactly like Endeavor and how it was unfair that he couldn't use his quirk and why did Shoto like All Might so much when they had Endeavor at home and Shoto would never understand the frustration of not being able to use his quirk when he had both ice and fire and that's so you understand right because your frost could give you frostbite if you use it too much and Toya please sleep. Natsu yawned into his pillow. Why do you never tell me these things during the day? He grumbled. Because we're always around the others during the day, Toya said in a loud whisper. The adults don't understand us kids. Fumi doesn't get it because she's a girl, and Shota has it all. Only you understand me. Right, Natsuo? Natsuo! Huh? <laughs> what? Well, uh, sure. The six-year-old snorted as he was forced to wake again. I want to sleep. Natsu dozed off again and didn't see Toya's frustrated, tear-filled scowl. Endeavor, we have some terrible news about one of the UA students who told us to keep an eye out for. Loud Cloud. Endeavor looked at his sidekick with his furrowed brows. He died a few days ago, during a villain attack. Aburo Shirakumo died at 17, only a few months after meeting Shoto and Enji. It's because he's the fourth child, Toya said harshly as he did his homework. Four means death. Toya, Harrow scorned sharply, gaining an eye roll from the child. Shoto was on his mother's lap, looking confused and not fully understanding the concept of death after Ray taught him the news. He was only two. But he knew he was sad. He liked the cloud hero. He had a kind smile. The decision to visit Iwate a couple summers later was much easier to make than in previous years, and the entire family travelled up during the holidays to visit Ray's parents and have a week at the beach. Hara kept Ray's father well in check. He was not about to have him commenting on any of their grandchildren's quirks or futures. Thankfully, the older Himura man had long learned to drop the subject, and instead put himself in charge of keeping the snacks cold. Turns out, his favourite ice cream is vanilla, just like Fumi and Ray. Homeschooling is going great, Ray updated her mother as the two pale ladies took cover under a parasol from the strong rays of the sun. We're able to match the children's pace and help them really understand what we're teaching them. Well, all except for math. I don't teach that. Haro and Enji do. Math never was your strong suit, Ray's mother chuckled lightly as she helped lava Shoto in sunscreen, the boy behaving much like his older brother and sister, while the eldest of the Todoroki children was squirming in his father's hold. I don't want it, it smells gross, Toya whined, kicking the sand as Enji covered him from head to toe in lotion. I'm not arguing about this. Sunscreen or you don't get to play in the sun, Enji scorned, gaining a huff from his now 12-year-old son. Toya had gotten a bit of a growth spurt recently. That, and with the training he still did with his parents, his shoulders were a little squarer and he looked more like a size that fit his age. Something that really helped with the boy's self-esteem. As soon as the four children were lathered, they were set free to cause carnage upon the world. Natsu bolted for the water, while Fumi enjoyed strolling alongside it, looking at various rocks and seashells. Toya... dug a hole. He'd been very adamant about getting a shovel before they came to the beach, and Enji wasn't one to deny him a simple joy like that. So Toya was digging a hole. Toya, what are you doing? Shoto asked. His hair was wet from being in the ocean of Natsuo, and he peered into the questioningly deep hole Toya was digging. What does it look like, peppermint? Toya spat, glaring at the peppermint colour-coded child. Ever since Shota had become the local Toya biter, that's a nickname that Toya had given his baby brother. It was intended as an insult, but, well, nobody took it as one. Not even Shoto. But why? Shota asked, confused as to the purpose of digging a hole this deep at the beach. It was so deep Toy could barely struggle out of it. A mischievous grin spread across the twelve-year-old's face. Come down and see, Toya said, motioning Shoto down. The younger brother didn't even hesitate and slid down the side, dragging a little sand down with him. Now look here and don't move, Toya instructed as he struggled to climb out, leaving a confused but obedient Shoto behind. I don't get it, Shoto said. A large thwomp landed beside him. Looking at it, he realised it was a pile of sand that hadn't been there before. What's Toya doing? Ray asked. Digging a hole, Enji replied. 
No, he's fitting it back in now. After Shoto jumped in. The two parents looked at their white-haired son as he cackled like a cartoon villain under his breath, filling in the hole from where they were resting on the beach towels. The three grandparents were Fuyumi and Atsuo. He's burying Shoto, Enji sighed. Well, go stop him, Ray instructed. Neither moved. We have four. Enji. All right, all right, I'm going, Enji sighed, getting up from where he was enjoying a warm nap. As he walked beside Toya, the child didn't even stop his master plan. Don't bury Shoto alive. He doesn't mind, Toya shrugged as he shoveled in more sand. You don't mind, right, Shoto? There's sand in my eyes, Shoto replied flatly, now waist deep in sand his brother was showering on him. But I don't mind. See? Toya motioned to the child with a shovel. Toya, Enji said flatly. Oh, fine, Toya grumbled dropping his shovel and crossing his arms grumpily. God forbid I have fun. I'm having fun. Shut up, Shoto! Later that year, in autumn, Shoto was swinging his legs happily besides Ray, waiting for Tenya and his mum to arrive on a park bench. Shoto! Five-year-old Tenya exclaimed from a distance, grinning brightly at his friend. Shoto grinned and jumped out from his seat, running the two children hugged tightly, excited to see each other. It had been a few months since the last time they got to play together. Their mothers greeted each other much the same way, with many laughs at their son's closeness. Tenya, look, look! Shoto jumped back, showing off his hoodie. An All Might hoodie! Tenya matched Shoto's excitement. While All Might wasn't his favourite hero, that title belonged to Ingenium, his brother, he still admired the number one hero and knew he was Shoto's favourite. Mom, can we go on the swing set? Go for it, his mother nodded as she sat on the bench besides Ray, the two women having plenty to catch up on. Your brother is a pro hero, how's that? Shota asked Tenya curiously, as the two children used the swings. Not too high that they couldn't hear each other, but high enough to be fun. It's fantastic, the five-year-old exclaimed, grinning at Shota from behind his new glasses. I want to be just like him when I grow up. Shota stopped swinging, his feet scratching against the ground and looked at Tenya with lifted eyebrows. You're going to be a hero? He asked curiously. Absolutely. Tenya stopped swinging too and smiled at his friend. My whole family are heroes. I want to do my part too. Your father's endeavor, doesn't that make you want to also be a hero? Shoto blinked at that, not seeing the connection. Endeavors... He hesitated and looked forward at the blue-gray sky. A good hero. But don't you think he's scary? Scary? Tenya said, skidding his feet on the ground to stop the swing as well. He's serious, but I don't think he's scary. Are... are you scared of your dad? No, I'm not scared of dad. Shoto shook his head, smiling. Since his second birthday, he had learned that his father had a tenderness to him. It just wasn't blatantly obvious like his mother. Like Fumiya had said, his father did smile, just like Natsu did, but not nearly as common. Shoto went out monthly with his father to that merch store, each time returning with a new All Might item. This month had been the All Might hoodie. But Endeavor never smiles. A hero that always looks angry, I don't want to be like that. A hero who bites everyone isn't great either, Tenya replied after a moment. Shoto snorted. I only bite Toya, Shoto grinned, a mischievous glint in his eyes. Lies! Tenya exclaimed, jumping up abruptly and swinging his hands up and down in a chopping motion. Your mother has said you've bitten her, your father, your grandfather, Natsu, and even Fuyumi one time. And you bit me last year. That all happened when I was a baby, Shota argued, starting to swing again. He too had been told of his teething stories, and I only bit you through your coat. That doesn't count. It still hurt, Tenya exclaimed, hands up as he frowned at Shoto. You should have shared your crap with me, Shoto giggled like the youngest sibling of four he was. Tenya sighed, but smiled nonetheless. They continued playing, going down the slide, climbing various structures, using the spinners and riding the spring animals. Tenya and Shoto always managed to have fun. Shoto didn't know anybody else's exact age, and Tenya didn't have siblings close in age like Shoto did. They felt like they could do and talk about anything together, since they had been friends for so long. If we went to school together, we'd be in the same class, Tenya said as he jumped on the little trampoline-like flooring. Shoto watching him go up and down. Mum and Dad are going to homeschool me like my brothers and sister, Shoto replied. I know. Tenya hopped onto the solid ground after one high jump. 
It's nice to have so many siblings, even if you do bully Toya. Shota snorted at that, knowing that Toya bullied him back just as much. But he never felt hurt. He found it fun. Even though he knew Toya's anger was more genuine than his own desire to tease. It was a feeling he had, but his four-year-old mind couldn't quite wrap around the complexity of Toya's situation. He hadn't really been told anything about it, he just knew that Toya couldn't use his quirk because it hurt him, and Toya was mad at Shoto for being able to use his. Shoto didn't quite understand, but he hoped that as he grew up, he could become closer to his eldest brother and have a good relationship with him, just like he did with Fuyumi and Natsuo, whom he loved so much. As Ryan and Shoto drove back home, Kuramada at the wheel, Shoto looked outside of the window. Mom, Mr. Kuramada... What do you think of Endeavor? The little child asked, never once looking away from the outside view. The question caught both adults by surprise. He works too hard, Kuramada said bluntly. Murray laughed at the man's response, even though she agreed. Endeavor is hardworking and takes his job very seriously, Ray nodded. He's not like other heroes. He doesn't work to please people, only to keep them safe. Something she knew NG always worried about constantly, especially with Toya who was so injury prone. Shota looked at his mother. Is that why he never smiles? He asked. That made Ray snort. That's just because your father isn't much of a smiler. She shook her head. According to your grandfather, he didn't smile much as a child. But you know, Peppermint, sometimes how a person looks isn't how they feel. Just because someone is smiling doesn't always mean they're happy. But why would someone smile if they're not happy? Shoto frowned, not understanding. Hmm, for the sake of others. Sometimes, when people feel sad or hurt, they smile anyway so that others don't worry about them. Because they don't want their pain to hurt them too. Ray explained, running her fingers through the red of his hair fondly. Your father is just terrible at showing emotion. Especially when working. He's very focused. Shoto leaned into his mother's touch, considering what she was saying. There is more to a person than what their expression shows. Toya, let's play! Fuyumi exclaimed, smacking the ball she was holding. Natsu grinning at Toya behind her as Shoto jumped up and down, too short to see over his older siblings. Okay, 13-year-old Toya said as he logged off his computer. He'd been looking at some videos of Endeavor and what he was doing recently fascinated by all his moves and abilities. Natsuo, can you teach me how to do that knee trick? Shota asked, trotting alongside his tallest sibling. Natsuo grinned at him. Sure. It's not hard once you get a feel for it, he replied as he ruffled his little brother's hair. Grandpa, we're playing ball outside, Fuyumi called out to Haro, who was busy scheduling his next lesson. Hearing this, he decided working outside while watching his grandchildren play was probably more tolerable than staying stuck inside. All right, I'll come keep an eye on you lot. Don't want a repeat of last week, he laughed. Shoto and Natsu had fallen into the koi pond, much to raise the stress at her beloved fish. Angie had made them help clean up their mess and wash their own clothes with the mess up. It was an accident, Natsu groaned with a smile. We're in play as close to the pond. Despite that, it did not mean no accidents happened. Ow! Toya exclaimed as Shoto's kick made the ball smack him square in the forehead, making him topple to the ground. Natsu burst into laughter, pointing at his older brother writhing on the ground. Shoto! He yelled, sitting up with an angry look. It was an accident! Shoto exclaimed, hands up defensively with an innocent face. Oh yeah, like how biting and stealing my pudding is an accident! Toya accused, raising a fist and waving it at the youngest. Shoto couldn't hold back his snickering, joining Natsu and laughing at the older brother. You guys, Fiumi sighed, brushing the dirt off of Toya's light blue bottom-up shirt. As Toya stood up and got the ball back, they heard their mother's voice, welcoming her husband home. It was supposed to be Angie's day off from work, but there had been a sudden emergency that morning that called for Endeavor's help. Something to do with a hero named O'Clock getting into some trouble. Sounds like Dad's home, Natsu commented as Toya kicked the ball to him. He bounced the object on his knees a couple times, then kicked it to Fuyumi, who kicked it to Toya. Are you and Mom going to train with him after lunch? Hopefully! Toya grinned, kicking the ball a little too hard at Shoto. The latter yelped as the round object bounced off his chest, in turn making him fall backwards. Oops. Toya, Fumi groaned, now dusting her baby brother off. 
Despite the stinging feeling of the bull smacking his chest, Shoto was fine and shook it off. You really like training with dad, he commented. Toyo always smiled happily when he got to lift weights and do push-ups with their father, something Shoto didn't quite understand. His mother also seemed to really enjoy training, but she did different exercises to her husband and son. And I really like training with Toya, Enji said as he walked into the garden, Hara waving at him from his spot in the grass before returning to his work. Toya grinned and trotted to his father, the latter ruffling his white hair as his child approached. Once you get a bit older, we can try more advanced exercises. Awesome, Toya exclaimed victoriously, pleased of his progress. How did the emergency go? Fumi asked, having seen her father leave in a hurry that morning. All Might was already at the scene when I got there. It was just a question of going after some loose villains. We dealt with it quickly. The time-consuming work was finishing the reports, Enji sighed. All Might had looked exhausted when he got there, but they had barely gotten any time to talk before the blonde was gone again. Mirai had told him that Toshinora was fine, really, but that he was stressing about something he couldn't even share with his psychic. What was it with his loved ones and not sharing their problems? You got to see All Might? Shoto asked, eyes lighting up in curiosity. I used to work with him a lot more early on in my career, but we're both too busy to do that as much anymore. Enji nodded to his youngest. Natsu kicked the ball to his dad, which the latter awkwardly received with the side of his foot and gently kicked to Shoto. Why are you always on about All Might? Toa said grumpily, frowning at his youngest brother. Why are you always on about Endeavor? Fuyumi shot back in Shoto's stead. Toya made flailing motions at his father with an incredulous look to his sister. Because dad? And he looks cool? And his fire is cool? Toya said as if it was blatantly obvious. What, do you want me to write you an essay? I wouldn't mind reading that, Enji said, his weak attempt at a joke. It only made his eldest son look up at him with an embarrassed, disbelieving expression, and he crossed his arms, pouting. His cheeks were a slight red. You don't get to read it! He got a light laugh from his father from, for his protest, and another hair ruffle. But really, Shoto, what do you like about All Might? Enji asked, generally wanting to know what it was about his blonde friend that his youngest liked so much. Shoto kicked the ball to Fuyumi, who attempted to bounce the ball on her knees like Natsu had, but the ball just bounced a sharp left, which made the girl run after it. He's... Mm. Shoto tried to think of the word he had heard a journalist use, but he couldn't quite remember how to say it. He looked at Fuyumi as she came back with the ball. Fuyumi, what was the word we saw on TV? re a ash Hmm? Oh, reassuring. His sister helped him out with a grin and kicked the ball back to Natsuo, who took his time to show off his football tricks with a cheeky grin, so different to his siblings. All Might is reassuring, and he saves people with a smile, Shoto said, looking back to his father. Enji let out a small thoughtful hum at that, understanding where Shoto was coming from. Natsu kicked the ball to Toya, who, just like his sister, attempted the same trick. He managed to get one bounce in before the ball bounced off the completely wrong direction, landing with a loud splash in the koi pond. Haro sighed loudly with a smug expression, but grandchildren all looking to him with guilty grins. Stop tormenting my koi! Ray's voice accused from one of the upstairs windows, but she had a smile on her face. Better a ball in the pond than Natsu and Shoto. Natsu yawned loudly and obnoxiously as he stumbled into the kitchen, almost smacking his head on the doorframe as he did. He was up earlier than usual, as today was his papa day, and he wanted to get to the aquarium early. They fed the turtles first thing when they open, and Natsu really liked that. His father knew this and was already dressed and ready as Natsu stumbled into the kitchen. Morning, Natsuo. Did you not sleep well? Enji asked his nine-year-old son. It had been his birthday last month. No, Toy kept me up last night, Natsuo grumbled, rubbing his eyes. He sat at the kitchen table and laid his head on it. He was talking about his old school bullies and how Fumi punched a boy and how he felt bad about punching a girl. Oh, Enji said not too sure what to do with that. He placed Natsu's preferred breakfast in front of him, salted salmon and rice. Does he do that a lot? Toya talks a lot when I'm trying to sleep. Stuff about quirks and heroes, stuff he saw on the internet, about his old school, about the family. Natsu shrugged, eagerly digging into his breakfast. But some nights he's really pushy about me staying awake, then he gets mad at me for wanting to sleep. Angie would kill for Toya to talk to him about his thoughts and worries. 
Ever since his outburst after Shota was born, Angie had hoped this would be a milestone in Toy sharing things with them, and yet Toy never did. He had never said outright that he hated Shoto or that he was jealous of him, but it was pretty clear he was. And as usual, if ever Enji or his mother or grandfather tried to bring it up, Toy would keep a tight lip about it and say nothing. Enji wondered why Toy felt that he couldn't trust the adults in his family to tell them things. Natsuo, Enji started softly, getting his third child's attention through a mouthful of rice and salmon. Could you listen to Toya when he wants to speak about these things with you? Natsu raised an eyebrow, not understanding why that should be his job. You don't have to if you don't want to, but... Toya never talks to us about any of this. It seems you're the only person he trusts. His father's face was serious, as it always was. But a sadness tugged at the corner of the man's lips, barely noticeable. But Natsu recognized it because that's what he did whenever he felt a little sad about something. Usually having to do with Toya being just a bit too mean to Shoto. I can try, he said, not making any promises, as he did like his sleep. He had a lot to catch up since he refused to sleep as a baby. Enji smiled at that, feeling a little reassured. Thank you, Natsuo, he said, ruffling his son's mostly white hair. Once you're finished, we can head to the aquarium. Hopefully a certain someone will be there. He should, Enji had checked the scheduled events. Natsuo wasn't sure what he loved about the aquarium. He just really enjoyed the atmosphere. No matter how many times he went, there was always something to learn or discover. A new crustacean he hadn't seen before, some octopi had just been born, or the tanks had gotten a redesign that showed off a different aesthetic to the fish in it. Angie watched his second son fondly as he paid attention to the staff feeding the turtles and giving a short talk about the animals to the small handful of people around. Natsu was by far the most invested and excited about it. He still had that killer whale plush fat he loved. Natsu, oh, this way. Angie said, motioning to a specific room once the turtle feeding was done, getting a curious glance from the boy. What is it? he asked, before his eyes landed on his favourite hero, Gangorka. It had been just over five years when he first met the pro hero, only keeping up with his progress and actions on the news or online forums. Natsu's eyes widened and he looked up at his father. Did you know? At Angie's nod and grunt. Natsu hugged his father's middle before hurrying to join the other children that were listening to Gang Orca give a lecture. And so, being a pro hero is... The hero paused momentarily when he saw a familiar white-haired child join in, as well as a very familiar tall redhead. While momentarily stunned, he focused back on his talk to the group of children before him, ranging from the ages of 5 to 13, some looking more intimidated than others by his appearance. Being a pro hero is a lot of hard work that must be taken seriously. People's lives are at stake when you're out in the field, and it's up to you to bring them home. Natsu listened attentively, smiling as he did. Enji purposely stayed a little further away, not to take away the attention from the younger hero. Once Gang Orko was done with his talk and the children started disbanding, returning to their various parents or teachers, Natsu was the only one to walk up to Gang Orko. Thank you for your talk, Gangorka. My name is Natsuo. Natsuo grinned up at the tall hero. Ray had taught him the proper mannerisms for greeting people. Gangorka looked down at him with what could be a smile, though it was hard to tell. Yes, I remember you. I met you and your mother a few years ago. He nodded, amused by the child's pleased demeanour being remembered. You've grown considerably since. Why, you look just like your father. So I keep hearing, and she said lightly as he approached the two still disagreeing with that opinion. Gangorka, good to make your acquaintance, he extended his hand, which the taller hero accepted. Likewise, Endeavor. Apologies for not visiting your agency like your wife offered. It's been a busy few years since I graduated, the man said as they shook hands before crossing his arms in front of his chest. I understand. Seems everybody was rather busy, more than usual. Toshinori hadn't visited in a while. Natsu is rather fond of you. Dad... A child said bashfully, but didn't deny it, looking up at Gangorka with bright-eyed awe. I've been keeping up with your sea rescues. I love the way you talk about both the dangers and beauty of the ocean. Natsu loved the sea. That's something that had been obvious since the first time he'd been taken to Iwata as a child. And you look awesome! The last comments seemed to hit something in Gangorka, and he'd be blushing if he could. Enji was envious of Natsu's easygoing ability to just say what was on his mind without feeling the need to filter himself. 
similarly to Toya, except he had more nice things to say than the eldest. I don't know what to say to that, Gangorka said with an embarrassed chuckle, rubbing the back of his neck. He wasn't used to being complimented like this. Most of the time, children were afraid of his appearance. That didn't apply to Natsuro Todoroki. Thank you for your support. Could I do work experience with you if I ever decide to become a hero? Natsuo asked conversationally, genuinely wondering if that was an option. Enji's eyebrows lifted in surprise. Do you want to become a pro hero, Natsuo? He asked, not having heard of this before. His son looked up at him and shrugged with a smile. Maybe, I don't know yet, he replied. That's quite a mature reply, Gangorga commented before leaning down to pat Natsuo on the head. If you do decide on it, contact my agency when the time comes. We'll discuss your options. Natsu accepted the gesture and grinned brightly at his favourite hero. Yes, Gangorka, sir! He chimed. I didn't know you were thinking about becoming a hero, Natsuo. Enji said once they had left the aquarium, going to a sushi shop so Natsuo could eat his favourite food, sashimi. I haven't really, it's only been a thought recently. Natsuo shook his head. Despite only being nine years old, he could easily pass for a young teen. Toyo talks a lot about heroes and stuff. He told me once Edshot said something about filling in a need and about him doing mountain rescues. Toyo called Edshot's idea stupid, but I thought it was smart. That's what a Gangorka does. I could do mountain rescues easily. Enji listened to his son, a small, fond smile creeping onto his face as he recognized the familiarity of this scene. It reminded him of when he and Haro had gone to a sushi shop for his 14th birthday. You're certainly built for cold weathers, that's true. Though that would mean you'd have to move somewhere where the mountains are, and there's plenty of those around. Would you be settled in one place or travel around? Enji asked, curious as to his son's thought process. Natsu hummed thoughtfully. I'd want my agency to be here, but I could travel to the most popular areas during mountaineering or tourist seasons. I might have to start off small, but if I get enough of a good reputation, I could work with local rescue efforts. Then, if there's an emergency, they can call me, and I travel to them. Natsuo said, nibbling on his sashimi as he did. Like how you work with the police. Toya told me about that too. Looking at his father, he saw the man smiling at him, listening attentively. You seem to have it all figured out, Enji commented, getting a smile from his son in return. If you ever decide that's what you want to do for sure, you could ask Toya if you can train with him. As soon as they returned home, Natsu looked for Toya, and found him sitting in the garden. The white-haired boy was looking at the flowers his mother had planted, watching as bumblebees buzzed from plant to plant, as well as the butterflies that flitted about. Hearing somebody approach, he looked at Natsu. Falata could see a tiredness in his big brother's eyes, and guessed he probably hadn't slept well either. How was the aquarium? Toya asked as Natsuo sat beside him. He wouldn't admit he was jealous at his little brother's height, but he did wish he was taller. Fun! Gangorka was there. I got to talk to him. Natsuo grinned. His smile encouraged Toya to smile too. Last night, you were talking about your old school bullies. Is it true for you to punch one of them? He asked with curious giddiness. The image of soft-spoken and Kara Fuyumi punching the daylight out of a boy older than her was hilarious to Natsuo. Toya stared at Natsuo. His brother had white hair just like him, but with two red stripes on the sides and brown-grey eyes like their mother. It was the tallest of the siblings, more naturally built and reminded Toya of their father. The way he smiled, his eye shape, his mannerisms were exactly like the man Toya admired so much. Even if Natsuo smiled much more, the way he smiled was different to all the siblings. Natsuo looked so sure of himself and confident. Unlike how Toya felt. Which is maybe why he felt he could talk to him about anything and everything, even if Natsuo didn't usually listen. But now, Natsuo was the one starting the conversation. It was just the two of them out in the garden, with the flowers, the bees, the butterflies, and the sun. Yeah... She was vicious. She used her eyes to make knuckle dusters, Toya said, his voice getting more energy as he spoke, even laughing at the end. Natsuo's eyes widened at that, and he laughed in turn. You probably could do that too, since your quirk is the same as Fuyumi's. Oh, but after that, Fuyumi and I were called into the headmaster's office, and he suggested to Grandpa and Dad that we get extra quirk counselling classes, and man, Dad was pissed. Natsuo laughed at Toya, retelling the story. 
He then asked about the time Endeavor arrested a villain with Toya sitting on his shoulders. Then about when he met Best Genus and Edshot. And then they discussed whether two young heroes had told Toya. Nato disagreed with his brother that the two heroes were stupid, sharing his own thoughts about Gang Orca and his importance. The two argued and discussed how materialistic the modern hero was. They agreed that heroes that focused on their work like Endeavor and Gang Orca were superior. They talked, discussed, and argued well into the evening, only stopping when Ray called them in for dinner. Toya stopped keeping Natsu up at night, able to sleep with an appeased heart and mind. He knew Natsu and him could speak in the morning. Chapter 25 Conflagration As the leaves changed from greens to yellows, browns and oranges, the climate became cooler, much to the delight of the cold-resistant Todoroki children. Wear your jackets anyway, I don't want you getting sick, Ray instructed, getting a quartet of groans from the front door, followed by a symphony of droll doubt. Okay. Toya, Fuyumi, and Natsuo had worked very hard today when they saw that the weather had cooled down yet was still sunny, therefore had made extra efforts to be done with their work early. Shota hadn't started homeschooling yet, but he was still learning to read, write, and count anyway. He liked doing what his older siblings did. Toya, can I hold your hand? He asked the eldest when they stepped out of the house. They planned to walk to the park together, something their mother trusted them to do as long as they stuck together. Toya eyed his brother suspiciously before sighing and rolling his eyes, extending his hand to the younger child. Shoto grinned and clasped Toya's hand. Bite me and I throw you in a bush, the eldest hissed out his warning, but it only made Shoto giggle. The park was relatively empty since it was a little bit before the regular schools would be done for the day. It was mainly just very small toddlers and their mothers, and a few elderly people. Fuyumi and Natsu sprinted for the swings, calling dibs before Shota and Toya. The latter decided to have a go at the monkey bars, wanting to test out his strength to swing across without slipping or stopping. Shota watched him for a bit, before wanting to have a go too. But he was too short to grab the monkey bars, and all jumping did was make him faceplant into the dirt. Toya laughed at him as he helped dust off wood chips that covered the ground from his brother's hair. Here, Toya said, and lifted Shoto up high enough so he could grab at the first bar. Shoto did, but then just... hung there. You gotta swing to the next one. I can't. Shoto wasn't nearly as strong as his brother, and he was still only five years old. Then drop down. It's too high. Oh, for crying out loud. Toya sighed in a very harrow-like manner and extended his arms. Come on, I'll catch you. No, you won't, Shoto said with squinted eyes at his eldest brother. Despite still hanging on, his hands were slipping. I will, and that just oof! Toya collapsed under the weight of his baby brother suddenly falling from the monkey bars, ending up with his back flat on the floor. Nice catch! Natsu laughed from where he and Fumi were still trying to see who could swing the highest. Toya rolled his eyes and sat up, a giggling Shoto toppling off of his lap to the ground. Well, he'd trade Shoto for a sour grape, seeing his little brother laugh was contagious, and Toya couldn't help but snicker too. Hey, is that Toya? A boy called out. It is! For you, me too! Another said. Oh my god, Toya's hair is completely white! Multiple boys laughed. Guess your quirk really gave up on you, huh? Looking up, Toya paled at the sight of his old elementary school bullies. They were in middle school uniforms now, and looked much taller than they had been before. He quickly got up and pulled at Shota's arm, looking to Fuyumi. The girl had a scowl on, having jumped from her swing to glare at the boys. Let's go home, she said to Natsuo, who looked confused, like Shoto did. Neither of them knew what was going on, but Natsuo had a good idea of who these boys could be based on the many chats he'd had with Toya. Don't run away, the boy Fuyumi had punched, jogged to them, and glared to the shorter girl. I think you owe me an apology. I owe you nothing, Fumi snapped, crossing her arms. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Bully Toya, get punched. Fumi, let's just go. Mum will probably want help with dinner, Toya said as he pulled at his sister's jacket to make her follow him. Natsuo and Shoto were a little way ahead already, looking worried. Ew, gross. You let your mum cook for you? Another boy said, sticking his tongue out. It was Fuyumi and Toya's turn to be confused, frowning at him. Yeah, don't you? Fuyumi said with a raised eyebrow. 
Yeah, but your mum is a Himura. I wouldn't eat anything for a person from that inbred family made for me. But then again, I guess you're inbred too. Anger boiled in Toya's gut. He had seen a lot of those types of comments on fan forums when it came to his mother. Usually people just bringing it up questioningly, but sometimes genuinely awful comments berating both his mum and his maternal side of the family. Comments about how Endeavor must have bought his wife or calling her a gold digger. Through that, Toya had come to know of the humorous past and current goings on. Fumi blinked, even more confused, and looked at Natsu and Shoto. The former was scowling deeply, looking a lot like his father, while Shoto held onto the boy's arm tightly for comfort. Mind your own business, Toya said through gritted teeth, glaring at the boys murderously. Or what? It's not like you can do anything, one of the boys taunted, smirking at him. You can't use your quirk, and you need your itty-bitty sister to fight your battles. Toy was going to fucking kill them. Back off! Natsu roared, pushing past his older siblings to get right up in the boys' faces. Even though his shoulders were hunched, the nine-year-old was still taller than them, face darkened by a furious scowl. He looked identical to Endeavor, to a terrifying degree, which is probably what made the group of boys lean away from him with wide eyes. The hell's your problem, talking trash about my family? Go away! His voice was heard all throughout the park, catching everybody's attention and staring at the kids. Shoto noticed and rushed up to his older siblings, tugging at Toya's wrist. Toya, let's go home, he said in a small voice. His brother turned to look at him, and Shoto froze. Toya's face was slightly obscured by his hair, but his blue eyes shone with so much hatred and anger that they looked fluorescent. The way he was staring down at him, it was like Toya wasn't seeing Shoto for Shoto, but as something else entirely. He violently ripped his wrist out of his brother's hold and pushed past him, making the five-year-old stagger. Fuyumi caught him before he could fall, arms on his shoulders as she looked at her older brother. Toya? Fuyumi said with concern, then looked back to the third sibling. Natsu, come on, leave them. Natsu snorted angrily at the boys before turning heel and leaving the quivering group behind. The three younger siblings explained to their mother and grandfather what happened when they got home. Hara immediately went to check on Toya, but couldn't find him anywhere in the house, despite being sure that he'd gone to his bedroom. A bad feeling settled in his gut. Toya reappeared just before Enji usually returned from home, his head damp and smelling like shampoo. He wore a long sleeve pyjama top and kept his distance from everyone. The adults knew exactly what he'd done. Those bullies definitely got to him, there's no doubt. Enji sighed heavily, rubbing a hand over his face as he and Ray sat outside together, having some tea. From there, they could see Sakoto Peak. Whatever angle Toya was training at, it was clearly out of sight of them, since nobody had noticed flames earlier that day on the mountain. Do I confront him again? Last time had been... explosive. But it had been five years, maybe Toya would react better to talking about it? I can try and talk to Toya this time, Ray offered after a sip of her tea. She could tell from Enji's demeanour alone that he had no desire to face his son again, and in all fairness, he had been the one to deal with it last time. Enji looked at her with tired eyes, but his expression the same as always. She smiled sweetly to him. He's my son too. Toya tried to sneak out again the next day after he finished his work, but Ray had kept a very close eye on him. Toya, wait! She stopped her oldest at the front door by holding his shoulders gently, gaining an angry frown from the teen. You're planning on going to the mountain again, like yesterday, aren't you? It wasn't an accusation. Her voice was filled with worry, and she had a deep sadness in her eyes. Why don't you train with me instead? Or play with your siblings? Like you'd understand. We're in different worlds. Toya snapped, tone harsh as he shrugged his mother's hold on his shoulder. He was part of the hero world. That's where he was supposed to be. Right beside his father, fire quirk and all. An angry flame had been reignited after yesterday's confrontation with his old bullies. His hatred towards Shoto had lifted its head again and he didn't even want to talk to Natsu about it. He didn't get it. He had a quirk that worked. For me too, and especially Shoto. He was supposed to be in a league above them. And he was, he just needed to prove it. Seeing her son's angry expression, Ray sighed softly to try and calm herself and rested a hand over her chest. 
Toya, do you really want to become a hero? She asked. Anytime her son spoke about his quirk, it had always been about becoming stronger than Endeavor, never about helping people or for the sake of being a good hero. Unlike Natsuo, who talked about rescues and the specific things he liked about Gangorka, Toy rejected anything that wasn't him fulfilling the promise he'd been told by his father. That he could be more powerful than him. That he could be just like Endeavor. Toya, hand on the door, stopped. He turned his head slightly to look at his mother, eyes glaring at her questioningly. To me, Ray said softly, it seems like you're in pain and obsessed with your father. No, rather, Endeavor. His jaw clenched. The sides of his vision blurred, narrowing down on Ray. Toya, there's so many paths and you have countless choices. At the agency alone, there's so many things you could do other than be a hero. Look at everything else around you, not just your father. You have so many things you're good at. Your grandfather said you are a fantastic referee in sports classes. His mother continued, trying to smile at him, trying to get him to see that there was more to him than his status as Endeavor's son and his quirk. Her voice sounded distant to his ears, echoing like she was talking from the other side of a tunnel. Once again, his mother was standing against him, just like all the stupid adults in his family. Not once had any of them tried to stand in his corner and argue against his quirk training stopping. And the audacity of his mother, who in his mind was the reason he had a defective quirk, to tell him what he should or shouldn't do. His brain was bubbling from the heat of his frustrated fury. I just... I really want you to find something you truly want to be out there. For yourself. What do you know, mum? Toya's tone was venomous. Ray's breath caught in her chest, and she paled. Toya's eyes were filled with fury and hatred, directed at her, accusing, blaming. Did you get that from a self-help book or something? He should stop talking. Grandma and grandpa were poor. He had to stop talking. That's why they sold you, right? His inner thoughts wouldn't stop flowing, saying things he hadn't even told Natsu yet. You had no choice but to do as they said. He couldn't control the venom dripping from his mouth. It's because of your inbred blood that I'm like this. All the things he saw online about his mother's family came to the forefront of his mind, only encouraged by yesterday's bullies. A horrified expression appeared on his mother's face. Why was her baby boy saying these things? Why was he reinforcing every insecurity she had? Why was he agreeing that she was the problem? Tor, the door slammed open before Ray could get a word out. It's your fault too, mum. Tor snarled bitterly, glaring at her with ritual dripping in his voice. The door slammed shut with so much violence it shook the walls. Ray stood there, frozen. Tears dripped down her cheeks before she realised. Endeavor sighed as he chucked yet another villain to the police. They were really making him and his psychics work overtime these days, probably because it was inching towards the holiday seasons and they were getting frisky. His phone buzzed and he saw it was Ray calling him. That's odd. She usually called him at times she knew he was on break. This had to be some sort of emergency. Thoughts of Toya entered his mind. Ray? He said as he accepted the call. Sniffling. NG, I can't stop him. More sniffling. He's up at Se Sekoto Peak. Why was she crying? I'm coming home, he said firmly. Ray made a small, high-pitched sound from her throat in response. The call ended. Endeavor? One of the sidekicks approached him. Even with the flame mask, they could all see a shaken look in the man's eyes. Take over for the rest of the day, he gruffly ordered before hurriedly calling Kuramada to pick him up. He was home barely 20 minutes later. Enji didn't even bother changing from his hero suit and had ordered Kuramada to drive as quickly as he could. He'd pay any fines his chauffeur got. He hurried into the house, met with a wide-eyed and confused Shoto. Dad? he asked, surprised to see him. He had his All Might plush in his arms. Where's your mother? Angie asked his five-year-old son. I saw her go to her bedroom, Shota replied meekly, a little scared of his father's expression right now. His father never had his hero suit in the house, or at the very least, not visibly. 
Usually he wore it under casual clothes. Go play with your brother and sister. NG desperately tried to soften his voice, seeing the worried look on his son's face, but not able to find it in within himself to be any gentler right now. Passing by his youngest, he hurried down to his shared bedroom of Ray. He knocked on the door, much like he had when he'd first married his wife. No answer. Ray? He heard a small sound coming from inside. He opened the door slowly. The window was wide open, letting in icy cold air. Ray was kneeled in front of a drawer, putting away the freshly ironed clothing. Angie stepped inside and closed the bedroom door. He walked to a scarily quiet wife, who wasn't turning to look at him, and loomed over her for a moment. Ray continued to put away the clean clothes. Only when she was done with her task did Angie kneel down to her level. Only then did Ray turn her face to him. Her face was tear-streaked, her eyes were red, and she wouldn't look at her husband. There was a tremble in her lower lip, trying to restrain the engulfing sadness. Angie hated seeing her like this. He didn't know what to do. Awkwardly, but genuinely, he opened his arms and wrapped them around her. Before he could properly hug her, Ray collapsed into his chest and started openly sobbing, her tears dripping onto his dark blue suit. Her hands rested on either side of her head in shaky fists, her hair draping over her shoulders and back as they shook. Occasional hiccups broke her muffled sobbing. His arms were around her completely, his lips against the top of her head. Emotion clogged up his throat. His eyes were burning. He exhaled shakily through his nose and brought her closer against him, hugging her like she'd melt away at any second. Ray's hiccuped sobbing turned to broken sentences and explanations, the vibrations of her voice rippling across his chest as she tried to retell what happened with Toya. Engie let her break down in his arms, keeping his mouth pressed against her hair. He didn't know what else to do. Even through the broken words and wet hiccups, he understood what she was saying, what Toya had told her, how he had blamed her for everything. She finally admitted that she blamed herself for Toya's premature birth. That's not your fault, Angie muttered against her hair, eyebrows furrowing in pain. Could the people in his life stop blaming themselves for things out of their control? But my family... Ray hiccuped, pressing her cheek against his strong chest and taking in a trembling breath, trying to calm down. That's still not your fault, Angie reaffirmed jaw clenching as he tried to hold back his own emotion. This was Ray's moment. She needed to be comforted right now. Toya doesn't have the full story. He reacted without thinking. Because that's something Angie would do, if he didn't have Harrod to smack some sense into him. It's something he still does whenever he sees burns on Toya. For someone who doesn't show many emotions, he feels them intensely. Ray sniffled against his chest, blotting herself against him, his natural warmth comforting her. Not because he was warm and she was cold, but because Angie's fire was unique to him, and that brought her calm. I see, it is like a bodily function, Toyd muttered to himself excitedly, the fire around his chest and stomach flickering between a cosy warm orange to a vivid blue. He couldn't hold it for long, but... When I get excited, it's a direct link to my firepower. With that, he blasted another attack to the dummies he set up, his fire turning blue for a moment before it hit its target, then burst into a powerful red, yellow, and orange. Tears dripped down his face. He didn't understand why. I'm amazing. Dad'll be so surprised. He sniffed to himself out loud, wiping his eyes. He couldn't tell if they were because of the pain or the excitement. Maybe both. Maybe neither. Toya jumped as he heard footsteps approaching, confused as to why somebody would be up here. His flames went out instantly without him thinking, but the flaming dummies remained lit, proof of his actions. A large shadow appeared from the trees, and his father's face became enlightened by the glow of the fire. It was night. Toya hadn't realised it had gotten dark so quickly. Dad! he exclaimed, a bright grin on his face. 
He was shirtless, leaving his brand new red burn marks all over his stomach, chest and arms exposed. That, and the fat tears in his eyes, is all Angie could see. Dad, look, okay, please look! Toya summoned his fire again. He was so overwhelmed by his father being here, excited at finally being able to show off like he had years before, but his orange flames easily turned blue. They were so much hotter than his usual flames that just a simple lick from the embers against his face burnt him. That's all Angie could see. All Angie could see was his baby boy, his first child, the little baby he'd held in the palm of his hands, burning up in front of him like a moth that finally touched a flame. It's really cool, right? Toy exclaimed with wide, tear-filled eyes, a manic grin on his face as he desperately tried to get the reaction he wanted from his father. Tell him he's proud, that he's amazing, that he's so much better than Shota could ever be. And so much stronger than you, right? I bet I could even challenge All Might, he rambled, words stumbling out in a desperate mess. Something stung in his neck area, right behind his ear, and he pulled his head to try to soothe it. He couldn't see that it was his fire burning him. Angie stepped forward, mind blank. Toy looked so desperate, with large tears dripping down his face that evaporated with a sizzling sound when they came into contact with his flames. He could see the frustration in his face as he started pulling at his white hair, like he'd done when he was little and losing the red. A fake, faraway smile pulled at his face, the corner of his lips tugging downwards as his emotions got the better of him. As they did, his fire became more powerful, the blue becoming more and more vibrant. It was so hot that even Engie's eyes flinched at the heat as he got closer to his son. He dropped to his knees in front of him, staring at the young teen he loved so dearly. Blinking through the tears and his blurry vision, Tor realised his father was wearing his Endeavour suit, the dark blue shimmering in the light of his various flames, the pattern across his chest and along his arms glowing with the fire lingering under his skin. Only difference was that the cage-like braces around his arms weren't there. Looking to his father's face, he couldn't discern any expression. It was stern, his brows furrowed, but there was no anger, no disappointment, no judgement. A twitch in his father's jaw went almost unnoticed, and told Toya that the man was restraining something, some sort of emotion. He desperately wanted it to be a good one. See, I'm not quirkless! Aren't you glad I was born? Toya pushed, continuing to pull and tug at his hair, to the point of actual pain but not nearly as much as the fire he was trying to distract himself from. He could deal with it. It's his body. He knows his body best. I'm not a mistake. You can be proud of me. The words echoed in Angie's head. He felt hollow, a sickening feeling digging into his chest and leaving nothing but nausea. He opened his mouth to say something, anything, but he didn't know what to say. What could he say that wouldn't just encourage his son's spiralling obsession? A shaky exile escaped him, and finally, Toy could discern an emotion on his father's face. Anguish. Dad? I'm sorry. Toy blinked, teary eyes still wide, manic smile still plastered, pain still biting at his fragile skin. I'm sorry. His father's voice came out shakier clearly trying to hold back tears. Angie refused to cry in front of his son. Just like with Ray, this had to be about Toya. I'm sorry I made you feel like I'm not proud of you. The teen's mind stuttered to a stop. His blue flames went out, leaving raw, sensitive skin behind. His jaw trembled for a second, but he grit his teeth and forced himself to grin at his dad. Doesn't matter, he exclaimed the tears that never stopped flowing running down his cheeks, shiny blue eyes meeting his father's. Because I'm strong, I can I can be stronger than, than Endeavor. I'll show you, I'll... A hiccup got in his throat. I'll become a hero, stronger than you. I'll show you I can. More tears filled his eyes, wetting his face so much he could drown. Because you said I could. I want to show you I can, so you can be proud of me. He was shouting now throat starting to hurt from the desperation of wanting to prove himself, choking him. He couldn't breathe. 
It was like smoke eating him from the inside out, making his breath feel thick and heavy at the back of his throat. He let out a cough, then sniffed, still trying to grin. Two large hands cupped his cheeks, thumbs wiping at his tears. The fabric of Endeavor's suit became damp. His father's hands were warm, but not painfully so like his own flames. A warmth that he remembered falling asleep on since he was little. It was home. You are the first, greatest joy of my life. The words were said softly, sounding so unlike the confident sternness he was used to. Toya could deal with firm words of scorn, concerned yells, desperate pleas for an explanation, any strong reaction like that. But this vulnerability in his father's tone, it tore something in Toya. Engie watched his little one's forced manic grin dissipate. Toy had grown from how tiny he used to be. Just naturally and through physical training with him, Toya had grown. His shoulders had broadened. Engie was so proud. He was proud of every single little milestone his son achieved. His first smile, his first laugh, his first steps, his first word, his progress of his physical training. He was so unbelievably proud of every mundane, normal thing Toya achieved, and Engie couldn't find any way to express any of it. The words weren't coming to him, emotions stuck in his chest like a dam blocking a river. Toya's tears had stopped. He was just staring wide-eyed at him. His eyes were more focused, actually seeing his father. Seeing his father look at him with anguished blue eyes, with more emotion than he could ever verbally express, but he was unable to show in a way to make Toya understand how loved he truly was. I'm always proud of you. His father breathed out finally, voice hitching ever so slightly with emotion. He couldn't express the further depth, couldn't go into every little nook and cranny of his thoughts and emotions. He didn't have the words to explain and prove to his son just how much he was proud of him. Toya remembered what his grandfather told him years ago. They've loved you from the instant they knew they were going to have you, and they have been proud of your every move since you were born. The video had been shown, of his mother excited encouraging him as he stood for the first time, the last frame of his father kissing him on the cheek when he still had red hair. Why had he forgotten that? His dad is proud of him. Always had been. His lips trembled. He sniffled. It hurts, he whispered out. The stinging of his burn settled in, as well as something deep within himself. His inner conflicts, the outside world's attacks, the frustration, the hurt he caused his siblings, the screams sent to his grandfather, the weight of his earlier words to his mother, all of it hit him then, like a rock in his heart. Fresh tears welled in his eyes, but this time... They were of shame and hurt. It really hurts, he sobbed out, body shaking, tears dripping again. He leaned his face into his father's touch, gripping at his large wrists and digging his fingers into the blue of his suit to ground himself. Carefully, gently, Engie scooped up his son. Despite the sensitive skin of his stomach and chest, Toya wrapped his arms around his father's neck, sobbing into his shoulder loudly. Haro had already put Fuyumi, Shoto and Natsu to bed by the time Enji returned with Toya. It had taken some time to actually find him on Sakoto Peak, as he had managed to find a hidden spot that wasn't obvious. Despite being in bed, Natsu couldn't sleep. It felt wrong sleeping alone in his room. He heard soft crying as steps walked by and pushed himself into a sitting position, watching the shadow of his father pass by, carrying who he assumed was his crying brother. Quietly, he tiptoed after them, saw the bathroom door was slightly ajar. Peeking in, his eyes widened in horror as he saw his father cleaning up his older brother, the skin of his chest and stomach a painful red, raw and stinging. Toya's eyes were puffy from crying, and tears still dripped down his face as he sniffed. Nato had never seen his brother like this, and it hurt him. Do you want dinner? 
Enji asked softly as he bandaged Toya's worse than usual burns. The teenager shook his head. He was too in pain to eat and was exhausted. Enji heard the door creak ever so quietly, and looking up, he saw Natsuo peek in. Natsuo, you should be sleeping. I can't sleep, he muttered, eyes landing on Toya. Are you okay? No, Toya replied, wiping his tears as Enji dressed him gently into his pyjamas. It hurt to move and do it on his own. Something clogged in his throat and he coughed a little, sniffling again. The salve felt soothing against his skin, and the bandages protected his sensitive burns from the rough fabric of his sleepwear, but the pain was still very much there. I want to see Mum. Let's go see if she's awake, Enji replied. He had left to look for Toya after Ray had calmed down, and a very worried Haro had returned home to look after the kids so Ray could take a break. Do you want to come too, Natsuo? The younger boy gave a little nod. As they left the bathroom, Natsuo reached out and held his big brother's bandaged hands gently. Toya didn't look at him, but didn't pull away either. Enji led the two boys to a shared room of Ray, opening the door just a bit to see in what state she was in. Ray was in their futon and lifted her head when she heard the door open and some light from the hallways leaked in. Her eyes were less puffy, but still a little red. Enji opened the door wider to reveal Toya and Natsuo. Toya, Ray sat up, her voice shaky as she looked at the dishevelled state of her son. From behind Enji's thigh, Toya peeked at her, almost fearfully. He expected maybe resentment from his mother, or her being unwilling to see him. But all he saw was genuine, cautious worry. Tears welled up in his eyes again. He let go of Natsuo's hand and rushed forward past his father, collapsing on top of his mother and hugging her as tightly as his wounds would let him. I'm sorry, I said some horrible things, Toya sobbed into Ray's shoulder, her hair sticking to her boy's face as tears wetted his cheeks again. Ray's own eyes became teary, and she wrapped her arms around her eldest, patting his hair lovingly. Please don't hate me. I could never, Ray said quickly, pulling back enough from the hug to wipe Toya's tears and kiss his forehead. I could never hate you. Natsuo's confusion wasn't helped, and he looked up to his father for guidance. The man, still in his Endeavour suit, kneeled beside him. Toyo said some hurtful things to Mum earlier, Enji explained quietly as to not disturb Toyo and Ray's moment. Natsu made a little, oh, sound. He hadn't ever experienced the worst of Toyo's outbursts, but he knew how harsh Toyo could get at times. It's late, you should sleep. Can I sleep here tonight? Toyo asked with big, tearful eyes still pressed against his mother as he looked at Denji. Please. Me too, Natsuo seconded, not wanting to sleep alone in his room. He was used to Toya being beside him. Their parents made eye contact and Ray nodded. Of course, Enji replied. By the time Enji was out of his blue suit, washed and dressed for bed, Ray, Toya and Natsuo were already fast asleep. It's a good thing that they had such a large couple's foot on, and she was able to easily slip under the covers while giving enough room for the others. Toya snuggled against his mother, snoring lightly. Natsu sandwiched him against Ray, and when Enji joined under the blankets, Natsu made a little grunting sound and turned to blot himself against his father's warmth. His little sigh of content as he slept peacefully, a blissed-out expression on his third face, put Enji's heart at ease. They'd have to have a serious talk in the morning, but for now, he could enjoy this moment of rest. He let Natsuo use his arm as a pillow, drifting off to sleep himself. Endeavour didn't go to work the next day, prioritising his family. After the things that were said by the bullies at the park and Toy's outbursts of the things he read on the internet, it felt like they had to talk about Ray and Enji's relationship, as well as the Himura's history. It wasn't a fun conversation, especially not for Ray, who found it difficult to discuss her family's unusual and even cruel past. The kids were all very perturbed by being told the truth of the Himura, Shoto needing a little extra help to understand the real taboo of what happened. Toya felt horrible for blaming his mother for his unexpected premature birth, 
and accusing her of being the reason he had a faulty quirk as he learned to the extent of his mother's upbringing. The mood became lighter when they got to the part of Angie and Ray meeting for the first time. Angie had given Ray the chance to choose him because she wanted to be with him, not for the sake of her family. A choice Ray never thought she would ever get to experience. My parents didn't even know who I was dating until your father and grandfather travelled for the marriage proposal. Ray laughed lightly, happy to speak about the best moments of her laugh rather than the embarrassment of her family's history. And you were all very much wanted and planned for. Especially for you, me. Angie added behind a sip of his coffee, remembering the time he learnt what baby fever meant. Ray gave him a small, painless smack on the shoulder for that. Ow! Toya and Natsu whined in unison, grimacing at the unnecessary info. Fumi grinned widely. Shoto didn't understand why his older brothers reacted that way. People say stupid things all the time. Remembering how I told you that, Toya. Angie gained his eldest attention. Especially online. I don't want to have to restrict your internet access more than we have to, but if you can't help but read things that upset you, maybe that's for the best. Can I still watch Endeavor videos? Toya asked meekly, tapping the kitchen table. Angie gave him a smile. Of course you can. How bad were his burns? Fuyumi asked Natsu as they did some work. Shoto trying to wonkily write his name in the correct kanji. Really bad. Bright red. Natsu replied with a wince at the memory. Ray was currently redoing Toya's bandages, the salve helping to ease the burning pain. Fumi let out a sad sigh, feeling a lot like she had when she was little. How many times would she have to go through the sorrow of her older brother getting hurt by his own actions until he started taking care of himself? Is it my fault? Shoto asked, very quietly, gaining his sibling's attention. He saw two horrified faces at his words. Is it because of my quirk for Toya is sad? He couldn't shake the angry, hateful glare his brother had given him. It scared him. No, 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 Peppermint, it's not. Fumi shook her head, going to kneel beside her littlest brother and holding his hands in hers. Toya was already hurting when we were little. It's not your fault. You haven't done anything wrong. At Fuyumi's soft reassurance and gentle hold, Shoto felt a little better, smiling at his big sister. Natsu watched this. The memory of the bullies entered his mind, and anger bubbled in his chest. He wasn't going to let his siblings get hurt because some idiots were being mean. December 6th, Fuyumi's 13th birthday, and she had a special desire. She wanted to go ice skating with her entire family. Ray was over the moon at the suggestion. Enji, less so. He expected to embarrass himself in front of his children. Mum, you have your own ice skates? Fumi asked with wide-eyed wonder at the well-taken-care-of white shoes. Ray grinned at her daughter as she put them. Your father gifted them to me for my first birthday after we got married, she explained before helping Fumi with her rented ones. All right, get a feel for the ice first. I'll help you balance. Fumi got the hang of it instantly, but still held under her mother's hands until she felt fully confident. The feeling of the ice scratching under the blades of her skates and of the icy cold air against her pale skin made Fumi laugh lightly. As she got the better hang of it, Ray and Fumi did a round of the ice rink while holding hands, the mother praising her daughter as Fumi quickly became steady on her feet and instructed how to push against the ice for more speed. This is so fun! Fumi exclaimed happily, doing a little spin. Right? She turned to her brothers. The three brothers shakily had their hands spread out to keep balance, legs wobbly and unsteady as they tried to get used to their skates. Angie was holding onto the side of the rink, biting the inside of his lip to not laugh at his sons, despite being in an equally of a dire situation as them. Toya tripped forward and caught onto his father's wrist as he tried not to break his face on the ice. Natsu was either leaning too far forward or too far backward, not able to get his centre of balance right. Shoto was flailing his arms as he skated backwards, unable to get his footing. Sure, Natsu said. So fun, Toya sarcastically replied, only still being on his skates due to holding onto his father. Help! Shota's high-pitched cry rung out as his legs went flying from underneath him, grabbing the person closest to him, who happened to be Natsuo. 
The latter let out a surprised yelp, finally losing his balance and falling forward onto Toya, who was still holding onto his father precariously. Ah! Toya squeaked as he face planted into the ice, dragging Enji down with him. Fuyumi and Rei watched with wide eyes as the four men of the family collapsed into a pile on the ice. Enji desperately hanging on for dear life on the edge of the rink as Toya was squished by both Natsuo and Shoto. In the distance, they could hear hollering laughter from Haro, who was drinking a coffee as he watched over their bags. Rei and Fumi burst out laughing, tears forming as they wheezed the scene. You'd think having an ice quirk would make you a good skater! Haro called out from where he was sitting, directing this at Natsuo and Shoto. You come and try then! Natsuo yelled back with a laugh, struggling to his knees as Shoto gave up, face down in the ice with his arms and legs spread out like a starfish. No thanks, their grandfather replied. He was self-aware enough to know he'd face plant too and had no desire to test fate. Toya and Shoto groaned against the ice, which only made Fuyumi and Rei laugh even harder. He managed to get back onto his skates, brushing himself off with a soft smile. He offered his hand to Natsuo, the latter taking it and letting himself be pulled up by his father. All right, you two, get up. Enji chuckled at his eldest and youngest, giving up on the rest of the day and accepting their fate in the slippery ice. Haru's gift to Fuyumi was a video of her brothers and father tumbling on the ice, which made the young teen spiral into laughter all over again. You were laughing a bit too hard, Enji snorted at his wife as they got ready for bed, Ray still cackling at the scene from earlier. It was hilarious, Ray said as she poked her husband's exposed side. He was currently dressed in only pyjama bottoms. Plus, it made Fuyumi happy. You know, maybe we should consider letting her take ice skating classes. She could enjoy that. Hmm, that's a good idea. We'll ask her tomorrow. And she nodded as he patted his face dry with a towel. He shuddered as he felt two cold arms wrap around his waist and looked down at his wife, who was resting her chin on his exposed pecs, grinning up at him lecherously. What? He asked suspiciously. Can't I indulge in my husband? Ray giggled, going onto her tiptoes to reach as close as she could to her man's lips, which was right below the collarbone. So nowhere close. Enji snorted as he leaned down and kissed Ray the way she wanted him to. Don't believe mommy! Enji and Ray froze. Thank goodness they were under the covers. Awkwardly detangling themselves from each other, Enji and Ray sat up and looked at their tearful five-year-old, who was supposed to be in bed and asleep well over an hour ago. Shoto? Ray said with an embarrassed laugh, putting the blanket up higher to properly cover herself. The little boy ran to his mother, glaring at his father with little curled up fists. Shoto, it's okay, your dad wasn't bullying me. She was trying so hard not to laugh, her face a bright red. But you sounded hurt, Shota said through stubborn tears, worried for his mother's well-being. The sheer genuine innocence of her littlest boy made Ray have to restrain her giggles, bringing her boy in for a hug as she ran fingers through his hair. What were you doing to mummy? He said accusingly to his father. Flames flickered bright and powerful along Enji's cheekbones as he rubbed the hand up and down his face, turning several shades of pink and red. He couldn't answer the infuriated question said of so much pure innocence. Training, Ray wheezed out. We were training. Oh my god, Enji breathed out. Training? Shoto blinked, looking to his mother who was holding back laughter. She didn't look sad or hurt, and that soothed the little boy's worry. He blinked the tears away, looking to his father. The man had an unfamiliar expression. Enji, with the blanket pooling around his waist, was resting his chin in his hand, elbow leaning against the knee as he stared out blankly into the darkness of his and Ray's bedroom, refusing to look at his wife and son as embarrassment ate him from the inside out. His flames along his cheeks weren't going out. Why are you out of bed? Enji grumbled out. I need the bathroom, Shoto replied innocently not glaring anymore now that he was reassured that his dad wasn't hurting his mum. Angie sighed heavily, looking to her son. Then go, he said, sticking his thumb to their slightly open bedroom door. Shoto stared at him for a moment, as if not completely sure if he should. Shoto, out! Shoto quickly skedaddled out of his parents' bedroom at that. 
Ray burst into a fit of giggles as she flopped back onto her pillow, Angie feeling like he wanted the world to open up and swallow him whole. I'll make sure he goes back to bed. Ray cackled as she blindly searched for her nightgown, laughing again as she heard Angie grumble in response. Mad's gonna be fun when he figures it out in a few years. Angie groaned loudly in despair. Chapter 26 Combustion Shoto heaved and panted as he laid face down in the dirt, feeling like he was going to throw up, while Tenya hopped besides him, adrenaline pumping through his veins. Let's go again, the eater boy said excitedly. The two friends had just run a loop around the playground, Tenya obliterating Shoto and leaving him in the dust. Shoto made a gagging sound in response to Tenya, who only now realised Shoto still hadn't recovered. It's just running. I'm not as fast as you, Shota complained, pushing himself off of the dirt. And you have an engine quirk. Tenya grinned at him, looking mightily proud of himself over that. Just like my parents and brother, he agreed, running on the spot of a determined glint in his eyes. It's why I must train hard and become a hero worthy of my lineage. Shota had noticed Tenya start to talk a lot more like that recently. The pride he had towards his brother Ingenium fueling his desire to follow in his footsteps. It reminded Shota of Toya. So you're becoming a hero just because your family are too? Shota asked, wanting to understand his friend's motivation. Tenya looked at him with raised eyebrows. Yes, but not only, he replied, curious at Shota's wording of the question. It's a lot of hard and important work, and I want to continue that legacy. Legacy? I want to continue my family's efforts. I want to make it last, Tenya elaborated, hands in a chopping motion as he eagerly spoke about his family. I'm proud of what they do, and we need heroes more than ever. I want to do my part. Shota listened, interested, and mirrored his friend's smile as the latter spoke. That's something he appreciated about Tenya. He was always earnest and straightforward about everything, never beating around the bush or feeling embarrassed about his honesty. Very unlike Shota's family, he noticed, who easily got flustered when emotions were the topic. Being with honest Tenya, it made him feel like he could also be honest. I want to be a hero too, he said with soft determination, small hands curling up into little fists. The gentle proclamation caught Tenya by surprise, but his smile never once went away. I want to make people feel the same way All Might makes me feel. So I'll... I'll be there to cheer you on and support you. Shota said the last bit with a slight blush on his face. That Tadoruki embarrassment getting to him, but he pushed through it. Tenya's smile widened and he nodded enthusiastically. While he knew Shoto to be an absolute menace, there was still a shyness in the boy that Tenya knew made him keep his feelings close to his chest. Having him say outright what he wanted, it made him happy. Me too! Let's work hard together! The older boy exclaimed happily, raising a fist to the air, Shoto awkwardly mirroring the motions of a little, yeah! Shota bounced happily beside his mother on the couch as he watched TV, holding onto his All Might plush tightly. Ray was stroking the red of his hair tenderly as they watched the screen together, with Natsu, Fuyumi, and Toya sitting at the coffee table and doing a task their mother had set for them. Shota had been given written work to do too, but had been allowed to take a break so that he could watch the special interview of All Might in honour of the anniversary of an event we had saved countless people. Yes, that's right. Children do often inherit quirks from their parents, or develop similar power sets. But the most important thing to remember is that a quirk is what you make of it, regardless of your history. All Might, in his yellow suit, stated in the interview on the TV screen, shining a big smile. At his favourite hero's words, Shoto glanced at his own two hands. He had both fire and ice, both his father and mother's quirk, unlike his siblings who had either one or the other. Shota wasn't sure what that meant for him. He knew of the dangers of overheating and frostbite. Would having both make it worse for him? He'd ask his father later about it. He knew Toya used to train his quirk with the man, so maybe he'd have some advice for the youngest boy. You decide how you use it. That's what I mean when I say, I am here. Only you can decide to become a hero. No one else. All Might on the screen continued with a big thumbs up at the camera. In contrast to his youngest brother, Toya was glaring a side eye at the screen. Easy for you to say, he grumpled deep in his voice, pressing a little too hard on the paper that his pencil threatened to snap. Natsu and Fumi gave him a concerned look, having just barely caught what he said. 
As the program ended, Ray stood to leave for the kitchen to make them some snacks, Fiumi following after her to help, since she was finished with her task. Shota hopped off of the couch and sat beside Natsuo, looking up at him. Natsuo, you want to become a hero, right? The little boy asked. Hmm? Natsuo paused his writing, looking at his baby brother. Hmm, maybe, I don't know yet, he said thoughtfully, before looking at the All Might plush and back up to Shoto with a grin. What do you want to? Mmm. Shoto's cheeks blushed a bit as he squished his All Might plush. Yes. I like how All Might can put people at ease. I want to do that too, he murmured, a bit embarrassed at sharing his thoughts despite having been able to share them with Tenya. But he felt like he could happily tell Natsuo. He saw him and Toyo speaking often, and he found Natsuo's smile was warm and comforting. His big brother grinned at him. I want to help people too, like Gangwalka, Natsuo replied, ruffling Shota's hair a little. The two didn't notice the dark look from the eldest brother at the other end of the table. Enji was putting back the various weights he, Ray, and Toya had used today for their training session. Toya would soon be able to start using the bars, what with his groat spurts helping him pack on more muscle. Ray and Toya were currently showering while Haro took charge of dinner. He was currently lost in his thoughts. It was Ray's birthday soon, and he was thinking of how to take New Year's Eve off to celebrate her with his family. Dad? A little voice caught his attention. Looking to the entrance of the training room, he saw Shoto looking in shyly. What is it, Shoto? He asked, the weight he put back on the racks making a clinking sound. Shoto stepped into the room, feeling the tatami floor under his feet and looking around curiously. This room was unfamiliar to him. He just knew it as the room Toy trained with their parents in. Fiddling with his hands and with a little blush in his face, he reproached his towering father. Can I be a hero? He asked. Everything froze for Enji. It wasn't Shoto in front of him. It was Toya, looking up at him with a bright, hopeful grin, sparking blue eyes and with a full head of red hair. The memory of his little boy before he unintentionally shattered his dreams. He couldn't go through that again. Why do you ask? Enji said carefully, kneeling down on one knee to be at Shoto's level. The little boy looked up at him with his mismatching eyes. He didn't feel intimidated by his father these days as he had before, now looking forward to their monthly days out together. Mostly because it meant he got a new All Might merch, but his father's company was nice too. Natsu and I talked about it, Shoto explained, feeling a little bit more confident. But I have both fire and ice. Toyo's fire burns him, and Natsu's ice can make him too cold. Does that mean I can't use mine? Discussion of quirks wasn't really a topic inside the Todoroki household, mainly for Toya's well-being, but Chota and Tenya always talked about it. Tenya was proud of his family's quirk and spoke extensively on how he could improve his abilities, while Shoto hadn't ever activated his quirk since he was a baby. Actually, it's the opposite, Enji said after a moment of consideration, extending his hands to his boy. Shota did the same, letting his father hold his much smaller hands in his larger ones. I overheat, and Natsu can get frostbite. But you have both fire and ice, which means you can balance it out. You don't have the physical limits we do. He looked down at his son's small hands, then back to his grey and blue eyes. The little boy looking at him hopefully. And she desperately hoped he could nurture that hope, instead of destroying it. Natsu isn't sure yet... But I am. I want to be a hero, Shoto said with a little more firmness and confidence in his voice, smiling at his dad. Enji squashed the nagging voice away before it had a chance to make a comment on Shoto's quirk being powerful enough to overtake All Might. That's not why he should be proud. Enji was proud that Shoto could come to this decision on his own, with his own inspiration and motive. He knew that he looked up to All Might, a man who was like a brother to Enji, and that in itself was enough to be proud of. I can help you with that, Angie said with a tender smile, the ones Shota liked so much. Toya grit his teeth to the point of pain, fingers digging into the soft towel he was using to dry his dripping white hair, staying hidden away around the corner as he accidentally overheard his father and brother. It's not fair. Shota yawned softly as he rubbed his eyes. 
It was still early in the morning, but he knew his dad had already gone to work by that time. He shuffled out of bed and softly walked into the hallway, looking into the darkness. He could hear somebody in the kitchen and decided to go see who it was. With the soft patter of his footsteps, Shoto yawned again and rubbed his eyes further, the sound of the kettle becoming clearer as he turned the corner to the kitchen. Yes, mum, they look more like him every day, he heard his mother's voice say, sounding peppy. Even Shota's left side looks just like him. It's his blue eyes. I think they're beautiful. Although, her voice lowered. I feel helpless that Haro seems shaken by Natsu looking so much like Enji. We have talked a little about it, but these Todoroki men, they're so private with their thoughts. It's hard to understand them sometimes. The sound of the kettle got louder, the whistling becoming sharper as the water got to its boiling point. Mummy? Shota asked meekly as he peeked into the kitchen. Ray turned to him and her eyes warmed at seeing her little five-year-old son. She smiled at him and made a come here motion with her free hand, the other holding the phone she was speaking to her mother on. As Shoto pitter-pattered in to join her, Ray picked up the kettle with one hand easily and poured the boiling water into a teapot. Placing it back on the stove, she turned it off with a click and crouched down to Shota's level, smiling at him. Your grandma's on the phone, Peppermint. Do you want to say hello? She offered sweetly. Shota nodded, not because he really wanted to, but because his mum he loved so much was making the offer. He took the device into his hands and pressed it against his left ear. Hello, he greeted Charlie. He didn't see his mother's parents often, but he liked his grandmother enough. Shoto, hello dear, the old woman said happily from the other line. Ray stood back up as she resumed preparing breakfast. It was late December now, and Enji was working hard at the agency to give some time off to her psychics. That's something she found admirable in her husband, that he made such efforts for his staff. Although she did miss him when he wasn't around as much. Good morning, Ray. Harrow yawned softly as he entered the kitchen, rubbing his eyes. Good morning, she replied peppily, slipping the final omelette she was making onto the plate. Toy preferred plain omelettes, while Fuyumi and Natsu liked theirs topped with salmon flakes. Shoto didn't have a preference yet. Anything I can help with? Could you set the tea and food on the table? The kids will be up soon. Harrow did as he was asked, ruffling Shota's hair gently as the little boy spoke to his grandmother on the phone, and carefully placing the hot tea on the table. Mummy, Grandma wants to say goodbye, Shoto informed, offering the phone back up to his mother. When she took it back with a thank you, Shoto made his way to the kitchen table, and struggled onto the chair beside his grandfather, smiling up at the soft-faced man. Hi, Grandpa. Hey, Shoto. Sleep well, the older man smiled to his youngest grandchild warmly, setting his breakfast in front of him and pouring himself some fresh hot tea. Shota nodded at the question and grabbed his little chopsticks. Ray soon joined them at the table when she had ended the call with her mother, thanking Hara for pouring her a cup of tea, sipping the hot drink. Mummy, can I see Tanya again soon? Chota asked, bouncing a little in his seat as he munched on a piece of omelette. He wanted to talk again about them becoming heroes and their plans for the future. Also, he wanted to hear more about Ingenium. He liked seeing his friends so happy and excited at getting to talk about his older brother. Of course. Your birthday's in a couple weeks, so we can organise something for that. Are you mad at me? Natsu asked Toya worriedly. It was late at night, and the roles were reversed. Natsu was the one keeping Toya up. But he felt like he had to. Toya had been in a grumpy mood this whole week, even during their mother's birthday, and had barely spoken to him. It worried the younger boy. No. Toya grumbled out, but he didn't turn over to look at his little brother. Are you mad at Shoto? The silence after the question told Natsu he was. Why? He sat up, looking at his brother's white hair. More silence. Is it because he wants to be a hero? You ever considered going to sleep? Toya growled out, glaring at Natsuo. Says you, the latter retorted, remembering the many nights Toya had denied him. Come on, talk to me. Toya sighed dramatically at his brother's insistence, but sat up to see him better. It's just not fair. Why can Shoto be a hero, but not me? He asked, pouting. Natsu raised an eyebrow at that. You totally can become a hero, but not one like Dad, he 
he replied, crossing his arms in a very NG-like fashion. I know you think what Ed shot and Best Gina said was stupid, but they're right. I get it already, Toya snapped, glaring. I heard it the first thousand times you've told me, yet you keep repeating yourself. Because you're not getting it through your thick skull, Natsuo pushed back, poking at his brother's forehead who grumbled. If you want to become a hero, you could. Just like All Might said on TV, it's what you make of it. Use your cold resistance for something. And what, save idiots getting lost in the mountains? He knew Natsuo was actually thinking of this route as a real option. The boy had started looking into the statistics and research of disappearances and accidents in the mountains, where nobody could get to victims in time due to the snow and cold. Yes, Natsuo replied bluntly with no shame. He could argue with Toya honestly, for two boys having a tight bond where neither felt like the other was judging them, even if they disagreed on something. We could work together, be a duo. Plus, if we're at the mountains, we could try skiing and... He stopped suddenly when he heard Toya sigh loudly, looking away and disinterested. That hurt Natsu a little, feeling sad that his brother wasn't enthusiastic like him at the idea of working together. Then a twinge of anger and frustration. No matter what he tried to say or do, Toya just never accepted the help. Fine, whatever. He flopped back onto his futon and rolled over, back facing Toya. The reaction left the older boy confused, staring at his brother with raised eyebrows. Natsuo? I'm going to sleep. But... You told me to consider going to sleep. I'm sleeping. The cold, sharp interruptions shook Toya a little, and he wondered what he had done or said to make Natsuo's move shift like it did. Not understanding, Toya only felt bitter frustration. Whatever, he hissed, and he too flopped back onto his futon and rolled over. Endeavour was seen earlier today taking down a group of villains terrorising the city centre. Endeavour has been taking on most, if not all, calls for help this month. The holiday seasons always have a heightened crime rate. Where's Dad? Toya asked his mother as she passed by the living room, never once looking away from the news report on the TV screen. He knew his father was somewhere in the house. He's checking on the koi pond with your grandfather, his mother replied with a smile to her eldest before turning the corner down the hallway planning on getting dinner ready. Because it was just after New Year, the sky outside was already getting darker, despite it only about six in the evening. The sky was an inky blue, while the buildings in nature were pitch black. The children were all in the living room. Although, uncharacteristically, Natsuo and Toya weren't sitting next to each other. Toya was on the couch with Shoto, while Fuyumi and Natsuo were doing a puzzle on the coffee table. Shoto watched the news with a serious look, trying to find his father in Endeavor's face. It looked like him, but the sternness and sharp edges of his face looked foreign, the angry grit of his teeth as he easily took down villains, making Shoto feel small. What's wrong, Shoto? Fumi asked, seeing her baby brother's stern expression, mirroring endeavors. I still don't like his face, the boy replied, looking to his sister. She remembered their conversation from when Shoto was only just a toddler and smiled sweetly at him. I didn't like Endeavor's face neither when I was little. I don't mind it now. That's because you're a wuss, Toya commented without looking away. That made the two middle siblings scowl at him. Endeavor's awesome, Toya said with a bright grin as he completely ignored his siblings' looks, watching his father's health limb in action. No matter how many clips he saw, no matter how much he familiarized himself with Endeavor's moves, seeing him on screen always brought an excited giddiness to the boy. He's got the record for the most solved cases in history, and he has such perfect control of his fire that he never causes accidental collateral damage. The almost 14-year-old rattled on. Yeah, he's an amazing hero, but that doesn't mean he can insult people when they say he looks scary. Natsuo argued, crossing his arms as he sat back, abandoning the puzzle. He got a glare from Toya. The two hadn't made up yet from the previous night. Mummy says that it's his focusing face. Shota piped up innocently, not noticing the tension between his brothers. Natsuo has the same face when he does homework, Fumi giggled, gaining an embarrassed pat from the white-haired boy. It's unavoidable. You and Dad look almost identical. At least Endeavor doesn't have a dead fish stare like you, Shoto. Toyo grumbled, crossing his arms and slouching. Shoto blinked at the insult, not really hurt, but not liking the comparison anyway. Dead fish look weird. Toya! Fumi snapped accusingly. 
Shoto, don't listen to him. You don't have a dead fish there. Stop babying him, Fuyu. He can take a jab. Toya rolled his eyes at his sister's protective nature. He's only five. He's already five. The anger in Toya's voice made the three other siblings freeze. I was quirk training of dad younger than that. You're really telling me he can't deal with an insult? Fumi stared at him with disbelief, not understanding why he was so angry all of a sudden. Doesn't matter how old he is. You didn't like getting insulted by bullies. Shoto shouldn't have to deal with you insulting him. You're too mean sometimes. Natsu said in her stead, voice slow and stern. Toy moved his eyes from Fumi to Natsu, then back again, before glaring at Shoto. Why were they ganging up on him? Couldn't someone stand in his corner for once instead of making him seem like the problem? First the adult stopping his quirk training, then his bullies because of things outside of his control, and now his siblings because precious little Shoto was getting teased. It was infuriating. Is it true? You can't take a small insult? Toya asked Shoto accusingly, his glare intensifying to the point it started to scare the smaller boy. Is the little masterpiece sensitive? He saw confusion in the boy's eyes as he said those words, and that only pissed Toya off even more. Shota had everything, and he didn't even know it. Things he could take for granted were things Toya would kill to get. Even if you start quirk training with dad, you'll never beat me. His voice came out as a hiss. But I'm not trying to, Shota said carefully, confused at the randomness of Toya's words. He didn't understand any of this didn't understand how Toya's thoughts linked and connected and accused. You don't even know how to use your quirk. You don't know how it works. I do, Toya continued, the ferocity in his blue eyes making Shota inch away from him, the almost six-year-old getting scared. Especially when Toya extended a hand and summoned a small orange flame in the palm of his hands. After a couple flickers, it turned blue, and the change in temperature made Shota wince. Toya knew his fire and his emotions were connected, and he used his irritation against his baby brother to fuel the blue flickering flame in his palm. Just barely controlled, looking like Harris candlelight. Despite that, Toy could already feel the familiar stinging pain of his palm burning. Mom! Fumi cried, not knowing what else to do as a manic look entered her brother's eyes. She had been her parents' little spy in school, and she'd continue to be their little spy of her siblings if they did anything stupid. And right now, Toy was being more than just stupid. He was being cruel. Toy is scaring Shoto of his quirk! Toy's eyes snapped at her, growling out, snitch, as they heard Ray's footsteps quickly approaching. But he didn't snuff out his flame, wanting to make a point against Shoto, and honestly, his whole family. He knew his father was proud of him, but the way he was treated versus how Shoto got praised in his eyes by his family drove him up the wall. Toya? Ray said, panic in her voice as she saw the blue flames. Angie had told her about the colour change, but actually seeing the fire in her home, so close to her children, it frightened her. Not to mention the angry look in Toya's eyes. What are you doing? I'm just showing Shota what I can do. It's not a big deal, Toya argued, frowning at his mother. Shota had a scared, wide-eyed look, staring at the blue flame intensely. That's dangerous. Remember what your father said. Ray stepped into the room, knowing that both Harrow and Enji would disapprove of Toya playing with his fire like this, especially to torment his brother. Anger built up in his chest. Remember which part? He yelled, glaring at the white-haired woman. The part where he told me to how to control my quirk? Which I can. Or the part where he told me I could be stronger than him? Don't tell me what to do. The flame flickered angrily. Toya, listen. I didn't see you turning off Natsuo and he used frost all the time as a baby. And you didn't tell Shota off when he burnt Uncle Toshi's hair. I bet if he did that now, you'd praise him. Blue started to intensify in his palm, too close to Shota's face. Toya, careful. You don't know how lucky you are. Toya's murderous fury glared at the five-year-old boy as his screamed accusation pissed his ears. Toya! Shota heard his mother scream as blue flames blinded his vision the impact of his body hitting the ground before the heat reached him, instantly overpowering the hint of frosty ice in the air. More screams erupted, deafening his small, confused mind. A single flame can cause a house fire. Chapter 27 Cinders 
Out in the darkness of the courtyard, where the sky was an inky blue and small stars were starting to appear, only Harrow's candlelight quirk illuminated the surroundings as C and NG checked on the koi pond. All good, NG replied after checking the temperature water and the state of the fish. Next, we can... A terrified scream screeched through the air. Toya. Harrow's light went out in shock. NG was on his feet, wide-eyed as he stared at the house. The scream was followed by cries, the children's voices mixing and mashing together into an undecipherable cacophony. Both men were frozen. Surely, Shota had just bitten Toya again and the kids were arguing about it. Surely, that's all it was. Please be that's all it was. Dad! Nato screamed, Fiumi's wails becoming all the clearer. Enji sprinted forward so suddenly he almost slipped on the stones, leaving behind a horrified Harrow who couldn't move a muscle. Panic started to rise in Enji's chest, heart beat fast and a cold sweat pricking at his neck. Natsu doesn't scream like that, for Yumi doesn't wail. He skidded in the hallway, still wearing his outdoor shoes and leaving a small trail of dirt down the usually clean wood and caught himself on the doorframe of the living room. The fire user's blood ran cold. Fiumi and Natsu were huddled in the corner, crying hysterically as they encased Shoto, who was invisible to Enji, the little boy being hidden in Natsu's chest as Fiumi held them both close to her. They were covered by the girl's ice, which spread onto the floor and walls. Her blue eyes shimmered in horror, staring at the scene before them. Toya had never stopped screaming. No. He had never stopped begging. Stop! 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 Please stop! Mom, I'm sorry! The teen cried, tears rolling down his cheeks as blue flames flickered in the air and over his mother's body that was collapsed against the couch, its fabric dangerously littered with those same harmful blazes. Through the roaring sound of the flames that were barely being kept from spreading by the far weaker eye stubbornly trying to keep it to the one location, Ray could be heard, barely conscious. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, she kept repeating like a mantra as Toy desperately tried killing the flames that were threatening to injure her further but his emotions were engulfing him completely that it only manifested more, unable to keep his emotions in as he became burnt in turn. NG ran forward, ignoring the searing heat of the blue flames. He could tolerate it. Ray and Toya could not. He couldn't see his wife's face as she was face down in her own ice. That was the only reason the whole room wasn't inflamed. Dad, it's too hot! My flames won't stop! Toya cried, his tears evaporating upon impact of his overheating, fragile skin. Angie could see that his child's emotions were tearing him up from the inside, and forcefully pulled his son away from any surface, bringing him into his arms, even though the child still tried to cling onto his unmoving mother's body. Angie wanted to check on Ray desperately, but if Toya didn't calm down, he'd just create more fire. Control them, Toya, please! Angie begged in turn, his voice unable to hide the panic he was feeling. Remember our training! Please, remember! As he yelled in desperation, he was pulling Ray away from the blue fire, eating away at the fabric of the couch. The woman limp and barely conscious as she kept on making more and more ice to stop the flames. Toya hiccuped and sobbed, nodding violently as he shook and trembled against his father's arm, singeing his sleeve. Fast footsteps hurried in the room, and from the corner of his eyes, Angie saw his father, once again frozen in the doorway as he saw the terrible scene in front of him. His blue eyes were illuminated by the azure fire. His body couldn't move. His mind was blank and he didn't know what to do. Dad! Engie's begging cry snapped him out of his petrified state and his eyes landed on the face of his 13-year-old son who had seen him crushed by a building and almost dying. A face he had never wanted to see again. Help me! Do something! Get the kids out of here! The room was thick with smoke, making it hard to breathe. And through their crying, the three youngest Todoroki children were coughing and hiccuping. Hara's body moved without his brain reacting, running to the other side of the room to grab the children and awkwardly carry them out of the house, away from the danger. Enji aggressively stamped out the blue flames the remaining ice wasn't able to keep in. The couch and connected surfaces were a mixture of burnt and damp, thick black smoke along the ceiling spilling into the crevices of the walls and textures of the carpet, the smell of bitter burning becoming unbreathable despite the fire being put out. Kuramada! NG hollered as he held his hysterically sobbing son and unconscious wife close to his chest, her body continuously generating ice and self-defense. Toya was wailing into his father's shoulder from the pain of his burns and of what he'd done, 
desperately trying to call back his flames flickering along his hair as much as possible, even though his emotions were wild in his chest. Kurumada had been on standby and waiting by his car. The man's eyes wide and confused as he saw his boss running towards him with his son and wife in his arms. He had never seen Enji like this, frantic and not in control. Hospital, as fast as you can! Enji ordered forcefully. Kuramada opened the back door of this car without question and slammed it when his wounded passengers got in. Haru was panting, wide-eyed and panicking as he heard Kuramada's car screeching out into the street and barreling away with a terrifying sound that was bound to get the surroundings' attention. He had run to the corner of the garden, close to Ray's autumn bell flowers that had started to wilt due to the weather changing. Against his chest, Fuyumi and Natsu were sobbing. Shota's eyes wide of unshed tears as his body shook. He was in shock. Harrow didn't know what to do. Pick up, pick up, pick up, please. Hey, Angie. Toshinori, I'm on the way to the hospital. Toya and Ray are critically burned and I left dad alone with the kids, but I don't know if they're safe. I need you to go look after them, please. I don't know what to do. I- Angie! Toshinori cut through the man's hysteria. The blonde man could hear Angie's heavy panting as his belly kept in panic, rattled his breathing. I am here, okay, Angie? I am. I'm going to Harrow and the kids. You look after Ray and Toya. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Because right now, with Toya and Ray both limp against him, one sobbing frantically and the other unconscious with who knows how many burns, it was anything but okay. Toshino had dropped everything that he was doing to get to the Todoroki household as fast as he could. So much so, it threatened to reveal his identity as All Might as he barreled through the skies. Thankfully, he had been wearing civilian clothing at the time, so when he ran into the suspiciously open gates of the Todoroki home, he just looked like Uncle Toshi. Haro! he called out, sweating from panic, not the effort of getting here. Fuyu! Natsu! Shoto! Toshinari! Haro's meek, broken voice came from somewhere in the darkness of the garden. Toshinari ran towards the small huddled group. Toshinari ran towards the small huddled group, the children having stopped crying but still terrified. Are any of you hurt? His seven-foot frame crouched beside them, eyes looking for any wounds, burns or scrapes, but saw nothing. Harrow shook his head weakly, chest rising and falling unevenly. Hey, 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 breathe, I'm here, he said as softly as he could muster, smiling at the man reassuringly despite his own building worry. He didn't feel like All Might right now. I called firefighters on the way, they'll arrive soon. He peeled little Shoto off of Harrow's chest, bringing him against his shoulder, and cradling Natsu in his other arm. In the arms of his giant uncle, the tall boy looked like the age he was. Nine years old. A nine-year-old who had seen his brother burst into flames and nearly kill his mother. Fumi stayed plastered against her grandfather, shoulders shaking. He felt like an uncle comforting his father, niece and nephews. I am here. At those words, Shoto's emotions finally caught up to him. He burst into tears. Go with Toya. Ray had told him that as she was rapidly taken away by doctors. So he did. Her voice had been small and whispery, body covered in ice, especially over her face that he'd barely gotten to see before she was taken away. Enji hadn't been allowed into Toya's room until he was completely bandaged up. He stood in front of the door, staring blankly and unmoving as cold creeped up his limbs and settled heavily in his chest. Everything had happened so fast. And now that he was alone and at a standstill, it was all catching up to him. He felt empty. After what could have been 10 minutes or 10 hours, a doctor, roughly his own age, stepped out of the room and looked at him with kind, reassuring eyes. He's asleep. He's hurt, but he'll recover physically, she said calmly, approaching the much taller man. There's much we'll need to discuss, but for now, go be with him. I'll look after your wife. Enji didn't need to be told twice before silently stepping into his son's hospital room. The door shut behind him and his eyes landed on the sleeping, bandaged form of his boy. There was an IV drip connected to his arm and an oxygen mask on his mouth and nose. His skin around his eyes were red and sore from crying and a suffering expression was on his face despite all the sedatives that helped him sleep. Enji swallowed thickly as he went to stand by his child, looking down at the white-haired boy. 
His eyes burned with an unfamiliar stinging feeling, and he reached out and laid a hand on Toya's head, gently caressing his thick, white hair. It hurt seeing him connected to wires in a hospital again. He'd been so small when he was born. In Engie's eyes, he still was small, his little first-born child, to whom he believed he had failed to show how loved he was. Engie's back and shoulders shook as he hunched over the side of his son's hospital bed, a hand over his eyes as he tried to keep himself from breaking down. Chapter 28. Embers. Chio Suzenji had been a recovery girl for many decades now, and had worked at UA for just as long. She'd seen many students come and go, and had healed many injuries and wounds. Out of all these students, she had never met someone quite as stubborn as Enji Todoroki. In his first year at UA, his visits had been so frequent from him overworking his body that she had banned him from using the training grounds after school hours. Even then, he had found a workaround until his father had settled a compromise and managed to drive some sense into his teen son. Recovery Girl remembers Enju with fond exasperation. With a confident attitude and his hard-working mindset, his stubbornness and teen pride was the one thing that made her want to knock him on the head with her cane. She had seen Enji hurt from overusing his quirk, serious in his classes and competitive against his classmates but never once had she seen him tearing at the seams like this. Seeing the strong boy that had grown into an even stronger man on the verge of a breakdown by his sleeping bandaged son's bed, it was a painful sight. Toshinori had called her about what happened. Kuramada had picked her up and driven her to the hospital. She didn't know the man, but his silence was so intense that she knew this was uncharacteristic for the moustache chauffeur. Enji's eyes lifted. Turmoiled blue mixing with confusion upon seeing the old woman. Recovery girl? he asked shakily, removing his head from his hands. What? what are you doing here? Toshinari called, she said, walking alongside the same kind doctor that Enji had met previously. He gave me a rundown of what happened. She looked at the sleeping young teen. Poor child. Toya's arms, throat and torso were bandaged, with more plasters on his face. Despite the pained expression on his face, everything was level, he was breathing well and his burns would heal eventually with little to no scarring. That's where Recovery Girl came in. She gave the boy a smooch on the cheek, using her quirk on him to heal his body better and faster. Thank you, and she said softly, looking exhausted. He hadn't slept throughout the entirety of the night, and now it was mid-morning. You should have called me, Engie boy. You're alumni, after all. I'm here to help. The old woman scorned lightly, the way she used to tell him off back in his teens. I'll be going to help your wife now. You should rest. Engie looked at the kind doctor, his sleep-deprived eyes silently desperate. Right, is she going to be okay? He asked in his uncharacteristic soft voice. His chest and eyes hurt, and even though his body wasn't trembling, he felt like his bones were shaking. She'll recover too, however... She sighed, looking at her notes. I worry there may be some significant scarring even Recovery Girl can't heal. I'll see what I can do, the older woman said as she made her way out of the hospital room, followed by the doctor. Something about her was strangely familiar, but Angie couldn't place it. His tired mind too focused on Toya and the situation to care about anything else. Mm, Dad? Enji's head snapped to Toya, whose blue eyes were struggling to blink open, sore and red from both the tears and the heat of his own flames. I'm here, he said hurriedly, leaning over the side of the bed to his confused child. Slowly, the previous night's events recollected in his mind, and fresh tears welled up in his eyes. Shoto's scared, tearful eyes as Toya lost control of his emotions and flames, his mother throwing Shoto out of the way as the initial blast hit her directly in the side of her face. Natsu and Fuyumi screams of terror, his father begging, and worst of all, the sight of his terrified siblings huddling in a corner, covered with their own ice, as they looked at him with nothing but fear. Fuyumi's tear-streaked face while Natsu had his arms around Shoto, curling away from the fire, being the last scene he remembered of the previous night. I'm sorry, he hiccuped, tears dripping down his face. I'm sorry, I hurt mum again, I didn't mean to, I... He was finding it hard to breathe, his breaths getting stuck in his chest. I know, I know, Angie shushed, 
bringing one hand to cradle his head and another to rest on the small heaving chest, his warm hands comforting Toya, the home he knew. It's, it's going to be okay. You and your mum are going to be okay. For Toya's sake, he truly had to believe Toshinori's words. I, I made, I made them cry, Toya sniffled, leaning his head into his father's touch. They're scared of me. They're going to hate me. Grandpa and mum and you too. No, no, we would never. Your mum and I could never hate you. Enji was getting choked up, hating that his son thought that his family would so quickly turn on him. We love you. We don't say it enough. I'm sorry. We love you. Toya hiccuped and sniffed, blue eyes blinking through the tears to look at his father. His chest hurt and it felt like his heart was going to explode from the intensity of the pain, like his emotions were threatening to rip him to shreds. You, you used... He took a deep breath with the tears. You used to call me Candle... Candlelight. Am I... Can I still be that? His tears dripped against the pillow as he turned as much as he could to face his father, his big blue eyes looking like pools of deep waters of all the tears they were shedding. Always. You'll always be my candlelight. A little firecracker. And she replied in a hushed voice, trying to stop himself from crying as well, even though his emotions felt like they'd strangle him. He and Toya weren't so different. In fact, they were near identical. Call me that again, Toya begged out a sob. Candlelight, Enji obliged, bringing his forehead against his 13-year-old son's, closing his eyes as he let out a shaky breath. His little boy was warm, breathing and crying and talking and alive. Alive in his hands, like he had been 13 years ago, back when he fit in his palm. I love you, Candlelight. Toya sobbed. I love you too, Papa. Ray couldn't see from her left side. And that was because of the bandages covering her eye. Thankfully, your eye is fine, the doctor said, sitting on her right side with a recovery girl. But unfortunately, you will have a scar. Your son's fire burning your skin in combination with your eyes means that that area is permanently damaged. My quirk was able to lessen the scarring, but the initial damage was just too serious. I'm sorry, Ray. Recovery girl added with a sigh. Please, don't be. Thank you for coming to help us. Ray's voice was a hoarse whisper, slightly damaged by the heat and smoke of Toya's fire. She'd recover from that too, eventually. When Toshinori called me, I knew it was a serious matter. Anything for my alumni. The elderly woman smiled to the younger one. Ray looked tired, but despite the stress of the previous traumatic night and her injury, she still had a sweet smile on. The first thing she had asked when she awoke was how Toya was. As soon as she'd been told he'd recover too, Ray had been at peace. A soft knock from the door caught the three women's attention, and they looked up to Enji. It was now late evening, so he'd managed to rest a little with Toya throughout the day. The boy was sleeping deeply already, and Enji had been told Ray was finally awake. He had felt nervous and stressed all day about not being able to see her yet. Ray, he sighed, relieved to see her smile eyes lingering on her bandaged face for a moment, but returning to look at her fully. His wife smiled at him and she reached out for her husband from where she was sitting in her bed. Without needing to be asked, Enji quickly was by her side, taking her hand into his as he carefully touched her cheek with the other. Are you okay? There's going to be scarring, but I'll live. Enji hated how rough Ray's voice sounded, and he could only nod at her response, otherwise a sob might escape. Mr. Todoroki, Mrs. Todoroki, I won't push the subject until you've all recovered more, but I think you should really think about getting Toya professional help. The kind doctor spoke, getting the parents' attention. From what I understand of his records, Toya has refused to go to the doctor since he was told the news of his quirk calming him. The parents nodded, looking and feeling guilty about not being able to convince their son to be properly looked after. If he doesn't get the help he needs, this could only get worse. I... I know there's still a huge stigma against mental health in this country, but... Anything, Enji interrupted. Anything he needs, anything that will help him, please. He let out a shuddering sigh, feeling useless. Please. As always, Enji didn't have the words. The doctor smiled. Honestly, she was relieved that Toya's parents cared about his well-being. She didn't know much about the boy or his family, but she'll ask Enji later to give her a full rundown of their history so she can help them better. Very well. We'll discuss this later. 
She stood up. You can remove the bandages tomorrow, dear, recovery girl instructed. I'll be back to check on you and Toya anyway, since I know Toshinori will worry. Thank you, recovery girl, Ray said sweetly as the old woman left. Angie was silent. Angie, he looked at her with anguished blue eyes. I'm okay. His eyes were burning again. Gently, carefully, he leaned to give his wife a kiss on the forehead before hugging her. His massive form hid her away from the world completely, and Ray happily welcomed the affection, sighing contently against his chest. Toshinori is with Dad and the kids, Angie muttered. Good, his wife whispered back, eyes closed as she reveled in his calming warmth. I love you. That took Ray by surprise. Not because she ever doubted that, simply because Angie struggled with wording his feelings. Something she understood and found endearing. She grinned, as if they hadn't been married for a decade. I love you too. The following morning, Ray touched her new scar. It covered the left side of her face, from her temple down to her jaw, and spread halfway over her eye. Thanks to Recovery Girl's healing, it was a lot less bad than it could have been, but it was still something that hadn't been there before. The mismatching part felt sensitive and strange under her fingertips. She suddenly felt insecure. NG, she started quietly, catching her husband's attention who was pouring her tea. Do you find it ugly? No, NG replied bluntly. Are you sure? Yes. The reply was just as blunt. A smile tugged at Ray's face as she tried not to laugh, her insecurities already fluttering away. Nothing about you could ever be ugly. A blush spread over her cheeks as she looked away from her husband with a laugh. I'm serious. Her husband assisted, worried she didn't believe him. Truly, he didn't find her scar ugly. She had gotten it protecting her children, the three youngest from the flame and the eldest from himself. There was nothing ugly about that. I know you are, Ray said of laughter in her voice. Angie exhaled softly, giving her the tea so she could sip it carefully. Toy's going to be sad about seeing it. Seeing the scar he caused, intentionally or not. He will. Angie agreed. Are you sure you're okay to stand? It's only been a day. Angie, I'm fine. Recovery girl really helped me. I feel energized, if anything. She smiled at him, even though he had a worried look on his face. Not one most would be able to pinpoint, but Ray had learned a long time ago how to read Angie. I'm more worried about the kids in Harrow. Toshinori says they're as okay as they can be, Angie replied, remembering the text he got. Firefighters came to check out the scene. We're going to need to refurbish the living room. The kids all slept in Toya Natsuru's room last night. Dad is... It's reminding him of his own accident. A pained look washed over Ray. Oh no, she said softly. What the doctor said. Maybe we should consider it for Hara and the kids too. And you. Ng blinked. Me? He asked, confused. Yes, you. After all you've been through with your father, being a hero and with Toya, don't you think you'd benefit from a therapist? Angie hated the idea with a passion. It's one thing to get Toya the help he needed, but for himself? He just needed to work and be with his family. He didn't need or want anything else. The grumpiness of his face showed that he disliked the idea. Ray sighed. It's just a thought. You didn't mention yourself, Angie pointed out. It was his turn to get a confused look from his spouse. You mentioned the kids, my dad and I, but not yourself. Wouldn't you benefit from help too? With her childhood, Toya's traumatic birth and everything they'd been through together with her little family, including Ray blaming herself for things that weren't her fault, Angie believed Ray could do with help he couldn't provide. Maybe, Ray pouted, not liking the tables being turned on her, even though Angie was right. <laughs> We're such a mess. She laughed lightly. Angie gave her a small, exasperated smile. They are a mess, but they're a much-loved mess. Ew! Gross! Toy did not like getting smooched by the old woman he didn't recognize, despite his father telling him she was recovery girl from UA, and it was with large protests and gagging that he wiped aggressively at his cheek. Stop fussing, it's only my quirk, recovery girl said lightly. Not the worst reaction she had witnessed in her time. 
Looking at the grossed out boy with less bandages than he had yesterday, she let out a small chuckle. This was reminding her of Enji when he was in UA. But she kept that to herself. Toshinori had given her a rough idea of the Todoroki's problem, best not compare Toyo to his father too much in this fragile state. It's still gross, Toyo whined, but felt his body getting stronger as his recovery was sped up. He flexed his hands out and let out a heavy sigh. It's a good thing your father trained you to control your flames. If you had any less control, your flames would have completely engulfed you, Recovery Girl said while offering the boy a piece of candy. Despite the intense side eye he was shooting at her, he accepted the candy and munched it. I hurt my mum, he whispered out, and I would have hurt my little brother if she hadn't pushed him out of the way. He felt his chest get tight again, shame and guilt building up. Snuffing out my flames is the first thing Dad taught me, and I wasn't even able to do that. I let my emotions go wild. Tears started to well up in his eyes again. He had been so proud of making the connection between his fire and emotions, but had forgotten his father's first teaching. What's wrong with me? A sniffle escaped him before he realised he was crying again, and desperately tried to wipe away the tears, wetting the bandages on his arms. Always with these damn tears. And gentle hand patted his head. Toya saw Recovery Girl's short form on the tall stool she was standing on, making an effort to pet his hair. You are 13, almost 14 years old. Your emotions naturally will be wilder. That's a part of growing up. Going through the all awkward phases, stumbling and making mistakes. That's okay. That's not a sin, the older woman said kindly. She saw teenagers every day. She had been one many years ago, and in her old age had gained quite a lot of experience. What has happened, happened. You can't change that. What's important now is what you're going to do about it. Do about it? Toy repeated his murmur, feeling the tears clinging to his lower lashes. In his mind, he saw Shoto staring at him in wide-eyed terror as his blue flames burst out of control his mother grabbing the littlest boy and throwing him out of danger's way, taking the hit instead. He saw Natsu grabbing Shoto and keeping him close to his chest, Fuyumi dragging them to the corner as the fire threatened to spread, using her eyes to protect them best she could. He hears his mother's weakened voice reassuring him that it's fine, she's fine, even though she's clearly not. He hears his father begging for him to control his flames, calling out to his own father in desperation to help. He remembered the car ride to the hospital, sobbing into his father's warm shoulder, the blistering pain racking through his body as the horror of his own actions destroyed him. He'd done so much hurt. Not just now, but in the years past. What could he do about it? What was there to do? Toya. His mother's sweet voice made his head snap up and his eyes instantly locked on her scar, a physical reminder of his broken nature. He burst into tears. The shame was too much. Instantly, his parents were by his side, recovery girl making herself scarce so she didn't intrude on the private moment. Ray hugged her boy, rocking him gently as he sobbed into her arm, gripping onto her hospital gown like she'd disappeared if he let go. I'm sorry, Mama. Toya hiccuped through his tears. I know, sweetheart, I know. Ray hushed lovingly, caressing his hair and kissing the top of his head cradling him against her chest like she'd done when he was a baby. Her love for him only grew. Never could she hate her son. I'm relieved you're okay. But you're not, Toya's muffled cry hurt his sore throat, making him cough. You have a scar! I'm fine, his mother said as she leaned back to look at her teenager. Really, it's superficial. I'm not worried about it. She kissed his forehead. Toya blinked rapidly, not understanding how his mother could be so calm when he was this distressed. Then he saw his father's muscular arm around her shoulders. Similarly to Toya, worried that if he wasn't constantly touching her, his precious wife would vanish. He looked at his parents, and he saw nothing but tenderness in their eyes. In this moment, Toya saw his parents as a team. Working together, supporting each other filling in for the other's weaknesses and uplifting their strengths. Never had he realised how in tune they were. Am I... am I actually okay? Toya sobbed softly, calming down. Why am I like this? Why am I broken? 
His mother gently wiped his tears away from his blotchy red eyes, again kissing his forehead. You're not broken, she whispered out reassuringly. Whatever it is, we'll figure it out together, okay? Toya swallowed thickly, and his eyes flitted to his father. Angie brushed his hair out of his face, revealing Toya's watery blue eyes more clearly. It's going to be okay. Angie repeated Toshinori's words. Because if Toya didn't feel okay, there was no point in telling him it was. But he could tell him they'd work to make him truly be okay. And Toya believed him. He nodded at his parents' words. A small smile appeared on his face as a warm feeling entered his chest. A nice warmth, not the biting burns of his fire. His father and mother smiled at him, looking at him lovingly, seeing him. It was funny. Whenever he was upset, his parents were upset. Whenever he was laughing, his parents were laughing too. Whenever he was happy, they were happy too. As if his emotions and experiencing of life affected their own emotions just as much. The panicked begging of his father echoed in his mind. He hadn't been angry at him, never once accused him. He had been worried for his and his mother's well-being. He remembered the anguish he saw in his father's eyes when he joined Toy on Sakoto Peak. He saw the hurt in his mother's eyes when he blamed her for his problems. And he remembered every hug, kiss, ruffling of hair and loving word he got first thing when he woke up, when he went to bed, when he succeeded in something and when he did nothing at all other than being in their general vicinity. Even now, when he'd almost destroyed himself, his mother, and his home, his parents were comforting him. Toya realised how much his well-being affected his parents, as if their sanity depended on him being alive and happy, as if, if he got hurt or died, his parents would completely lose their minds. The young teen was confused as to how he had never noticed that before. He didn't want his parents to suffer because of him, he didn't want his sister, brothers and grandfather to worry about him all the time because he was stubborn. He didn't want to make his family feel rejected and unappreciated anymore. I want to be better, Toya said in a small voice. I'll work really hard, I promise. That's what he was going to do about it. Chapter 29 Burn The house was scarily silent. Haru hated it. But he hated the smell of burnt even more. The over 50 year old man busied himself cleaning the living room, throwing out the couch which they'd replace soon, ripping and replacing the tatami floor. He could have hired somebody to do it, but it eased some of his inner turmoil to do it himself. Anything to get rid of the dark, smoky, damp smell. For the last couple nights, the children had all slept in the same room, Natsu and Toya's refusing to leave each other's side when half of their family was missing. Their uncle Toshi coming to help and look after them on that first night had done a lot to ease their fear and anxiety. The blonde's warm and bright personality was exactly what they had needed at the moment. He unfortunately had to leave because of work. Fuyumi knew her dad had called him in and it reassured her that despite the chaos and terror of the night, her papa had still been in a right enough mind to think about his father and three other kids. She found it easier to not let the situation affect her as much, instead taking on the responsibility of looking after her brothers while her grandfather tried to fix the home. Her brothers weren't doing as well. Natsu had an angry frown most of the time, and he found it hard to sleep, blue infecting his mind and jolting him awake. All he could do was hug his orca plushie tightly, the one his father had gotten him on one of their outings to the aquarium. He worried for his mama even though they had been told she would be fine by Haro. Natsu was angry at his older brother for hurting his mum and making his siblings cry. They'd been mad at each other before because of their argument, but now he was really angry. And he didn't know what to do with his anger other than to complain to his sister about it. He's stupid, he grumbled into his porridge. Fumi sighed. He hurt mum and would have hurt Shoto. It was an accident, Fumi scowled at her brother, helping Shoto with his apple juice. He didn't mean to. You saw how upset he was. 
how upset he was. How about how upset you were? And Shoto, and Grandpa, even Dad was upset. Dad! Natsu slammed his hands on the table, glaring angrily at his sister. But there was no venom in his eyes, only tears. He was upset too. We're all upset, Fumi replied back, laying a gentle hand on Shoto's head, who flinched at Natsu's outburst. And right now, you're upsetting Shoto. Calm down. Natsu's eyes widened as he looked at his baby brother, the boy curling in on himself as he meekly held his apple juice. Sorry. Sorry, Shoto. Natsu forced himself to calm down, wiping at his eyes. I just... After everything, this still happened. Why doesn't Toy understand? Fuyumi gave him a sad look. I don't know. She admitted softly. Stubbornness, I guess. Shoto was particularly quiet. After bursting into tears in his Uncle Toshi's arms that first night... He hadn't spoken a word over the last couple days. He had a saddened expression all the time and would only communicate in head shakes or nods. Toy's words kept bouncing around his head. You don't know how lucky you are. Shota hadn't understood how deep his eldest brother's sadness were until that night. Under layers of anger, frustration and a desire to prove himself, Shoto had seen his own tearful eyes reflected in his brother's. While Shoto becomes quiet when he's sad, Toya gets loud. Toya had been sad, and Shoto felt like it was his fault. He didn't like that. He liked annoying Toya, biting him and stealing his snacks, despite the sentencing of Air Jail. He liked playing on the monkey bars with him at the park, and Toya pushing him on the swings. He liked watching him struggle in math when Shoto easily finished his own much less difficult exercises. Shoto liked being the reason Toya felt things and liked his attention when reacting. But not the sadness he saw. Shoto really didn't like that. He didn't want to be that for his older brother. On the third day after the accident, a couple weeks before Toya's 14th birthday and a week before Shoto's, the hospital called up Haro to tell him they could come visit if they wanted. And they desperately did. Natsu didn't want to see Toya, honestly, but he wanted to see his mum. I know you kids like the cold, but wear jackets anyway, Haro instructed as he helped Shoto zip up his coat. Shoto stared at the ground intensely as he heard his brother and sister arriving up to the front door. Would seeing him make Toya happy? Shoto didn't think so. What would? Shota tried to think of things that made him happy that he could easily offer his elder brother. An idea popped into his head. He ran past his siblings deeper into the house at a surprising speed, making them and his grandpa look up. Shoto? Fumi called after him, confused. I'm getting something, he replied back from down the hallway, the first time he spoke in days. His family wasn't sure what he was doing, but they waited patiently nonetheless until the littlest Todoroki trotted back with something in his arms. Mama! Natsu exclaimed as he saw Rei waiting for them in the lobby and dashed towards her. Rei dropped to her knees and welcomed a tall child into her arms, hugging the boy tightly as he nuzzled her shoulder. Mama, your face, are you okay? Natsu's muffled voice sounded tight with worry and emotion. I'm fine, it doesn't hurt. Ray reassured, running her fingers through his white and red hair lovingly. For Yumi and Shoto quickly ran up to her too, and she did her best to crowd her three younger children against her in her arms, kissing each one on top of their hair with a soft, warm smile. Hara watched from a distance, an old, familiar hurt in his chest as he watched Natsuo blotted against his mother tightly. Toya was a nervous mess, blotting himself against his father's arm that was wrapped around his shoulders. They were waiting for their family to visit, and Toya didn't know if he could face them. Thankfully, he wouldn't be alone. His father rubbed his shoulder comfortingly, trying to soothe his eldest worries away. They both looked at the door when it opened, a nurse letting their family in, Ray and Haro first. He looked at his son and eldest grandchild, and sighed in relief. They looked fine, even though he knew there were deeper scars that would have to be dealt with. Hey... How are you? he asked, 
placing a gentle hand on Enji's shoulder while addressing Toya. Fine, I guess, the boy muttered back. His burns were healing steadily thanks to Recovery Girl's daily checkups, and he'd be back to full strength soon. His eyes caught his sibling staring at him. Fuyumi's concerned look, and Natsu's angry frown. That's not an expression he had seen on his younger brother before, and he really didn't like it. Fuyumi's expression, he had seen it too many times. He always made her worried. He looked at his hands, gripping the blanket. If that's how they looked, he didn't want to see Shoto. Toya? The little voice peeped from his bedside, but Toya refused to lift his head. He heard some shuffling and felt the bed dip a little, something familiar entering his peripheral vision. Toya dared to peek. It was his Endeavour plush. Shoto, standing on his father's lap so he could reach, had his arms stretched out with a toy in his little hands. Because of its size, it blocked his face. Gingerly, Toya took the comforting toy in his hands and stared at it. Despite having it for almost 13 years, it was intact, well loved and cared for. Another item was being offered to him, and he saw Shoto's All Might plush. The little boy placed it besides the Endeavour toy on his older brother's lap, and finally the two siblings made eye contact. They can keep you company. Hospitals sound lonely, Shota said shyly, not knowing how Toya would react. Still, he smiled to the older boy. Endeavour makes you happy, and All Might makes me happy, Shota was smiling at him. Tears welled up in Toya's eyes. After all the awful things he'd said, almost hurting him, Shota smiled at him and offered him his most prized possession to bring him some comfort. No words came out of his throat as he let out a choked sob, so he just nodded at his little brother, accepting the All Might plush into his arms and hugging them both it and the Endeavour one. This gave Fumi the confidence to walk towards the bed too, and with some help from Haro, she sat beside her brother of Shota on the mattress. She placed a cool hand on his arms and also smiled to him. Only Natsu stayed back, holding onto his mother's hand protectively. He couldn't understand how his sister and younger brother could forgive the elder so easily. He looked to his father, the older man having a soft, fun look on his face, despite not smiling as he looked at his three children as they started to chatter, mainly about the hospital and what it was like. Natsu looked at his grandfather, then to his mother, and saw the same expressions. Why was he the only one who didn't understand? Harrow noticed the somber look on his grandson's expression, and looked to Ray, who also had noticed. Silently, they both agreed Natsu wasn't ready to talk to Toya yet. We'll get everybody some drinks from the vending machine, Harrow said to his son and grandchildren. Anybody want anything? Ray, Natsu, and Haro left the hospital room with a little list of drinks to get. Natsu was very silent as he held his mother's hand, refusing to let go for now. Ray didn't want him to let go if he didn't. Oh, hello. Is everything all right? The kind doctor from before noticed them in the hallway. Harrow was struck with a sudden sense of familiarity, but he couldn't place it. Yes, thank you. We're just getting some drinks, Ray replied with a smile. Have you discussed about Toya's stay at the hospital? The white-haired woman shook her head at the doctor's question. Not yet. Harrow's expression turned confused. Is there a deeper problem with Toya? He asked, worry overcoming the strange sentiment that he knew this doctor. Natsu's head tilted up, worried for a second before he refused to feel that for his older brother and stayed angry instead. A problem, no, but I've spoken to Ray and your son about Toya's future. I could explain while you two get drinks if you like, the doctor said to Rea Natsuo, the former nodding. Once Rea Natsuo were down the hall, Hara and the doctor sat in one of the hallway seats so she could explain the decision the parents had come to. Toy would physically recover soon, but clearly there was more going on, and constant, ongoing support was deemed necessary. Engie and Ray had already discussed a recovery plan for their eldest, and if everything went well, with physical and psychological treatment, 
Toya could be released from the hospital in a few months, if he was willing to cooperate, which he claimed he did, with checkup sessions to help him throughout his life. Ray will also be going through some sessions herself, but your son seems rather hesitant to accept treatment, the doctor explained. This gained a sigh from Haro, knowing what his son was like. This plan also extends to Fuyumi, Natsu, Shoto, and yourself. You've all gone through so much, and it's admirable you made it this far. You've truly done a lot for Toya. Things could have been so much worse without all of you helping each other. That's all NG and Ray. Haro shook his head, before dropping it in shame. I didn't do anything. Silence lingered for a moment. Hara's mind was numb with self-accusations and endless lists of his shortcomings. You have no idea, do you? The doctor said, sounding surprised. Harrow looked at her, surprised himself. Sir, your training of Endeavor passing down onto Toya is the only reason he and Ray are still alive. Despite how bad the outburst was, Toya was in as much control as he could be at the time, because Endeavor taught him your first lesson. Things could have been so much worse if Toya hadn't been taught how to snuff out his flames at any given time. But... Haro's eyebrows knotted, confused. I didn't... He still... That night I couldn't do anything. I froze, I... All I do is freeze. That's not true. The doctor shook her head before smiling at Haro. I'm sure you don't recognize me. It's been decades but you were my coach in elementary school. That feeling of familiarity returned, and finally it clicked. You're... that girl. Yumi Tsuzura. The girl he had tried to save during the villain attack at his school. When he had almost died. Yumi's smile widened. I never got to thank you for saving me, she said with a grin, taking Haro's hands in both of hers. Thank you... Mr. Todoroki, for saving my life. But I... I didn't. We were both crushed by rubble. If it hadn't been for the paramedics... Haro tried to argue, but Yumi shook her head. You could have left me behind and saved yourself. But instead, you saw me struggling to keep up, and you helped me. You didn't freeze, and you didn't abandon me, she said with a gentle firmness. And I wasn't even hurt. Scratches at worst. You took the brunt of the impact. My parents and I moved away to a safer area outside of the city, and I never got to speak to you again. I remembered her not returning to school after that event. You saved me. That makes you my hero. Harrow isn't a hero. He wanted to tell her he'd only been doing what he should have, and even then he hadn't done it well. But emotions were getting the better of him. Seems like a reoccurring pattern in this family. Yumi could see the older man's eyes start to water. And whether you believe it or not, your guidance is what saved your family that night, she said softly, wanting Hara to listen to her and believe her words. Old forgotten tears finally dripped down his eyes, and Hara cried silent sobs of relief. He hadn't cried in far too long. He hadn't cried the other night, nor when times were rough with Toya or Enji. Not even when he'd almost died. The last he'd probably cried, he was 18 and his wife had left. He had blamed himself for years over every little thing that was wrong in his life, in his family's life, and had almost burnt himself to the ground trying to provide his son a better life than he had, only to almost abandon him during the accident. And even now, every flaw or shortcoming his son and grandchildren had Haro couldn't help but trace back to himself. Even when Enji told him otherwise, Haro couldn't believe him. Because his son is kind, and so much better than him. While Haro believes himself to be a failure, as a father, and especially as a husband. But in this moment, with the way Yumi was holding his shoulders and letting him cry without judgement, years of unshed tears were finally freed, and all Haro felt was relief. That he, maybe, just once, had done something right. I can't forgive Toya, Natsuo muttered, holding Shoto and Fuyumi's drinks. 
He was using his thrust to keep them cooled down. Ray looked at him. You might all have, but I can't. There was turmoil in her son's eyes. Even though she didn't feel that same turmoil, she understood why Natsu did. You don't have to, Ray reassured, placing a gentle hand on Natsu's hair. But give him a chance to change. Natsu's brows knitted in confusion. Change? Your brother wants to get better. We've talked with him about it, and he's going to stay in the hospital to get the help he needs, Ray explained, picking up Enji's drink from the dispenser. She smiled to Natsuo. You don't have to forgive him, but don't let your anger stop you from growing, just like how your brother wants to. Natsuo stared. With his mother's hand on his hair, his bubbling anger reduced to a simmer. Only Ray knew how to soothe such turmoil emotions. He lowered his gaze to the floor, a saddened expression on his face. I'm not nice like Fuyumi and Shoto, he muttered. I don't know how I could forgive him. He hurt you and made them cry. Even dad and grandpa were hurt. He did. And he hurt you and himself. Ray nodded, bringing her son's head to her side, letting him blot himself against her. But wallowing in our hurt will only hurt more. I know it's hard, but making the efforts to soothe it is important. Natsu listened to his mother as he closed his eyes for a moment, just dwelling on the calm feeling that washed over him as she stroked his hair. He loves his mum. He loves his family. Hearing them cry and scream hurt him deeply. He didn't want to hear that again. He wanted to protect them. Natsu didn't visit again after that time. The lack of Natsu did make Toya sad, but it's not something he could do anything about. Just give him time, Ray had told him reassuringly with a kiss to the forehead. Hara had brought some things from home to help make Toya's room more comfortable, since he'd be here for a few months with Ray. And you will alternate between staying at the hospital and being at home, while Hara would permanently be home. One of those items was a tablet, so that Toya could watch some videos if he wanted. Which he did. Late that night, when his mother had returned to her room and the rest of his family had gone home, Toya sneakily watched videos of Endeavour late into the night. It helped his restless thoughts. As he scrolled through the various clips of Endeavour he'd already seen a million times over with a sigh, he searched for interviews instead, wanting to hear his father's voice. There weren't many, as Endeavour wasn't keen on interviews. Toya knew that. The few that were available usually had him interviewed with All Might, which was fine, but Toya really wanted just his father right now. He knew he'd be back in the morning to visit him, but... still. One video caught his attention. It was from 15 years ago and was set in Toya's old elementary school. The one Hara still worked at despite everything. Curious... Toya tapped it. It was a pretty standard Q&A setup, with the headmaster asking Endeavour questions in front of the school. His father looked younger, not quite as broad as Toya knows him, but still with that comforting seriousness. Slowly, Toya started to doze off to the video, until one question snapped him awake. What's something the children should think about when considering the career path? Toya sat up, staring at the screen intensely as he saw his then-young father silently think through the question. Why do you want to be a pro hero in the first place? Depending on your answer, that will form your path. Are you after fame and glory? Or is there something, somebody, you want to protect? If all you're after is power or selfish wants, you will only limit yourself. Being a pro hero, it's beyond you. It's a service to others. My friend All Might taught me that. Toy's eyes widened. He paused the video, looking at the zoom-in shot of his father. Why did he want to be a pro hero? Toy recalled his conversation with Edshot and Best Genist, how he'd had thought their ideas to be stupid. Natso hadn't. Even though he wasn't the one to talk to them, Edshot's mountaineering idea really struck a chord of his brother, well, it hadn't for Toya. Still didn't. 
He remembered what his mother said to him, the time he'd hurt her with his words. Toya, do you really want to become a hero? To me, it seems like you're in pain and obsessed with your father. No, rather, endeavour. He'd rejected the words at the time, refused to listen. But he had heard them and buried them somewhere deep in his psyche. Was that the only reason? That he was obsessed with wanting his father's approval? To be like his father? Was... Was there really nothing else? Shoto and Atsuo both had actual reasons. Shoto wants to put people at ease like All Might. And Atsuo wants to fill in a need and help people like Gangorka. And Toya... Nothing. He just wanted a means to be with his dad. He didn't really want to become a pro hero. Then... What did he want to be? Fumi watched Toya, a history exercise book in her lap. Dr. Tsuzura was cleaning the remaining of Toya's burns, much lighter and faded than before. The little girl could see her brother watching the doctor's movements intensely, observing every step of how she replaces old bandages. Dad has a lot of medics at his agency, he said suddenly. Tsuzura looked at him with a smile. Oh yeah? Yeah. They're specialists in burns and stuff. Dad says they're the backbone of hero society, along with engineers. Toya rambled a bit, always eager to speak about his father. Well, that's quite an honour to hear, the doctor said with a light chuckle. You know, to be a medic for heroes, you need special education on quirks. This caught Toya's attention, eyebrows raised, as well as Fuyumi, who abandoned her book to go sit beside her brother. Special education? Like quirk counselling? She asked, sounding doubtful. Her experience in elementary school had left a bad taste in her mouth for that subject. The doctor shook her head. No, actual studies on them. Biology, history, ethics, all that sort, she explained with a smile. Quirk counselling in theory, is good and necessary. However, too many children don't have the right teachers or guidance, usually due to a lack of quirk knowledge from the adults. In practice, it unfortunately can be quite harmful and estrange some children. Toya and Fumi looked at each other. That felt familiar. They hadn't had too bad an experience with that specifically, but they knew their parents weren't fond of it. Especially not Haruo. How can it be harmful? Toya asked, curious. The doctor finished wrapping the final bandage and sat on the bed properly. Some quirks are inherently harmful to both the user and bystanders. Let's say, a person emits poisonous fumes. If that person is to stifle their quirk, the fumes will only build up in them, before eventually they can't take it anymore, hurting themselves and others far more than if they had a coping mechanism to deal with their quirk safely in small chunks rather than just suppressing it she explained, hands on her lap. In other cases, quirks can give the user urges or needs that don't fit the societal norm. I know of a case where a magpie mutation quirk made the man a kleptomaniac. He was unable to resist the urge to steal shiny things even though he didn't need them. After he got arrested, he needed a lot of therapy. Those with mutation quirks in general have it bad with discrimination because of their looks. Toy was leaning forward to listen, curious and maybe even relieved, but he wasn't the only one struggling with this quirk, even if the cases were different. Fumi saw the relief on his face, that somebody saw, understood, and knew about these struggles others had that her brother could relate to. How many people have situations like that? She asked, looking to the doctor. Far more than people are willing to talk about, the older woman sighed, a little sad. It's actually the origins of most villains. They felt rejected by society, or othered by their quirk. And because of the stigma against mental health, especially in this country, they don't know where to look for help. Is that why you became a doctor? Toya asked, invested in the conversation. Fumi was happy to see this. This was the first time in a long while that she saw her brother being interested in anything other than Endeavor. Not initially, the doctor shook her head with a smile. I was almost killed during a villain attack. Your grandfather saved me, actually. The two children's eyes widened, looking at each other. 
At the time, we didn't have All Might nor Endeavor. Crime rates were high and there wasn't nearly enough support for victims. That encouraged both more villains and heroes, but it left a lot of people with heavy undealt with trauma. Me included, she explained with a smile, as the children listened with wide-eyed curiosity. Thankfully, my parents were supportive, but after that experience, I decided to become a doctor to help people who had been in the same situation as me. Because of the carnage at the time, there was very little mental health and recovery support, and I wanted to fill the need. Fill the need, Toy repeated. There it was again, filling a need of something lacking that could help people. But that changed? The doctor nodded. When I started my studies, I realized that it wasn't just heroes and civilians that needed help, but villains too. Most of them are hurt people hurting others. Some feel entitled because of their pasts, others are looking for a purpose, and some don't know any better, she said. I still want to help with mental health and recovery, but more than anything, I want to prevent people needing that aid in the first place. And that can only happen if people are more understanding and open-minded about quirks and how to help each other. Huh, Toya muttered thoughtfully. But there aren't enough doctors and teachers who do? Fiumis asked with a surprised tone. Kids talk about quirks all the time, and heroes are so popular. How can we not be understanding after all this time? People don't like being uncomfortable. They want the easy way out. And sometimes that means ignoring the problem. Running away from it. Dr. Tsuzura explained with a slightly saddened expression. But then it brightened. That's why I want to make a difference. Do my part to help those I can in my lifetime. How many people had suffered just like him? How many people felt lost, confused, and desperate for something they couldn't name? How many had quirks that hurt them and stopped them from living their lives they wanted? How many quirkless people ostracized and mocked for something outside of their control, like he had been? Those were the questions that bounced around Toya's head for the rest of the day. He liked Dr. Tsuzura. He liked the medics at the Endeavor Agency. He liked Recovery Girl, even though her quirk is gross. They made him feel less... broken. Just like his dad. Dad? What is it, Candlelight? Enji perked his head up from where he was marking Toy and Fumi's history homework in the hospital room. I want to be a doctor. Chapter 30. Warmth. It took another week for Natsuo's anger to simmer down enough that he'd be willing to speak to Toya again. He didn't want to admit it fully, but he really missed his brother. He missed their discussions, playing ball with him in the courtyard, and it felt wrong to sleep alone in his room without the presence of the older boy. And maybe, just a bit, seeing the rest of his family able to move on from the accident and look to the future instead of lingering in the past made him feel like it was okay to do the same. That, yes, his anger and hurt were valid, but that the one for his previous relationship with his brother is valid too. Toya looked up from his writing exercises when he heard a small knock at his hospital door. The rest of the family had gone to get food, and he was surprised to see Natsuo there on his own. He still had a small frown on, but wasn't nearly as angry as he'd been in the last time they saw each other. Natsuo, hi, Toya greeted meekly putting down his pen as his brother came to sit in the chair beside his bed. How are you? Fine, I guess, the younger boy replied, not looking at his older brother for a moment before lifting his head. I'm still mad at you. You really hurt us. It was Toya's turn to look away, ashamed. I know. I'm sorry, he muttered. There were a million reasons he could give to explain himself and why he reacted the way he did, but none of them felt right to say. Plus, he was sure Natsu knew already. You can stay mad, that's okay. I don't want to, though, Natsu replied, gaining a surprised look from Toya. I... it feels weird, not having you at home. I don't like it, he admitted with an embarrassed blush. And Mum says you want to get better. You have a whole recovery plan, apparently. Yeah. We're going to work with Dr. Tazura to help me find coping mechanisms and stuff, Toya nodded. Fumi says you want to be a doctor now, Natsu watched as his big brother gave another nod in response. Cool, that's a pretty good choice. That's something he could see himself doing as well. 
but the idea of becoming a mountaineering hero was far more appealing to him. Why, though? Toy observes his brother for a moment, when he asks the question. Natsu's expression had softened, looking more curious and angry now. A small smile graced the teen's lips as he read it to explain what he, Dr. Tezura, and Fumi had spoken about. Shota had gone through a lot this last month, and Enji wanted to do something special for his youngest birthday. He knew the boy adored All Might, so he decided to indulge in his son's interest in the way any hero fan would love. Going to a hero convention. One he had double, triple checked that All Might would be at. Mainly by messaging both his blonde friend and Sir Naitai to make really sure. He'd booked meet and greet tickets and everything, just to make fully sure that Shoto would have a fun day out. Which the little boy did, from how he was dashing around like crazy, looking at every stand, stall, poster and dressed up person he could, with the same excitement as a frantic rabbit. Which would have been fine if not for the fact Enji was the one left chasing him down through the crowd. Something rather hard to achieve for the over six foot red-headed man desperately trying to keep an eye on his short son. Shoto, stop running away! Enji called after his two-toned haired son, apologizing for the hundredth time as he accidentally bumped into someone. Hurry up, Dad, you're too slow! Shoto exclaimed as he found the sign to the meet and greet panel All Might would be out soon. You'd think he was an Eda's child of how quickly he ran. Enji let out an exasperated sigh as he had to run after Shoto before he lost him in the sea of official and fan-made hero merch. Shoto, I will leash you! Come back here! Shoto only giggled madly at his father's threat, until he felt a large hand grab the tufts of his All Might onesie and lift him into the air. No! Shoto whined, squirming like a worm in his father's hold. Stop wriggling, you're in air jail for ten minutes, Enji scorned lightly. You can't keep running away, I could lose track of you. But I want to meet All Might, Shota argued, being held like a stuffed toy in his father's hands. He was tiny in comparison. And you will, but you have to stay with me, Enji sighed, joining the queue to the meet and greet. Maybe this was too much for Shota's first proper outing in a crowd. The boy was used to the open streets of the city and the silence of the park rather than the busy convention. But looking at his son, all Enji could see was elated excitement. A small, relieved smile tugged at the man's face. Good. At least this was having the wanted effect. Now that they were standing and waiting, Enji could hear the murmurs of the people around them. Isn't that Endeavor? He heard somebody in a hushed whisper. Surely not. Why would he be here and not his own meet and greet? Somebody else whispered. Enji turned to look at the two young women who were whispering behind him, looking down at them with Shoto sitting comfortably in his arm. The women squeaked in surprise at being noticed. Because my son likes All Might, he said simply, Shoto barely glancing at them before he looked back to the front of the queue, trying to spot the tall blonde. He's a fan like everybody else. Uh, uh, right, the women replied meekly, intimidated by Enji's harsh face and stoic tone. I am here! All Might's voice boomed for the convention. To meet the fans! A chorus of applause and cheers followed the announcement as the number one hero arrived at the designated spot, posing as he always did. Being taller than everyone else in the queue, Enji could see Sir Night Eye behind All Might, carrying boxes of what he could only assume was signed merch to give to the fans. Soon, the line started moving, Shota getting more excited the closer they got to the number one hero. Enji could have been embarrassed at doing something so mundane and out of place for him, but seeing Shota be happy like this after the events of this month made it all worth it. He just hoped All Might wouldn't make a big fuss about him being here even though he already knew. Ah, Endeavor! Fancy seeing you here! The blonde beamed at the redhead. No, of course he made a fuss. Don't! Enji gritted his teeth and put Shoto down, the little boy beaming up at All Might. Enji wondered how it felt for Toshinori to have to pretend like he didn't know Shoto when he was his Uncle Toshi at home. Hi, All Might! Shoto squeaked up shyly. The hero is so much bigger and imposing in person, but in that impressive way that only made Shoto even happier to be able to meet him in person. I'm Shoto. Hello, young Shoto, All Might replied brightly, getting down on one knee to be as eye-leveled with the boy as possible, which really didn't do much. All Might was trying to hold back laughter, as Shoto was an All Might onesie. Is this your first convention? Shoto looked to his father for a moment, and the man nodded at this small child before the boy looked back to All Might with a bright smile. Yeah, Dad got tickets for my birthday. 
Shoto replied back, trying to match All Might's energy with all the excitement his little body could muster. I'm six today. Well, happy birthday, young Shoto. All Might beamed with an enthusiastic thumbs up. Behind him, Sir Naitai handed him a small print that he could sign for the boy before moving on to the next set of fans. As much as he wanted to indulge his little honorary nephew, he still had a whole queue of people to get through. Here you are! Shota took the print with a happy blush. The print showed All Might posing with a thumbs up, his big and bold signature over it. Thank you, All Might. He grinned back. I, I want to be a hero like you when I grow up. He admitted with a sudden outburst of confidence. There was a hundred things he wanted to say to the hero, but that, more than anything, is what he wanted the tall man to know. A hero, huh? The blonde laughed, before placing a large, surprisingly gentle hand on the boy's head. I'm sure you'll be a wonderful hero, Shoto. The little boy blinked at the change of tone. Its softness was... familiar. Very much so. And then All Might jumped to his feet again. I hope you have a marvellous day today! Don't tire your old man out, he joked. Don't push it, Engie glared with gritted teeth, but All Might only laughed at what others would see as aggression. They'd been close friends for such a long time. With that, Engie picked up his son. He and Sir Naitai nodded their heads to each other in greeting as they left the panel, Shota giving the bespeckled man a little wave as he knew him too. How is that? Shota looked at him with bright, sparkling, mismatching eyes. All Might is so cool, Shota proclaimed of awe to the rest of his family later that day. He had wanted to have a little celebration with his family in Toya's hospital room before visiting hours were over. He's so much bigger than on TV. His uncle Toshio was there too, looking a little flustered as the boy rambled on and on in peak excitement about the day's event and about All Might. I'm glad you had fun, Peppermint, Ray said with restrained laughter as she gave him a slice of cake. Harrow in a similar state as he sat beside the blonde man. If only Shoto knew. Your father says you want to become a doctor and help others who struggle with their quirks. Toshinori smiled to Toya later that afternoon. Natsu and Shoto were with their mother and grandfather to talk to Dr. Tazura about them getting some therapy sessions, since Haro, Rei, Fuyumi and Toya had all already started. Fuyumi was having an easier time than the others, unlike Haro, who really struggled to express himself, but at least he was trying, unlike Enji. Yeah, Toya nodded, holding Shota's All Might plush tenderly in his hands, tracing the stitches along the hair. And also help those without quirks. I know how it feels to be seen as... other, I guess, he added. That struck a chord of Toshinari. Nobody here knew that he'd been born quirkless before meeting Nana and gaining one for all. He hadn't known the details of Toya getting called quirkless for not being able to use his now blue Hellflame. In his years since receiving one for all, he'd slowly forgotten how things had been before. But now, with Toya, who despite having a quirk, still suffered with a similar feeling he did as a child, Toshinori felt like he almost wanted to share his experience with the boy. But... no. He couldn't bring this family so dear to him into his mess. Is your mother going to homeschool you through high school too? He asked instead, eyeing the pile of books and paper on Toya's bedside table. I don't really have another option, Toya admitted, looking to his uncle who was sitting beside his father with Fumi on his lap, the girl messing with her uncle's long hair bangs like she loved to do. Between being here and my history with schools, I can't think of any school that would, or could, give me the needed support. What about UA's general studies? Toshinori suggested. Enji raised an eyebrow at his friend. He hadn't thought of that at all. Toya mirrored his father's reaction before looking to the All Might plush, a unsure look in his eyes. What better place to learn about quirks than at a school specialised in quirks? And you know Recovery Girl already, she's wonderful. Sure, but... Toya hesitated, wearing his lower lip between his teeth. I wouldn't be against going to UA. He really wanted to go to UA. But I'm scared of spiralling again. The looming threat of his obsession fueled jealousy spiking up and making him a danger to both him and others again scared him deeply. What if I went too? Fumi's voice piped up as she looked at her father and Toshinori, then to Toya with a sweet smile. She could see that Toya did want to go to UA. A noticeable part of him still wanted to follow in his father's footsteps in whatever way he could. And Fumi wanted to support that where she was able to. 
If we went together, would you feel better? Toya thought for a moment as he looked into his sister's identical blue eyes, seeing only warmth and kindness there. Yes, he admitted through an embarrassed pout. Papa? She looked up with big puppy eyes to her father. A face the man couldn't say no to, even if he wanted. General studies at UA. Maybe Toshinori had good ideas sometimes. Emphasis on sometimes. I'll talk to Principal Nezu about it. He replies to his daughter, eyes glancing up to Toshinori for a moment with a silent thank you, before smiling to Toya. Okay? A familiar, happy excitement sparked in Toya's heart as he smiled, with his endless tears pricking at his eyes as per usual. Okay. We're back, Ray said as she entered the room. Dr. Tozura had her first session with Shoto just now and is having one of Natsuo. Hara is waiting for him. She says she wants to see Shoto next week again. All right, Enji nodded as he watched his little son struggle to climb onto his brother's bed, despite using a chair to help him up. Toya offered a hand and pulled him onto the bed, handing him his All Might plush as the two brothers sat beside each other. The scene made everybody smile. Dad, Mummy, could we stay the night with Toya? Shota asked, a hopeful look in his eyes that maybe he could squeeze out another gift from his parents for his birthday. Toya looked at him with a surprised expression. Oh, yes, please, Fumi agreed, reaching out from her sitting spot on Toshinori's lap to hold her father's wrist. Please, can we? Him and Natsu are getting along again. Toya looked away from the rest of his family, a small happy blush on his face for his siblings still wanted to spend time with him despite everything. Ray and Angie looked to each other, not sure if they could allow such a thing because of the hospital rules. Of course they can, Dr. Tsuzura beamed when she was asked a little while later after her first session of Natsuo. The boy pleaded to his parents just like his sister little brother had when he heard the idea. We'll just need to fill out a couple forms and there'll be no problem. Three fold-out beds were placed in Toya's room for the kids to sleep in. Haro setting himself up in Ray's room while Angie would supervise the kids. The four children were settled in bed as their father turned off the light. You guys fall asleep. I'm just going to check on your mother and grandfather, he said, closing the door behind him. Four little, okay, replied, before silence. Thanks, Toya's voice was heard in the dark of the room. Hospital isn't like at home. Home doesn't feel like home without you. Despite not being able to see her, Fumi's tone told she was smiling. Dr. Tozura is nice, though. I liked my session with her. She had spoken about some of her old worries from when she was only little, and Toya's quirk started hurting him. Yeah, me too, Natsu agreed. He got to speak about his anger with his brother, and thanks to her calming yet professional nature, he now felt better. He was looking forward to next week's session. Shoto replied with a silent hum to that. He'd spoken about All Might for the most part, until they touched upon his old fear of his father when he was little right at the end. He wondered if speaking to this nice doctor would help him understand both his father and older brother better. They were a lot alike. You guys don't find it... hard? Toya asked. His head and feelings were such a mess. He didn't even remember what they talked about. At first it was, Natsu replied, sitting up in the dark. Finding the right words wasn't easy. I found that hard too, Shoto added remembering how he couldn't explain how he felt towards his father when he was little. I know the feeling, but I don't know how to say it. Toya sighed, relieved to hear that, even though on a different level. He wasn't the only one struggling with that. Hospital really isn't like home. It's not comfortable. Hearing that, Toya hesitated for a moment. You can sleep beside me if that helps, he offered quietly. The silence stretched out. In the dark, Fumi and Natsu looked to each other. They just about could see their happy grins at this development. The pit-pat of small feet leaving bed and walking across the room to Toya's bed was heard, and Toya felt Shoto trying to climb onto the bed again. He helped him up and shuffled so the boy would have more room. Shoto's hand patted across the bed until he felt the Endeavor plush and placed it in between him and Toya. Better? The older brother asked. Shoto made a little sound. Yeah. In his tone too, there was a smile. Soon, more sounds of the footsteps were heard, and two more figures loomed over the eldest and youngest siblings. Uh-oh, there is not enough room. Angie returned after a short while. 
When he saw the three empty carts, he panicked for a moment, before seeing a mount on Toya's bed. A small sigh left him, and he collected the blankets from the cart, looking over his children. Natsu was blotted against the wall, closest to the window. He had an arm over Toya, where Shoto was sandwiched between him and Fuyumi. The Endeavor plush was squished between the eldest and youngest, while the All Might one was being used by Fuyumi as a pillow. Enji smiled at this jigsaw puzzle of limbs on the bed that somehow fit. He knew his children were all resistant to the cold, but he still didn't want them getting sick and placed the blankets over them. Things were going to be okay. My Father's Warmth is currently ongoing. I will be posting audiobooks uh, every 10 chapters. And then when I, am, when I am done with recording all the chapters and the story is done, I will put it all together in a big compilation. Thank you everybody for watching and thank you to my channel members. Lecherously. That's not helpful. Lecherous. Lecherously. Lecherously. Lecherous. Lecherously. 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 That's not helpful at all. Cambridge Dictionary. Help. Go, go away. Lecherously. 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 Oh, I hate that. Lecherously. 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 Lecherously.